Nie ma nadziei, że iPhone są coś takie, które nie będą na pewno. Jeżeli chcemy już tydzień przechodzić na nowym zapomnieniu. Ja myślę, że to jest No to to. Nie jest samo aplikacji, co na iPhone. Więc iPhone to jest drogi gadżet, nic więcej. On jest mamy, więc jak mama się nie będzie miała go upominać, to możesz sobie go wziąć. Tak myślałam o tym. Problem się pojawi, jak mnie zwolnią z pracy. A bym pan powiedział, że na razie to stabilizujesz się, jak się tobie ładną tą. Widzę kurwa. Gdzie nie pomyślały, że trzeba się do tych podać, ile tak ona była? Ona się dołożyła po 15 zł. I tak powiedziałem, że to jest za dużo. No dobra, ale to potem dołożyła już 5 zł. Tak, tak. Ona nie jest dołożyła. Aha. 15 zł. Jak, no. jak one mają urodziny, to składamy się po 40 zł. Tak. Jeżdżę na swój wypad, kurwa, pomidory w tym metalowej, to nie jest ten tak. On jest dosyć. To bez lepsza. Nie, to są już jej tam. Nie kupię swój dom. Tam się to są tak, jak mówię, największy pomidor do tego wyjść. Nie chcę, żeby coś tam zostało w stopniu. Pójdę do swojego podchodzie, tak jak. Pan pokazuje wspaniałe. Nie. Nie, nie, zabij, zabij, zabij. Nie tyle będę, a mi bardzo nie myślę. Nie ma konferencja w Melencji, ale online. Ja nie smaczyłem od zuba, mu, zapalił się, że fajnie, po czym z nami. Dionisi, me acus. Διονύση, Διονύση Σταθακόπλος. Καλημέρα σας. Uh, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Um, I have a cold, so it's good that we are on Zoom, so I can't uh, infect anybody. <laughs> That's good. Thank you for being with us. So you will be the, um, the chair of uh, the first session and... Uh, The, the floor is yours. You can start and ask for from the first. Uh, okay, are we are we ready to start? Yes, Thea Susani. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Um, um, thank you very much for the invitation, for the opportunity to be here virtually, but still, um, I welcome you all although i can't actually see anybody but uh all my uh, best wishes for this first session i'm <clears throat> dionysius Tathakopoulos from the university of cyprus and um we have uh, one two three four five six papers in this uh, first session each um paper will be 20 minutes long and i kindly ask the speakers to keep to time. We will have all the questions together at the end. So please 
uh, make notes of any questions you have. And um, I will just very, very briefly um, introduce the speakers, their name and their um, position. So our first paper today is by Thea Sushan Protic um, from the Ministry of Culture of the Republic of Croatia, um, Conservator Senior Advisor. And the title of her talk is On the Journey from Venice to Constantinople, Osor Apsoros. Hello, I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, should I start and share the screen? Perfect. Is it okay? It, yes, it? It, yes. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So uh, with this paper, I would like to present a small, a really small island settlement of Osor uh, in the northern Adriatic, uh, which lived uh, centuries of fortunate development at the time of predominantly coastal navigation on the Mediterranean during antiquity and the Middle Ages. Likewise, the advancement of navigation in the late Middle Ages was one of the main causes of its gradual decline. Nevertheless, the city retained its prestige and was often emphasized, especially in Venetian isolari of the time, so we will try to investigate why. The islands of Ceres and Loshin, uh, they are placed here, uh, originally formed a single mainland and they were separated on, uh, with an artificial ditch of a low isthmus here, um, which ensured a shorter and safer waterway through the northern Adriatic. And on this isthmus, uh, the settlement of Osor is placed. That year. The canal uh, is still navigable today. It is 3.5 meters deep and 11 meters wide. Uh, it is crossed uh, by a drawbridge uh, that opens twice a day during the summer uh, and only occasionally in the winter. Today, the settlement has only 28 uh -huh. permanent residents uh, in a total of 17 households and uh, apart from the parish church uh, it has no central facilities. The state uh, in which the settlement is today is the result of many historical circumstances, diseases, war destructions, but also difficulties in maintaining the sea strait. Travelogues, Isolari and Portolans, created at the end of the Middle Ages, bear witness to the poor state of the city at the time when it lost its real importance. Nevertheless, Osor and the archipelago, unlike numerous other Adriatic islands, are often recorded in works covering the Adriatic. The sea strait is mentioned, but also the ancient name of the city and the myth of its origin. Namely, notes from the Periplus of Pseudoskilak and the Argonautica introduced also into written history and permanently marked it as an area of mythical geography. The islands were called Apsirtides and also Apsorus, after Medea's brother Absirtus. Furthermore, the mention of the Liburnian island Aetris, together with the rich finds of amber jewelry in Liburnian tombs in Osor, builds the story of passing of the amber roots through the Strait of Osor. So, the Strait of Osor, here, yeah, Cavanella Cavata, was the crucial point of the entire archipelago. The canal surely existed in Roman times because at the time cloaca flew into it. The time of the digging of the canal is not known, even though it is believed that it should have happened in pre-Roman times 
when the Liburni formed the settlement defended by megalithic walls, partially preserved to this day. The turbulent period of the fall of the Western Roman Empire did not significantly shake the development of the settlement, but it disrupt, uh, disrupted uh, the fundamental relations between the capital of the archipelago and the area belonging to it. Namely, in the period <clears throat> from 6th to 11th century, Osir made pi part of the Byzantine Empire. The significance of Osir for Byzantium is confirmed by the construction uh, of a fort on the islet uh, uh, of Palazzol, which is placed south of the island of Tres, which controlled the access to Osor, which is placed here from, uh, from the south. Uh, in that period, the rest of the island entered into, um, gradually entered uh, into the Croat state, and such a division separated uh, the old island capital from the territory belonging to it. So Osor, for the first time, lost its real power and became practically an enclave that persistently, but in isolation, preserved the ancient tradition. The next great power that aspired to dominate the Adriatic and also was, of course, Venice. The Republic of Venice occupied the islands and finally became its legitimate owner at the beginning of the 15th century, by purchasing uh, Dalmatia from the Croatian-Hungarian King Ladislav. <clears throat> the long-term exhausting struggle for supremacy on the Adriatic, of course, had its consequences. In the 14th century, after it was devastated by diseases, malaria and plague, the city was severely destroyed in the conflict between Venice and Genoa. The city had a really hard time recovering and the sea strait uh, was collapsing and filling up, so it became no longer navigable. It was only at the end of the 15th century that the reconstruction of the city began, but due to the reduced population and poor condition of buildings, a decision was made to build a, a new defensive wall which cut uh, the city um, by half of its former area. Um, the city <clears throat> center was reorganized directly next to the sea strait, while the eastern half of the city uh, remained outside the walls, this part. Uh, on the area next to the canal, which is here, uh, new public buildings were built, uh, the new cathedral, the town hall, and the bishop's palace. Uh, in the 16th century, uh, the sea strait was finally cleaned and put back into operation, while a cistern was built in the courtyard of the bishop's palace. Uh, which was supposed to supply water to the ships passing through Osir. Despite this last significant attempt at reconstruction, Osir was in an unstoppable decline. In fact, in the 16th century, it was reduced already to a settlement of 500 inhabitants, while Tres was already a town with 2,000 inhabitants. Nevertheless, the Venetian government kept the traditional role of Osor, so a bi-municipal principality was established on the island with Venetian administrative institutions represented in both cities. In the period of great production of Portolans, uh, as I already said, Osor was in twilight of its power. Because of the lack of the maintenance uh, of the ditch, the Portolans uh, from the end of the 15th century diverted the navigation route uh, towards the natural harbors uh, on the coast of the island of Loshin and Unien. 
But in the 16th century Isolari, the Strait of Osor found its place again. The first work of its kind in which significant attention was paid to the islands of the Eastern Adriatic is Isolario di Benedetto Bordone. And among all the Adriatic islands, the most lines are dedicated to the archipelago of Tres and Loshin. This archipelago is in fact described as the area of mythical geography. The retelling of the myth about the Argonauts constitutes most of the text uh, dedicated to Tres and Loshin, as you can see. Uh, Bordone mentions the canal and the bridge, but also gives a colorful overview of island's life. He describes the inhabitants as few and rustic, and mentions they breed sheep and goats that feed on rosemary and sage. He ends his review with an anecdote about rosemary growing so large that a friar made a large dwelling only out of rosemary. After describing uh, Tres and Osor, Bordone immediately comes to Trogir, while all the remaining islands that line the Adriatic from Tres to Trogir, in his opinion, are not worth mentioning. E di loro alcuna cosa fa velare non mi astringe, he says. Finally, he devotes only a few sentences to the islands of the central and southern Adriatic, but without noting any myths, yes. legends, or anecdotes. So the Tres Loshin archipelago is singled out as a place of mythological events strongly marked by its pre-Roman past. A completely different approach can be seen in Isolari Portolani, whose character is primarily nautical and which were written as fresh testimonies, unburdened by the past and the symbolic meanings of the place. So Antonio Milo uh, is mainly focused on convenient bays and ports, on the map uh, of the island of of the island of Tres, the Bay of Tres and the city of Tres is drawn as the central settlement of the island with the name of the city of Tres written in capital letters, while Osor on the south is shown uh, as a smaller settlement. Uh, on the map of the island of Loshin, the southern part uh, of the island of Tres is shown along with the sea strait and a schematic big uh, bridge. In the text, uh, Milo mentions the canal called Passa una Galia, but he emphasizes Tres as a town with a harbor. However, perhaps the most interesting description of the archipelago is the one from the Kita Pibachrie by Piri Reis. On the map uh, of the Kvarner Bay, only the islands of Tres and Loshin are shown, while there are no other larger Kvarner Islands. As on Milo's map, Tres is a larger town located in a deep and well-protected bay with visible accents of a church and a town. <laughs> Okay. Um, um, uh, okay, so uh, Tres is a larger isle, uh, uh, city with accents, as um, uh, we can see the church uh, and the bell tower, while Osor is smaller, uh, also surrounded by walls, but without any other uh, accents. Uh, in the text, uh, Piri Reis describes the canal uh, and the bridge uh, by saying, whenever a ship should happen to pass, they raise this bridge and hold it until the ship sails past and enters, after which they lower it again. Big barges cannot pass, however, for the sea is shallow. It is also too narrow. It is uh, but a stone's throw from one side to the other. So, Piri Rice vividly describes the navigation through the Strait of Osor, warning about the impossibility of passing for larger ships 
and thus revealing the real reasons for the gradual abandonment of navigation through the Osur Canal and for the decline of the city. Despite the decline, Osur is highlighted in Isolari from the end of the 16th century, but it stands out mostly by the visual representation, not so much by descriptions. The Veduta of Osor, which follows the same template, is repeated in Camocho, Rosaccio, and until the 18th century. In these Isolari, Osor is the only island city represented by a Veduta, not only in the Quarne region, but also in the entire region uh, of Dalmatia. This graphic was published by Giacomo Franco in the work Carte Geografiche, to be published a year later in Rosaccio's Viaggio. But the question about the original remains as open as the question about the authorship, since it is not signed, either in Camocio, Rosaccio, or Giacomo Franco. On this precious Renaissance, depiction uh, of the city, which shows uh, the moment after the last significant uh, renovation, we notice that the city is reduced. It is located on the western part of the peninsula, while the eastern part uh, is empty. It is dominated by the newly built Renaissance Cathedral. We see the canal and the bridge placed uh, opposite the city gate. The city gate is not uh, preserved, but it is recorded on a photograph from the end of the 19th century, which shows also a light bridge here, uh, probably a draw bridge. This bridge was soon replaced by an iron swing bridge. And during the, uh, the construction of the new bridge, the canal was widened, deepened, and on that occasion, the remains of an older shore were found, which uh, was estimated to be from the Roman period. The bridge from the 19th century soon gave way and was dismantled in 1942. It was replaced uh, by a new bridge uh, moved to another uh, location after the construction of the road uh, <clears throat> that bypassed the settlement. Until that time, continuously throughout historical periods, the island's highway passed through the city center, center reaching the sea strait and its bridge through the main city gate. So apparently, the port area along the canal was the lifeblood of the city. Consequently, the collapse of the canal at the end of the Middle Ages marked the beginning of the end of Osor's economy. Frequent changes on the canal and the bridge were partially caused by the strong sea current. So even today, sailing directions warn sailors when navigating the Osor Strait. Thus, it seems that the city that built its fortune on the insecure foundations of the old and narrow sea passage could not meet the needs of larger ships that began to be built. So the passage was gradually abandoned. Despite the abandonment, the city was once again included in the Isolario of Vicenzo Maria Coronelli. Coronelli claims that the island enjoys the privilege of having an episcopal city on it, describes the city as small but surrounded by good walls. He describes how it was destroyed many times during history. However, he considers bad air as the main cause of its abandonment. So, aria pessima, practically mala aria. And illustrates the text with a well-known veduta uh, of Oth. In conclusion, it is necessary to point out how in the work such as Isolari, the author's intention, interest, and impression of the area are always recognizable, and the choice of data depends on it. So, for example, the Franciscan Coronelli described Osor as the seat of the diocese, and despite its abandonment, gave it much more importance than to Tsres, which was really flourishing at the time. 
So the old ruined city survived at least in the realm of imaginary travel or as a curiosity. After all, it is known that the Venetian itineraries on the Adriatic were also aimed at glorifying the strait of the Republic, which was among other things reflected in its legitimate possession of Dalmatia, especially in the period of constant Turkish threat. The dominance over Osr, an ancient capital and Byzantine enclave that in the long past held the key to the northern Adriatic was significant for, uh, for Venice, especially in a symbolic sense. So the myth on that city was still passed on even when it lost real maritime significance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thea, not just for a wonderful paper, but also for perfect timekeeping. Yeah. Um, it's greatly appreciated. Thank you yeah. very, very much. Okay. Um, so we will uh, pass to our next paper by um, Katerina Kore, adjunct lecturer of medieval history at the University of Patras, and Panayotis Makris, a PhD candidate in Byzantine history at the University of the Union, the Union University. And their title is Traveling from Constantinople to Venice for the Ferrara Florence Council through an Eiffel of Powerless Superiority, Byzantine accounts of the Latin topos. Um, Katerina Panayotis, the floor is yours. Buongiorno, hello to everyone. Thank you, Mr. President. We are both here. Uh, I'm very happy to see you. Um, just give me a minute to share my screen with you. Perfect. Just put it on presentation mode so that it's big, bigger, and then we're ready to go. Thank you. Is it okay? Yeah, just put it on presentation mode, you know. Uh, I've already done it. I don't ah. know if... Okay, maybe it'll, it'll, you know, the full screen will, might be. Do you, do you see it now or not? Um, yes, but not in the. Not in the full screen. Just yeah. When I do it again. Maybe sometimes it takes a little. Mm -hmm. um, Yes. No. yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Too. Well, I'm making the trip back from uh, Constantinople to Venice now, and I'm starting um, my presentation. The image of the Latins is not consistent in Byzantine prim primary so sources from the Comnini period, Comnenian period, and on. The often ascribed Latinophobia or rejections of all Latins by the Byzantines, on which many modern, modern historians is, exist, is merely an interpretive distortion. In fact, the approach is far from one-sided, right, ranging from outright hostility in front of Western economic and military expansion to acceptance, pointing to opportunities for cooperation with due caution or even expressions of admiration towards the achievements of the other. After all, it, it is the contextualization of statement that matters. Positive or negative re representations of the Latin other must be examined in the light of their function within the texts and in relation to the audience which they are addressed to, and of course, in relation to the intentions of the author, in other words, their background. The attempt to heal the schism of the Christian churches, which took place at the Council of Ferrara Florence, was a crucial moment in which both the relativity of the statements of the protagonists and the identity references of both sides appear. The image of the other takes on new qualities as new polarities emerge depending on the particular purposes of each individual who has left an account for, of the council. We have to redefine on the other, on the one hand, the imperial ideology and the evaluation of the particular circumstances that justify certain choices, and on the other hand, the role of the individuals and their intentions. Mm -hmm. 
based on the so-called memories of Silvestro Siropoulos, a high-ranking ecclesiastical official in Constantinople who participated in the large Byzantine delegation to the Council of Ferrara Florence, we could try to represent the diplomatic and political scale of the urban space of the Western cities who stared in the Eastern and Western churches unification effort in terms of identity. A lot of sensual unified Latin topos where political, economic and social relations were expressed and where conflicting ideologies, but also common cultural references were forming a biased process of transition. How did the Byzantine envoys acknowledge the city-state of Venice, which bore the burden of undermining their own state for centuries? What meaning were they giving to the official or personal relation, relations with the Latins with whom they came into close contact as members of the delegation? How were they feeling about the Byzantine wealth stolen from the Byzantine capital during the Fourth Crusade? At the same time, we attempt to confront with the question of the audience of the memories, a relatively unsophisticated text with very special characteristics and sometimes very interesting background. Any interpretation, however, must be synthetic. This means first that it, makes, that it must take into account the actual intentions and circumstances of all the parties involved. Secondly, that it must locate Siropoulos' own position and alleged intentions within the wider con context of the papal court's contacts with the Byzantium of the Paleologue. In order to proceed, we need to look further back in time, the big picture, before concentrating on the details within. Both the West and the East had experienced a new and important phase of political unrest in the immediately preceding period. Once again, the boundary between ecclesiastical and secular power was at stake, although this time the contest was exceeded to a purely political di dimension. With regard to the Roman Catholic Church, it should be remembered that the Magnum Schisma Occidentale broke out between 1378 and 1417, a split within the Catholic Church lasting from 1378 to 1417, in which bishops residing in Rome and Avignon both claimed to be the true Pope and were joined by a third line of Pisan and Clermans in 1409. The schism was driven by personalities and political allegi allegiances, with the Avignon papacy being closely associated with the French monarchy. The aftermath of the schism was that conciliarism or conciliarist movement gained <coughs> impetus. This new reform movement held that a general council is superior to the Pope on the strength of its capacity, capability to resolve ex ecclesiastical issues. It is worth noting two important things. First, that despite the resolution of the matter by the Council of Constance, the issue was brought back to the Council of Basel, 1431-37, which preceded the Ferrara Florence Council. Secondly, at least one country, France that is, regulated its internal ecclesiastical affairs from 1438 and on, on the basis of the pra pragmatic form formula of Charles VII, the so-called Caroli Septimi Francorum Regis Pragmatica Sanctio. This was a document of the Council of Burgundy, which created a special status for the Church of France. In essence, it legally codified the alliance between the sovereign and the clergy, limited the prerogatives of the Pope, and confirmed the supremacy of the councils that defined the powers of the Holy See. It provided for the convo convocation of the General Ecclesiastical Council of the French bishops every 10 years, whose powers were superior to those of the Pope. Among other things, it provided for the election to ecclesiastical office by synod synodal vote. The Gallicanism diluted the power of the Pope in favor of the power of the bishops and as regards relations between the church and the state, tended to increase the rights of the state at the expense of those of the church under the so-called liberties of the Gallican church. It is not surprising that a union of the churches would save the damaged prestige of Pope Eugene IV. 
Nor was it surprising that two delegations for the union of the churches arrived in Constantinople, one from the Pope and the pro-papal forces, and one from the majority of the Council of Basel, the conciliar forces. This split in the Latin church added another layer of complexity to the negotiations. But Byzantium had also gone through a similar period of conflict in 1416 to 1419. Patriarch Erthemius II was reacting to the attempt of Emperor Manuel II Paleologos to ratify the ecclesiastical decrees of the throne, which would have amounted to the subordination of the church to secular power. The situation of the Latin church on the eve of the Council of Ferrara is well known to Syropoulos, as is that of the Orthodox Church. He devoted he devotes an important section to the history of the councils of Ferrara, assessing both the attempt coup in the church of Constantinople and the turmoil that the events of Basel caused in the negotiations for the union. In the Sidagma Exam Apomnimonefseos, the constitution from memory, as he describes his work, Syropoulos takes a clear position on the conflict between church and state, defining the imperial oath a role as first that uh, which guarantees the church freedom of speech and second the subordination of the minority to the majority but while the emperor projects the opinion of the, uh, protects the opinion of the majority on the question of the union Syropoulos explicitly re reveals that it is he himself who creates the majority in question and not only that, just as Eugene IV had succeeded in imposing the papal institution on the kingdom, however seemingly, the Orthodox Patriarch sought to help overthrow the authority of the Byzantine Emperor over the church in Constantinople. Moreover, Syropoulos had followed the preliminary discussions of the Western missions in Constantinople and knew the eagerness with which Pope Eugene, who was of Venetian origin, wanted to close the chapter to the union, which would serve as an endorsement of the institution in an environment of widespread controversy. With a dramatic eye for detail, Syropoulos describes the standoff between the two Latin delegations on their arrival in Constantinople, the arguments put forward by the council majority, the arguments put forward by the papal delegation. In the end, the Byzantine emperor rejected the offer of the majority faction of the Council of Basel and they decided instead that the Byzantine delegation would board the papal Venetian galleys and travel to Italy. They arrived in Venice in February 1438 and proceeded to Ferrara for the opening of the Council of the Union. Syropoulos was among them. Chapter four of Syropoulos' account deals with the journey from Constantinople to Italy and the beginning of the council proceedings along with essays dealing with this segment. These lines contain information and judgments which refer to the Latins as the other, with whom the Byzantine world is called upon to converse on a relatively honest basis. Of course, as a Byzantine scholar, he is the bearer of, of a particular conception of the organization of society, its ideology, and the code or codes that govern it. In Syropoulos' descriptions, a, passiv a passivity is traced, subjected to a now powerless superiority, a once known superiority that cannot be maintained, a state that knows it is in great danger and is therefore drawn into a hasty negotiation. In this text, the cities function as theaters of, for meetings between Greeks and Latins, but also as places to observe the tensions between the members of the imperial mission, essentially between the patriarch and the emperor. The author is not interested in, the, in their external description, which is completely absent. The cities are fields of encounter and conflict. All versions are open. It's not the place of the other, but the place that was familiar, now under a different regime, but without losing its familiarity. The episode of the expedition's arrival in the Venetian town of Methoni is typical. The Latin bishops welcomed the patriarch Joseph II and asked to accompany him as he entered the city, walking alongside him as they would have done with the Pope. 
their initiative would be seen as an external honor, but the Byzantine's embarrassment centered on the ritual of holding hands, which was unfamiliar by Byzantine standards. Is this a violent rem reminder that much was about to change after the union was signed? or a sign of the church's dis dissociation from its secular interlocutors. The church is the protagonist here, but for the Byzantine emperor and his court, the Orthodox church is reduced to a diplomatic tool, a means to an end. Siropoulos makes this clear on several, makes this clear on several occasions in this journey to Venice. Siropoulos' memory recalls another incident in Methoni, this time with negative symbolism and quite contradictory in its sense, essence compared to the previous one. The house given to the elderly patriarch was in a bad state. It may have once belonged to the Byzantine before it, but it was now completely devoid of furniture and basic comforts, an example of the state of the Orthodox Church in, Venetian, in a Venetian possession. The patriarch through uh, through a Latin bishop named Christopher, asked to do to ask if he could go to the Castellan's palace, an intercession that was considered an affront to our to order. The deacon's remembrance of the Latins at Vespers caused the same indignation. How could a house of apostates be declared holy before the talks the union? Corfu was the second stop for a Byzantine delegation. At the center of the comments is Latin arrogance, which takes, uh, uh, takes advantage of the Byzantine's economic plea to humiliate, to humiliate them. When the Patriarch delays his departure from the island, the Venetians sneer that the Byzantines consume large quantities of food and especially expensive quails because it, cons it, costs, it costs them nothing, the pop pays. The third and final stop of the way to Ferrara was Venice. Here, there is a complete change of climate. The delegation is not dealing with an, an ecclesiastical authority or a regional administration, a regimento, but with a sovereign state. Indeed, a state that imitates Byzantine models, that shares the same in symbolic language, that knows how to present itself without offending, even on the most sensitive issues. Siropoulos does not comment on the beauty of the city, the buildings, the works of art. Instead, he describes in detail the reception that the Doge gave to the emperor. An impressive and crowded convoy led by the imposing Bukendavros, the Doge's ship, approaches the ship where John Paleologos lies and receives the emperor with honor to disembark him in a Venice decorated to the sound of trumpets and bells. The promotion of Venice as a place of safety, order, and friendliness, but also a place of wealth and therefore of pot potential, of potential, is perhaps linked among other things to the aspiration of Siropoulos himself. This feeling prevails even when the visit to the city arrives at the memory of a collected trauma, the Byzantine treasures of San Mark. Siropoulos, like the entire Byzantine delegation, finds himself in front of the Paladoro. Here, the gaze wanders, re uh, registering the Byzantine figures that are a source of pride, joy, and delight for those who now possess them, and for those who, from whom they were stolen, something that causes disgust, regret, and gloom. He feels the need to mention the legal basis for the Venetian possession of this work as well as other Byzantine treasures. It was the law of conquest, a remark that concealed both reproach and self-awareness. Overall, Siropoulos provides a vivid colloquial account that reflects his 15th century background of Byzantine culture surrounded by an encroaching world of Western influences and above all power and potential. It is surprising, given his uh, literary and theological training within the Ecumenical Patriarchate, that Siropoulos chooses to write in a relatively unsophisticated style. It is likely that his intended audience had gender guided his choice. 
This audience was most likely the people of Constantinople to whom Syropoulos tried to justify the shameful act of the Orthodox representative signing the unification term by emphasizing the behind the scenes pressure that led to open, open blackmail both by the Byzantine emperor who was in a state of emergency and by the Pope's representative. The representation of the Latin place, the topos, becomes in the author's hands, hands a tool for wandering among the mixed emotions generated by the need to survive. In other words, Seropoulos, Seropoulos understands that Byzantium reaches out to the cities of the brilliant developing West from the periphery, Methoni and Corfu, to the center, Venice itself. Necessity justifies silence, but the price of set Satisfying need is high, no matter how poorly the conditions and supply are considered. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, again, perfect timekeeping. That's very, very much appreciated. But thank you also because um, we've been, um, you will see that uh, Katerina and Panagiotis' paper um, shares a lot of things with my own. So I will not need to say certain things because you've already heard them. And now I'm introducing myself. So I'm Dionis Tadakopoulos. I'm a Byzantinist and I work at the University of Cyprus. And I will share my screen with you. So um, the title of my paper, which hopefully uh, is the slideshow, yes. So the title of my paper comes, um, I'm sure most of you know it, from uh, Bach's Hunting Cantata, commissioned in 1713 to celebrate the birthday of Christian of Saxe Weisenfels, who was a passionate hunter. And I chose it because the motto, the lively hunt is all my heart desires, would have been very appropriate for John VIII Paleologos um, and his relationship to hunting. In this paper, I will focus on John's trip to Italy in 1438-39 uh, for the Ecumenical Council of Ferrara, Florence, as we just heard, and particularly on his passion for hunting that he exhibited while, in, while there. This is a very well-documented trip, not only in Byzantine and Latin narrative sources. I mean, we've just heard about Siropoulos, for example, but, and this is an absolute rarity, in a number of contemporary images produced by some of the most famous artists of the early Renaissance in Italy. So we will see both of that. The trip to Italy of the Byzantine delegation, which was around 550 persons strong, of which 330, 350 belonged to the secular entourage of the emperor. John left Constantinople on the 27th of November, 1437. And as we just heard, he landed first in the Peloponnese and through many stops continued through Corfu, the Dalmatian coast um, and reached Venice on the 8th of February, 1438. On the 12th of February, um, my slides, there we go. Um, he was greeted by the Marquis of Ferrara, Niccolò d'Este, um, welcomed the Byzantine delegation and offered them the hospitality of his city. And the Byzantine delegation arrived in Ferrara by boat and on horseback in the early days of March. And uh, we know that the Emperor John stayed at the uh, Palazzo Paradiso, which is now the Ariostea Library, and tellingly, some of the guest rooms of the palace were decorated with hunting scenes, like the one we see here with um, the falconer. Yeah, you see here the falconer and the falcon. The council had already begun without the Byzantines in January 1438, but when uh, John and the rest of the Byzantine delegation arrived, it was agreed that a four month waiting period, official waiting period would be granted until all delegates and especially the secular lords, because John, of course, wanted to try to get support, military support um, against the Turks. So until all these lords could reach Ferrara, um, only minor issues were to be 
this caste. Um, the emperor, we are um, received an allowance of 30 florins, so around 90 perpira per month, and his brother, the despot Demetrius, um, 20 florins, so around 60 perpira. Um, we will see where they probably spend that money. Um, there was a solemn opening of the council on the 9th of April, 1438, and then, of course, that waiting time began. We know that in that waiting time, only in small groups were certain issues debated, and uh, mostly the topic was about purgatory. In this time, John had very little to do, and one would expect him to wish to um, occupy himself with his favorite pastime, and this was clearly hunting. I'm showing you here um, a painting by the uh, Italian painter Pisanello. You will see the relevance um, in a moment. Hunting was the main recreational activity of the Paleologan elites. John's great-grandfather, Andronikos III, was known as a passionate hunter. His grandfather, Andronikos II, saw this as a kind of frivolity, but the younger prince did not seem to care. His closest friend, John Cantacuzinos, who also became an emperor as we know, records that when Andronikos III died, in 1341, Cantacuzinos sold or gave away um, many uh, of his hounds and hunting birds that had belonged to the emperor uh, because they cost some 15,000 hyperpira per year for their upkeep. Um, John VIII's father, Manuel II Paleologos, was equally invested in hunting his teacher, companion, and mesazon Dimitrios Kidonis records many hunting trips with him and in one letter scolded him for pre preferring hounds to Plato, a hare to Demosthenes, in short, for preferring hunting animals than hunting words. Therefore, we know that John grew up in an environment in which hunting was valued, and so it is not surprising that he was promised a horse of noble pedigree a hound and a hunting bird by his father when he reached the appropriate age. And here I'm showing you some contemporary portraits of John, just to have a, a visual. Numerous foreign visitors to Constantinople recorded John's love of hunting, such as the Burgundian knight Gilbert de Lanois in 1422, or the <clears throat> Syrian Perotafur, who arrived in Constantinople in the autumn of 1437, two weeks before John left um, for the West. And Pedro Tafur accompanied the emperor on hunting expeditions outside the city. Once they were joined by the empress, and he reports that they killed many hares, partridges, pheasants, John's animal Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yes, now yes, yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, where was I? Yes, uh, so he received and gave animals as uh, diplomatic gifts. And we know, for example, that in 1416, he wrote to the King of Aragon, Ferdinand I, asking about hunting dogs that the king had promised him. And in the 1430s, in a letter from the Mamluk Sultan Barsbai to John mentions um, hunting birds, the Ornea, that John had sent him and the Sultan was very, very pleased. So from all this, I'm quite certain that John would have wished to hunt in the early months of his stay in Ferrara, given that there was no other major business to do, but there was an important impediment. He did not have the appropriate horses. He asked the Pope repeatedly for horses, but these did not materialize until three months later, according to Siropoulos, that is in June 1438. And then we are told he only received 11 small ponies that were useless and in no way horse-like. 
Now, the chronology is a little tangled, but I have reconstructed the timeline of what happened next as follows. We know that John had an important contribution to the early discussions. So after April 1438, he received reports of what was being discussed and steered them towards what he saw as the appropriate topics. These debates, as I told you on purgatory, stopped around the middle of July, when, or probably because, the plague visited Ferrara. Around a month later, in mid-August 1438, Isidore of Kiev and the Russian delegation arrived in Ferrara, and we are told that many Russian delegates died of the plague. The arrivals of, from Russia are important because Nicolas Gudelis, an imperial ambassador who had come with them, brought Russian horses with him. John bought one of these mounts for hunting, and his brother, the despotist Dimitrios, bought the rest. Now, we have evidence that seems to corroborate that, namely um, sketches and a medal by the very important, very famous, early um, uh, Quattrocento um, painter Pisanello and his workshop. So here we see sketches that Pisanello probably did from life in Ferrara. Um, and here is the emperor. We'll get to that back in a moment. And the medal that he produced. So we've got John on the obverse and on the reverse, John in a hunting scene. So um, we see here his bow and quiver. I will show you another image again. And the horses that he also sketched. Um, his uh, weapons were sketched as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, we know that these small horses they seem to be of Russian or Danubian origin, and that's how, uh, we, we, from their appearance. But the fact that they have also split nostrils, as you can see here, that is a common practice in Central um, Europe. And the fact that John is portrayed, is sketched um, as a hunter, you can see here, of course, um, the bow and quivers, and here they are sketched. Um, by the same author. The fact that the plague was raging in Ferrara and that John had managed to secure appropriate horses for hunting makes it safe to assume that another piece of information falls in this period. Siropoulos, not uncritically, notes that John moved to stay in a monastery some six miles outside of town so that he could hunt all the time instead of busying himself with the ecclesiastical matters, i.e. Tithira en Ischolito, he seemingly stayed at this convent until December, making necessary visits to Ferrara when it was necessary. We know, for example, that he attended the first dogmatic session, so after that wait uh, that I told you about, which took place on the 8th of October, 1438. Um, now, John insisted on entering the chapel of the papal palace where the sessions were held on horseback. And this was a major practical issue, of course. Now, apart from ceremonial issues about the fact that the Byzantine emperor cannot simply tread on ground everywhere, there was perhaps a, a medical issue as well. Pero Tafur noted that John suffered from gout. And gout was, of course, a very common ailment among the elites at the time. One could imagine that the Byzantine emperor did not want to offer the spectacle of walking unsteadily in front of the entire council, riding as he did on hunting, and here's the Pisanello sketch of him, um, meant that he could have a sense of self-control. Siropoulos records many, many instances of the emperor hunting. I have found at least six, which suggests that it was an important pastime. But the imperial hunting seems to have gotten out of hand. The Marquis of Ferrara, Niccolò d'Este, reproached John for hunting without measure, to ametron, to kinigiu, 
and for having killed all the animals he had placed in the hunting grounds, like quails and pheasants. The emperor simply did not take heed and continued. Later, Niccolò asked the emperor to leave the monastery as the peasants whose lands were close by were complaining bitterly to him that the imperial hunting parties trespassed on their lands and destroyed them. Sebastian Kolditz found a number of people from the Greek East in the service of the Este household in this year, such as uh, Johannes Grego from Constantinople, who was a tax farmer, a Nicolaus Grecus, who was a falconer, a Mamaius, an Albanian called Nicolaus, and a Costa de Candia. These men probably came into closer contact with the emperor, and this ease of communication with him probably contributed to the fact that John exercised little restraint in his pastime. In January 1439, the council was officially moved to Florence. The plague was one of the reasons, but more importantly, the Medici were prepared to underwrite costs that had crippled papal finances. There is less direct evidence that John continued to hunt in the seven months he spent in the city. The first piece of evidence comes from the final discussions on the council, when the Byzantine delegation had to vote whether to accept or reject the Latin proposals. Siropoulos tells us that a hunting hound always accompanied the emperor when he visited the patriarchal residence and slept on a cushion embroidered with gold that was placed before the throne that served as a footstool, so that cushion. In fact, the emperor used to pick up his legs on the throne. The hound was always silent, whether the emperor spoke or not. But on the day of the vote, Siropoulos tells us, the dog started barking and would not stop. And his barking accompanied the emperor's voice. He stopped only when the emperor stopped. And it was seen as a bad omen. But it shows, of course, that John continued to hunt in Florence. And there's another piece of evidence. Um, when Patriarch Joseph died, which was in June, um, 10th of June, 1439, the money that was found with him was used, again, Siropoulos tells us, to buy pounds by John. A rare document, a memorandum by a man called Giovanni de Pigli, a miner notable from the small town of Ferretola, North, northwest of Florence, record that John and his retinue, which included Angelo Acciaioli, a first cousin of the Acciaioli Dukes of Athens, spent a day or maybe more in Pistoia and Prato before arriving in Peretola on the 27th of July, 1439. Although hunting is not explicitly mentioned, it is highly possible that this was the reason for the excursion, or at least one of the reasons. De Pigli also mentions John's debilitating gout. I quote, because he had lost the use of his legs, he came right up to our hall on horseback without anyone seeing him dismount except his own gentlemen and servants. John's passion for the hunt did not, abound, uh, did not abide even when the council ended. The Bull of Union was signed on the 6th of July, 1439, and John left Florence. In the return to Constantinople, um, we're, so again, through Dalmatia, Corfu, Modon, Negroponte, and so on, um, we know that once he went to Padua to hunt in the marches of Treviso, missing the day of the exaltation of the cross on 14 September. Furthermore, when the delegation had reached Alonisos, they had run out of food and water. Provisions came from Skopelos, which included 17 breads and one wild onager, a wild donkey, to be fed to the hounds. Because Siropoulos tells us that care towards the hounds was very important. Even just before landing in Constantinople, when passing the strait, John purchased hounds to take with him. A few years later, John invited Siriaco de Ancona to take part in a hunting expedition outside Constantinople together with the Genoese Podesta, um, Borrello Grimaldi and his son in July, 1444. So his passion for the hunt was constant uh, before, during and after. 
Um, John left a lasting impression in Italy and from there in the Latin West more generally. His traits as captured by Pisanello became fashionable as did his hat. You can see here his Schiavion hat. And once you start noticing, you'll see that uh, this kind of figure and especially wearing that kind of hat appears in very many paintings um, of uh, the periods. I am just showing you a couple to see that um, it was a fashionable uh, thing. But the, the most famous, of course, of the representations is the one by Benozzo Gozzoli at the Medici Palace uh, Chapel, <laughs> um, where the, uh, the Medici ruler, John and the Patriarch Joseph are allegorically represented as the three Magi. And here you see um, um, the entire uh, painting. Um, it's the details, of course, that make it very beautiful. Now, there are three, so yes, the three Magi, but as you can clearly perhaps see, um, this has very little to do with the actual biblical narratives. What we're seeing here is a courtly hunt. Um, Here's John in the detail. And you can see here images of the courtly hunt, um, the wild donkey, the falcon, and here a very interesting little detail, um, um, the big cat, one of which is riding on a horse, exactly like the 14th century ceremonial text we call Pseudo Codinos records, um, I quote, when the pard trainers, the pardovagili, bring the pards, so the cheetahs, they enter the palace on horseback and leave it similarly on horseback. Let me conclude. We can assume that the representation of John as a hunter, given that during his time in Italy, hunting was one of his main occupations, represented, responded sorry, to a conscious projection of imperial prowess by the emperor himself. This is perhaps the reason why the reverse of Pisanello's Medal of John shows him in a hunting scene. This is the official version, so to speak. There are many layers that can contribute to such a reading. First, Byzantine emperors not only hunted very frequently, but surrounded themselves with representations of hunting. The extant secular objects may be few, but there are many, many descriptions of such objects. While imperial panegyrics increasingly praised emperors as perfect hunters. It will suffice here to point to many 12th century texts by Prodromos, Manassis, and Pantech. Second, ancient knowledge about hunting was seen as coming from Byzantium. This may be, may be more explicitly clear in the case of the Islamic world, where texts refer to hunting manuals from Rum, either lost or fictitious, but the idea that the Byzantines preserved in their hunting something of the ancient world was clear in the West as well. Third, elite hunting was a common platform of communication between East and West. Practices were similar and undoubtedly um, created bonding as the Gozzoli painting suggests. Fourth, John admittedly came to the West from a position of weakness. Let us remember the words of Adam of Ask on John's father Manuel's uh, uh, sojourn in London. I quote, I thought within myself what a grievous thing it was that this great Christian prince from the farther east should perforce be driven by unbelievers to visit the distant islands of the west to seek aid against them, end of quote. I'm certain that many Latin lords would have seen things in a similar vein. On top of that, plagued by gout, and thus unable to walk without hindrance, John must have chosen to show himself mostly on horseback to avoid any loss of face. Since he clearly loved hunting, this was the perfect vehicle. Unbeknownst to the Western spectacles, however, John's passion for hunting was presented and seen as excessive by the Byzantine witnesses. This was certainly the case with Siropoulos, who clearly did not mean his frequent mentions of John's hunting positively. John was in Italy for the council, for the defense of the faith, and not for frivolous distractions. The dialectics between the projection and the representation of power and ancient knowledge on the one hand, and the giddiness and passion for the hunt on the other, constitute the framework against which 
John's trip to Italy can be read. Thank you very much. Um, so we will now uh, continue with our next paper. Once I manage to stop sharing, here we are. And our next paper is by Philip Rands from the Center of Advanced Study in Sofia. And his title is Back into the Lion's Den, Two Journeys to Ransom Captives from the Ottoman Conquest of Constantinople, George Sfranzis and Dimitrios Laskaris Leondaris, 1454 to 1455, Dear Philip, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, my apologies for the very long title. Um, so I will attempt to share my screen. And you all see that? Yes. Just uh, put it on presentation as a full mode. Yes. Perfect. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, yes. Yeah. So my, as my title suggests, um, one of the phenomena I'm seeking to examine in this paper is the fact that some of the earliest travelers to the to Ottoman territories <coughs> after the capture of Constantinople were in fact Byzantine elites traveling into Ottoman territory with the specific purpose of ransoming captives, um, people who were captured during the um, conquest of Constantinople. <clears throat> um, anyone, who, anyone who has read um, any of the accounts of the capture of Constantinople will be struck by the emphasis that's put on the capture of prisoners and hostages, and particularly how organized um, this was as the kind of economics of violence. There are clear rules for um, how to keep a hostage, um, how to arrange a ransom, how captives can be redeemed. The usual model is that a male captive, um, a husband or a father, would be released in the full expectation that he would go off, secure funding, and come back to redeem his wife and children. Um, in this particular circumstances, there, most of the journeys begin on peripheral states around uh, newly acquired Ottoman territory. In particular, there are two, the, the surviving Byzantine or Paleologan territories in the Morea became a safe haven for fugitives fleeing from um, continuing violence in the Balkans. And also the despotate of Serbia, um, <clears throat> Um, was involved in ransoming captives from, from Ottoman territory. So most of the journeys that we are talking about either begin in the Peloponnese or the Morea or in Serbian territory. And the destination tends not to be Constantinople, but to be Edirne. This is because we are talking in 1453, 54, 55, um, about um, a kind of twilight zone in which the Ottomans have captured Constantinople, but they have not yet managed to set it up as their capital. Um, this is partly because Constantinople has to be rebuilt and repopulated, but also because their old capital, Edirne, still remains uh, a more convenient location for the military operations that they are carrying out in the Northern Balkans. So almost all of the journeys that we have in this period relating to the ransoming of captives are aimed at Edirne, and it seems that all of the captives, or almost all of the captives, were taken to Edirne and distributed from there. In terms of the timing and conditions and routes of the journeys that we're talking about, overwhelmingly the most important factor is ongoing warfare and insecurity in the Balkans. The passage of armies, particularly north from, the, from Edirne into the North Balkans, and particularly against Serbia, is a defining factor in when people travel and the routes they take. As with regard to the documentation, I'm going to look at two case studies of the, of the period 54 to 55. The first is a formal account written by George Frances, who is well known, uh, a courtier, a diplomat, a historian. He's very well documented. 
and he wrote a formal historical account of this period, which combines conventional historiography with elements of memoir. And the second is an entirely informal record by a man called Demetrius Lascaris Leontaris. It's unlikely that you would have heard of him. He doesn't appear in any historical book any, or any historical record. We only know of him because of his habit, one might say even addiction, of writing annotations in manuscripts that he owned. Both men have a similar history. Both were captives, both were ransomed, both escaped from Ottoman territory, both returned to Ottoman territory to ransom their wives and children, though with, with different results. And in some ways, their, their histories interlink. They are at one point in the same place at the same time, though we don't know that they ever, we can't be sure that they ever met. Um, but most importantly, from a historical point of view, the more formal narrative of George Francis allows us to understand more about the more episodic record that Leon Tares has left in his annotations. So starting with George Francis, he tells us about his captivity, the usual um, comments about uh, torments that he endured. And he tells us that he was finally ransomed and managed to arrive in Mithras on the 1st of September. Unfortunately, his wife and children remained in captivity. And he explains some of the complications of how to get them back. They were held captive by some elderly and honorable Turks, he tells us, and by them were in turn sold to the Sultan's master of the stable, who also bought many other beautiful ladies and made a large, made a large profit from them. He continues, as my children's beauty and other virtues could not be concealed, the Sultan, having learned of them, took them from his master's stable and gave many thousands of asters. But their wretched mother remained alone with only a single nurse and her other attendants were removed from her. So already Francis has the problem that his wife belongs to one person, the master of stable, and that his children are, are now in the Sultan's possession. And even before he begins, <coughs> excuse me, even before he begins to um, undertake their ransom, he learns that one, of his, that one of his sons has died. In December 1453, his son John was apparently murdered by the, or executed by the Sultan, because he, he was involved in some plot, or alleged plot. And at this point in the narrative, of uh, Francis Chronicle, it becomes clear the way in which he interweaves the personal and the official. So he tells us this personal story about his son, and then he immediately begins a narrative about diplomatic activity in which he enters the, the service of the despot Thomas, Thomas Paleologos in the, in the Peloponnese. He enters his service with the purpose of becoming a diplomat in a diplomatic mission to Serbia which will be of mutual benefit to both, both states. And initially, th this is what he is doing. He is setting out a diplomatic mission, and he goes to Methone in the southern Peloponnese with the objective of catching a boat to Ragusa. So initially, he, he isn't intending to travel by land at all. He will sail to the, the, the coast of the Adriatic and then go into Serbia in this way, thus evolved, evolved, avoiding any problems inland. However, it doesn't turn out this way. In the Morea, there is a rebellion, which seems to cause chaos in the northwest of the, uh, of the peninsula. And also there's a major offensive launched by the Sultan Mehmed II against Serbia. Now, the way Frances explains all of this, his chronology is very condensed and it's not entirely clear what, how, the, how the historical causation follows. But the basic assumption is that with a rebellion in the Morea and with a major offensive against Serbia, then this diplomatic initiative has to be cancelled. It's, it's at the very best, not a good time for this initiative. So he tells us this, there was no longer an opportunity for the mission to Serbia to be accomplished. But in the very same breath, in, indeed barely, barely ending his sentence, he starts a new story. So his official, his official travel ends there, and he now immediately begins a personal journey. So instead 
I went by sea to Patras, and from there, having crossed over the Gulf from Avostitsa, that's modern Ayo, on the 1st of September, I came to Adrianople. This is Edirne, of course, and from there to Amos. Again, his chronology is not entirely clear. The, the Greek text might suggest that he immediately goes on to Enos, but in a later passage the, following this one, um, he notes that he was still there in, in the area of Adrianople in October. And at some point, he carries on to Enos on the coast of Thrace. This is um, modern Enes in Turkey. And he spends some time hiding there. He never explains why, but obviously he feels insecure in Adrianople. And his main problem is he has to wait for the sultan and the master of the stable. The people who actually have his wife and children are not in Edirne. For the very same reason that, uh, that, that caused his diplomatic mission to Serbia to be aborted, he is still waiting for the sultan to return. It's the same campaign that is causing this delay. So he said, I spent some time in hiding until such time as the sultan should return from the region of Sofia and his master of the stable, who held my wretched, the wretched mother of my children in a village, would also come to Adrianople. Then eventually he does manage to ransom his wife, um, having returned from Enos to Adrianople and also her one surviving attendant. And together they return to Patras, arriving there in February 1455 having suffered and spent much. So the entire time that he spends at Adrianople is probably longer than any time he spends traveling. If he does arrive there on the 1st of September and he arrives in Patras by February, then we can assume that the latest he leaves uh, Adrianople is say in mid-January. So he is hanging around Adrianople for at least four, four and a half months, either waiting for the Sultan or negotiating a price or negotiating terms for the release of his, uh, for his wife. It will be noted that he has not managed to secure the, wife, the release of any of his children. His surviving daughter is in the harem, and he later tells us that he never managed to secure her release, that she died of disease the following year. When we turn to our other case study, um, Demetrius Lascaris Leontaris requires some introduction. Here is a, a very skeletal um, family tree. Demetrius Lascaris Leontaris the Younger is at the bottom. He is the grandson of Demetrius Lascaris Leontaris the Elder, who was a very famous general and diplomat and courtier. And his father also, was a, John Lascaris Leontaris, was also a general, though somewhat less illustrious, more of a military governor. The younger Demetrius seems never to have held any office or indeed to have done anything other than read and annotate books. So we may have some sympathy with him. But we know a great deal about his life in annotations. Even the precise date of his birth is recorded by his father in a list of family births uh, of, of 12 children listed in a blank page of the Laurentianus Graecus 55.4, which is a famous collection of military texts. And from a relatively early age, Demetrius Leontaris himself is annotating texts. Um, amongst all the annotations in this uh, Marcianus, Graecus 399, which is a copy of the, uh, the history of Zonoras, is an annotation written by probably a teenage uh, Demetrius. And it's a typical teenage, um, teenage uh, comment. Basically, this book belongs to us, hands off. And this is the earliest of his annotations, as I said, probably dating to the mid-1430s. The mid, uh, and thereafter follow a continuous stream of annotations, mostly uh, uh, labels proclaiming his, his ownership of certain books, but they also give family information, information about events. There are practice letters that he writes as annotations as well in an attempt to learn the various rhetorical formulae that one requires for such things. Up to the, up to the capture of Constantinople in 1453, his last um, uh, annotation 
is again in the Laurentianus Plutus 55.4, the very manuscript in which his own birth is recorded. He, in turn, at a later date, records the death of his mother. And again, it, this gives a good example of the, the degree of detail that he sometimes includes in his annotations. He gives the precise day and date and hour of his mother's death, the 16th of January, a Friday at the fifth hour, and very specific uh, information about her, her, um, her grave, in the, in the grave of her father-in-law by the gate beneath the bell tower. So this is his last, the last evidence we have for his life before the conquest of, of Constantinople. And this is dated January 1450, but we assume that he remained in Constantinople up until the time of the conquest, um, or at least he would have very limited opportunities to go elsewhere. The next we hear of him is in an annotation in this Vaticanus, which is a collection of our oratorical texts. Again, he has this um, characteristic monocondilio as his signature. And on this occasion, his life has completely changed. He is no longer the privileged prince reading books and annotating books. He is now the impoverished refugee. But this, this book does not in fact belong to him. He has borrowed it from a man called George Cantacuzinos, who is a very distinguished uh, Greek, Greek um, aristocrat who is related to the Serbian ruling family. And he's borrowed this book. So this is a, a reader's notice rather than an owner's notice. And this is dated to the 31st of May, 1454. And he tells us that he is in Smederevo, which is the capital, the, the great Danubian fortress, which is the capital of the Serbian despotate. So clearly he has changed place and he has changed circumstances since 1453. We have a good idea how he might have got to uh, Smederevo because the, the uh, Serbian ruling family was involved in the ransoming of prisoners. And the history of Dukas tells us that um, in August 1453, so only a few months after the, uh, the fall of the city, uh, he arranged for a large scale uh, uh, ransom of a, of a large number of um, Byzantine elites who were then brought to Smederevo. And though we cannot conclusively uh, link uh, Dimitrius Leontares with this group, it seems the most likely uh, vehicle by which he came to the city. So that was, um, that was May 1454. The next we hear of him is in this Marchanus, which is a, uh, a copy of the first four books of Procopius's Wars. Again, a very characteristic signature. And on this occasion, he is back in Edirne. Um, we know this partly because of the information that is presented in this particular annotation, and partly from information in the next one. He tells us that the present book was written, what originates in the wretched city, great city, that is of course Constantinople. So he first starts to tell us about the book. The book was pr presumably loot, plunder, that was brought from Constantinople to Edirne. But he doesn't call Edirne Edirne. He doesn't call Edirne even Adrianopolis. He uses the pre-Roman name for Adrianople, which is Orestia, before it was named, before the city was renamed after Hadrian. And he continues with the history of the book. The book was bought by Alexius Francis Sapostopoulos. We don't know much about this man, only assuming that he is another Byzantine aristocrat and that he was known to Demetrius Leontares. And Demetrius has borrowed this book from this Sapostopoulos. And he has apparently either, uh, either begun or completed reading it on the, on the 14th of January, 1455. So he has traveled from the relative security of Smederevo in the Serbian capital in midwinter back to Edina. We don't know when he arrived 
precisely, but we can have a good idea because, again, ongoing warfare is the problem. Um, the very same campaign which aborted Frances's diplomatic mission and which uh, caused him to wait in Odina at this time, the military operations of that campaign were, were occurring precisely on the route that Dimitris Leontaras would need to take in order to get from Smederevo to Edirne. And we know that those military operations continued at least into October of uh, 1454 and probably into November. So it would not have been until December and perhaps even January that he managed to arrive in the city. And he, like Frances, seems to be having to have a very long wait. And he has decided to borrow this book and to read some Procopius while he is waiting to redeem his wife and children. And also this coincide, if he did stay there in Edirne between December and January, he would have been there at the same time as George Francis. So we can imagine Edirne full of these Greek elite men simply waiting around, waiting for the opportunity to speak to the right person, waiting for an opportunity to pay the ransom and negotiate a deal. And the final... Um, Excuse me, please mute. Somebody has their microphone on, please mute. Sorry, Philip. <laughs> it's okay. Um, and, and let me just say, we're, you, you should be drawing to a close. We're just uh, past the 20 minute. Yes, sure. Um, this is the final annotation. It's um, uh, it's in a book of Psalms, and the, the whole of the right-hand column uh, was originally blank, and he has filled it with a very large annotation. Unfortunately, it tells the, the d distressing tale that his wife has, in fact, died. Uh, this is written on the 30th of March, so he's been there for at least six weeks waiting, and his wife, the lady Efrosina Peleogini, Peleogina uh, Leonterina um, has died. She's buried in the local church in Adrianople. Um, she has clearly been in captivity for, a, for nearly two years. But unfortunately, she, she, she dies 15 days after being released. And she leaves behind these, these four young children for him to look after. So this is probably one of the most depressing texts that I know. Um, uh, associated with the fall of Constantinople. I'll pass over these two things. There is an epilogue for Demetrius Leontaris. He has an onward journey. After the death of his wife, he continues into Western Europe. He abandons the Balkans altogether. We find him in Mantua in 1459, in um, uh, where he receives financial assistance from the Pope. We find him in Brussels in 1462, where he receives financial, where he, he occurs in Burgundian uh, financial rec records, receiving assistance from the Duke of Bung uh, Burgundy. Um, and finally, he settles in the, in the kingdom of Naples, where initially he again receives royal assistance. But he finally, perhaps in the, the 1470s, uh, begins a new career, or at least he ekes out a living, as a copyist of Greek manuscripts, with some irony given that he has now entirely turned his life around, going from being a wealthy consumer of manuscripts to an impoverished uh, producer of manuscripts. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for this fascinating paper. Um, I'm sure there will be also, um, a lot of questions in the discussion. Thank you very much, Philip. And our next paper is now by Athena Zupandu from the Benaki Museum, the Evstathios Gnopoulos Collection. And her paper is entitled Samos in the 16th, in 16th Century Travel Accounts, a Comparative Study. Thank you very much. Good morning. Let me just share my screen a moment. Mm 
Can you see it now? Yes, thank you very much. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. Before I start, I would like to thank the organizing committee for the excellent organization and the invitation. I would also like to thank Mirka Palura and my colleagues at the Finopoulos Collection of the Benaki Museum, Costantino Stefanis and Maria Xenariou for their support. The focus of my presentation today is on the island of Samos. Located in northeastern Aegean, the city of Samos was one of the most important ones of the ancient Greek world, home of philosopher Epicurus, mathematician Pythagoras, astronomer Aristarchus, and the architect Ephpalinus. Samos, as part of the Greek archipelago, was not excluded from the big changes that occurred in the late 15th and the 16th century. By this, I mean the rule of the Ottoman Empire and the increase of piracy. It is important to mention that up until 1475, Samos was under the rule of the Genoese. The Ottomans gained full control on the island only a century later. For many decades, historiography indicated that Samos was completely depopulated during the 16th century, an assumption modern scholars and researchers have already reassessed. Although a big movement of population from Samos to the island of Chios did happen, the narrative of a complete depopulation is not true. For the present study, I used Stefanos Gerasimos' monograph as a guide to find travelers of the 16th century who visited Samos, or included descriptions of the island, or simply had Samos in their itinerary. The list is not exhaustive and it contains only West European travelers. So, Ottoman travelers like Pirires or Greek travelers like Iakovos Miloitis are excluded. According to Gerasimos index, 17 travelers refer to Samos. This table summarizes the travelers, the date of their travel, their nationality, and the page they are mentioned in Gerasimos. We count five French travelers, one Spanish, four Germans, four British, two Danish, and one Italian. Some of them, like Bellon, are very well known and studied, but others were completely un unknown, at least to me. I tried to study every single text from this list to note down what is written about Samos. This wasn't very easy, as many of these texts are manuscripts, but fortunately, I was able to find most of them digitized. Also, the language barrier was stronger in some of them. The first traveler mentioned in Gerasimus is Claude Believre, a French antiquarian and magistrate. In 1521, he traveled from Venice to, Ro to Rhodes. In the 1956 publication about his travel, on page 16, we read, Samos, an inhabited island be between Rhodos and Istanbul. This is the earliest reference of life on an island that was supposed to be completely depopulated 50 years earlier. Pierre Bellon traveled to the Levant for three years from 1546 to 1549. His beautifully illustrated book, first published in 1553, does not only discuss natural history, but also the antiquities, manners and customs of the people he met during his travels. Chapter 9 is dedicated to Samos. Bellon mentions that although it is a big island, it is now almost uninhabited because of piracy. He also explains more on that in the next chapter. The next travel account, called Viaje de Turquia, by an anonymous author, was first attributed to Cristobal de Villalón, a Spanish humanist. The text has the form of a dialogue between three people, Pedro, Juan and Mata, who discuss their travels and the adventures they encountered on their journey. 
In the chapter about the travel across the archipelago, they mention that they visited Samos when a storm hit and they stayed on the island for three days. Pedro refers to Samos as a good land, yet with no population. Juan wondered what they ate and Pedro answered sheep and chickens. He then mentions Jariedin Barbarossa and that a lot of islands were depopulated because of his actions. Not much is known about Chevalier de Bonnet, who travelled to the Ottoman Empire in 1565. Samos is only referred to as a beautiful island. The text has the form of a poem and is dedicated to the King of France, praising for the supremacy of Christians against the Turks. Writer, poet and traveller Jean Palerne travelled to the Ottoman Empire for two years to visit Jerusalem. In chapter 93 of his book, describing his journey from Rhodos to Chios in March 15, 82, he sailed around Samos and probably Furni, and mentions that all these islands are almost uninhabited. François de Pavé, member of the court of Henry IV of France, made several trips to Europe and Asia. In 1585, he embarked on a journey from Venice to Jerusalem. After his visit to the Holy Land, he sailed the archipelago to visit Istanbul, and he reached Samos in December. In page 167 of his manuscript, we he writes, We stopped one day, one day at Samos, both to be against the wind and to provide ourselves with fresh water. It is the island of Samos, recommended by many good authors for the remarkable things that happened there, completely destroyed and almost uninhabited. Michael Heberer von Breten was a German travel writer. In 1582, he embarked on a journey to Egypt. Three years later, he was on board a war ship that was captured by the Turks. He spent three years as a slave in the Ottoman Empire, and during his many journeys and sea voyages with his master, he got to know the Mediterranean. In September 1586, they sailed from Alexandria to Istanbul. At Samos, they experienced an extreme thunderstorm. In page 202 of his journal, he mentions that the island used to be uninhabited, like Bellon said, but is now starting to regain its population. John Sanderson sailed for the first time in 1584. Samos is noted as part of his itinerary from Istanbul to Alexandria in 1585. In his third journey, in 1599, he refers to Samos as the birthplace of Esopos. Karl Nutzel was counselor of Emperor Rudolf II and Emperor Matthias, and he descended from a distinguished family of Nuremberg. He traveled to Istanbul in 1586, and then with his company, they embarked on a journey to the Holy Land. During their travels, they stayed in Samos for five days and he mentions that there was a shortage of grains in the capital, so they loaded up on them from the island. Reynold Lubnau was a pharmacist and he joined a diplomatic mission sent by the Emperor Rudolf II to Istanbul in 1587. Next year, he managed to join a Turkish galley that was making a cruise of inspection in the Mediterranean. Although he gives detailed descriptions of Rhodos, Chios and Patmos, he mentions nothing about Samos. Austrian diplomat and travel writer Georg Christoph Fernberger traveled to Egypt in 1588. He and his companion, Hans Christoph Teufel, started their journey from Istanbul. 
They sailed the archipelago and they didn't visit Samos, so we don't have any description except the reference in their itinerary. Gerasimos also mentions two Danish travelers who cruised the Mediterranean at the end of the 16th century to visit the Holy Land. Jacob Ulfeldt was a diplomat and chancellor of King Christian IV of Denmark, who traveled in 1588 to Istanbul and Jerusalem. Otto Skram was a nobleman who initiated a journey in 1590 that would take him to Jerusalem. Both their manuscripts are kept in the Royal Danish Library in Copenhagen. Unfortunately, I could not retrieve any of the text, so I, I rely on the index of Gerasimus that these two travelers had Samus in their itinerary. British traveller Richard Rugg accompanied Sir Edward Barton, ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, appointed by Queen Elizabeth I of England. In his account, he doesn't include any descriptions of Samos, although he makes a short historical, historical reference to Chios and its previous state. Giuseppe Rosaccio was an Italian doctor and cosmographer. In his work Viaggio de Venetia, he describes his pilgrimage to the Holy Land and he accompanies his text with copies of maps inspired by older Isolaria. In page 68, we have an engraved map of Samos. In the descriptive text next to the map, he includes historical references on names in Samos. Thomas Dallam was a British organ maker. He traveled to the Ottoman Empire to present the organ he had produced as a gift from Queen Elizabeth to the Sultan. In pages 40 to 42, he describes his arrival on Samos. He mentions that most of the inhabitants are Greek, but upon seeing their ship, they run to the mountains to hide. The next day, one of the crew members went on shore to find water and wood, but he didn't return, so they assumed he was taken as a prisoner. The next day he reappears, almost drunk from wine, holding bread and other goods in his hands. Two hours later, the Turkish commander of the island presented himself with some gifts. Dalam also observes that the type of grain, millet, kechri in Greek, thrives on this land, and people use it to make bread. The ship stayed offshore for about 10 days as they couldn't sail due to strong winds. Finally, at the turn of the century, we find the British clergyman William Bidulf, who travelled from Aleppo to Jerusalem. An account of his journey, in the form of letters sent back to England, was published in 1609. Once again, only the name of Samos is mentioned. If we compare this text, we can draw three main conclusions. Although Samos was on the important trade route connecting Egypt with Istanbul, it was not frequently visited. Also, most of the travelers didn't step foot on the island, so they couldn't know if it was completely depopulated or not before 1575. Samos, after 1575, was fully incorporated into the Ottoman administration, and that is reflected in the descriptions of travelers who stayed on the island and interacted with the inhabitants. I would like to end this presentation with three maps of Samos from the 16th century. I will not include the map of Piri Reis, Alonso de Santa Cruz, Giovanni Francesco Camocho, and Antonio Damillo. The first map by Benedetto Bordone, was published in his book Libro de Tutte l'Isola del Mondo in 1528. In his text, he gives various information about the ancient history of the island. In the map, we can see the ruins of ancient Samos and the fortress of Paleocastro on the east side of the island. The second map by Francesco Annibale Ferretti was published in Ancona in 1580 
and it is extremely rare. Peretti presents himself as captain and knight of the Order of Saint Stephanos. His isolario, called Di Porti Noturni, also served military purposes as he wanted to draw the attention to the losses of the Christians against to the Christians and the need to regain their power against the Ottomans. The map is engraved within an ornamental frame and it is surrounded by sea man monsters or mythological creatures. On the map, we see also four settlements. The last map is by Abraham Ortelius, drawn in 1584. His work, Theatrum Orbis Terrarum, is the first modern atlas of the world. In this map, Cyprus is surrounded by islands of the archipelago, such as Lesbos, Rhodos, Ikaria, Evia, Chios, Limnos and Samos. Some geographical indications are noted above the island, and we can see notes on historical places of ancient Samos and a reference to Mount Abelos. Studying travelers of the 16th century and focusing on an island less visited compared to others had its own challenges and limitations. However, I hoped you enjoyed this short trip to Samos as much as I did it during my research. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, this paper with all this very, very new evidence and, and beautiful um, images also. Thank you. And our um, last paper for today's session is by Mia Kaya Trentin, Associate Research Scientist at the Cyprus, <clears throat> sorry, Cyprus Institute, Stark. And her topic, her title is Western Travelers in Cyprus Through Graffiti Evidence. So thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Let me just try to share my screen. Okay. Just check. Is it working? Perfect. Thank you very much. Perfect. So thank you. Um, so before starting, I want to thank the organizer for their invitation and mostly for putting together such a rich conference uh, in topics and perspective reflecting the multicultural and vivid character of uh, the Byzantine and Ottoman lands. The aim of my presentation today is to show the work we are doing in Cyprus uh, by integrating information coming from uh, a traveler's account with the material evidence of people passage, specifically graffiti. Through two case studies, I hope to show you how we can fill existing gaps uh, of the written sources, uh, enriching our knowledge uh, about the Cypriot landscape uh, with uh, um, an interesting perspective on its human dimension. So as I said, my focus is uh, on the island of Cyprus, a crossroad between East and West, characterized by various domination across uh, the Byzantine and post-Byzantine period, mostly Western's domination, who shaped the island and uh, attributing its multicultural character. Cyprus was the last stop before the Holy Land and Egypt in the very crowded sea routes uh, of ship convoys starting mainly from Venice. Many travelers and pilgrims heading east left a written account of their trips that have been collected across the year for Cyprus specifically since the very beginning of the 20th century with the, the work of Coba, Excerpta Cypria, followed after a decade by the supplementary excerpt on Cyprus, further material for the history of Cyprus by Theophilus Mutabab. In the 90s of the same century, we see a revival of these studies with Gilles Griveaux publishing an updated and extended version of Coban's collection with excerpt of Cyprianova, and then uh, with Professor Gerasimos, uh, with uh, his work, uh, Le Voyageur dans l'Empire Ottoman, 
And uh, I want to underline that uh, Professor Gerasimo's approach was innovative in the field, uh, not only for the specific focus uh, and attention he dedicated to the landscape dimension of these accounts, but also for expanding the horizon of the sources to Eastern travelers, uh, while the previous approaches were mostly focused on Western accounts. The impact of these works uh, is evident uh, in many fields of study related to the Byzantine and post-Byzantine history and culture of Cyprus. They provide the first-hand in um, insight into the island cities, villages, people, and traditions. Generally, uh, from these accounts, we can summarize the travel routes of Western travelers and pilgrims with the help of the following maps. So usually, uh, travelers and pilgrims uh, reached Paphos by the sea, although from around the 14th century, to the, um, due to the rocky seabed and frequent sea storm uh, in the area, convoys began to abandon the harbor in favor of the ports of Limassol and Famagusta. Famagusta, of course, was the main port of the island until the 16th century, when gradually um, start losing its primacy to Larnaca that became the main uh, harbor during the 17th and 18th century. Upon arrival, travelers would usually travel by land also, reaching the capital Nicosia, and they could also move between ports by land to change their convoy after a, a longer stop. Until the 17th century, literary account uh, mainly focused on cities and paid little attention to rural villages. As a result, it is difficult to reconstruct the local topography and mobility and to connect information about generic settlements with, uh, with actual villages. Literary sources provide a picture of the main city living out the central mountainous region of Trodos uh, and the western part of the north coast. It was not until the 18th century with the travelogue of Vasilis Gregorovich Barsky that these areas began to be described and appear more often in literature. A way to address this gap uh, on the landscape information uh, is through material evidence. Uh, and uh, um, at the Cyprus Institute, we have discovered this thanks to the widespread presence of graffiti that emerged during our analysis of uh, uh, the local historical buildings, primarily religious buildings. In the last, this, in the last six years at the, the APAC Labs, uh, uh, we have started an extensive survey of the island's monument to identify the presence of graffiti and study their meaning and function. Thanks to various, various nationally funded projects, the last one being DigiGraph project, ending in a couple of weeks, we were able to unveil relevant information starting from this uh, untapped source. So far, around 120 sites with graffiti, including religious building, urban structures, uh, private and public residences uh, have been identified, preserving graffiti from the 9th to the 19th century. But the number is constantly growing thanks to the raise of awareness between the institution and the public. So they are basically uh, highlighting the presence of more um, buildings with graffiti. So before discussing the case studies, uh, I would like to briefly explain the characteristic and potential of historic graffiti of this source, specifically in, for what concern the information they can provide regarding the past mobility. So in general, from prehistory up to today, people have interacted with their surrounding space by leaving their marks and messages, primarily to state their presence in a specific place at a certain moment, as a way of self-affirmation and space appropriation, not far from what we see in our daily experience with contemporary graffiti spray across our cities. Historic graffiti are a hybrid graphic form they include textual and pictorial elements together, 
showing how everyday informal communication was performed using both textual and visual codification as means of expression, not far from what we are doing on our daily based communication through messages using both textual and uh, emoji to communicate. In Cyprus, this phenomenon is attested uh, during the Byzantine period, starting with a few examples in the 9th century and increasing in the following period to reach a peak between the 18th and 19th century. Graffiti include text in four languages and a variety of drawings. You can see some examples here. Secret historic graffiti types and function have been studied and an overview was published in 2020 uh, in the Cahier du Saint de Tout Chypriot dedicated to writing traditions and use uh, in Cyprus across centuries. Today, my focus will be specifically limited to graffiti attributed to Western travelers between the 14th and 16th century. The material I'm presenting has partially been published in the monumental work of Detlev Krak, collecting all the graffiti evidence of nobles traveling to the main shrines of the Mediterranean and Near East between the 14th and 16th centuries. And of course, uh, Cyprus was included too. Beyond the extensive collection of graffiti done by Krak, his works highlight uh, an interesting practice in fashion within the European nobility while traveling. They were hanging their heraldry, traced on wood or painted on textiles, on flags, for example, outside the places they were spending the night to indicate their presence, as in the picture you see. According to Krak, this habit of marking the space through their identity symbols was extended not only to place where they were hosted, but also to relevant places they visited. In order to ensure the durability of their mark, therefore, or their, of their passage and presence, they were not hanging movable objects on the side they visited, but they were scratching the walls or using pigments to draw their symbols, as you see on the left. Both tradition hanging symbols or scratching them on the walls were common practice and barely attested by written sources. For what concerns graffiti though, we have a relevant witness of this practice for Cyprus. Uh, thanks to Jacques Lesage, a silk merchant from Douai in France, who stopped in Cyprus in 1518 during his pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Once he arrived in Nicosia, he visited the, the city, the Church of Santa Sofia, and recorded the presence of graffiti on his travelogue, saying that the cathedral's walls, there, uh, he could recognize marks uh, and names uh, from visitors, uh, but with no disappointment or surprise. In fact, this was a widespread and largely uh, accepted practice in the past. Moreover, according to what Camilla Lark um, reports during uh, his survey of the island's monument at the end of the 19th century, Jacques Lesage himself left a graffito in one of the churches of Famagosta. Still, unfortunately, it has not been possible to identify this graffito that might be lost. Graffiti, re graffiti um, recording the presence, in, and here yeah, you can see some uh, uh, of the graffiti um, of which uh, Jacques Lesage were referring in the main facade of uh, Saint Sophia Church in Nicosia. Yeah. Graffiti re recording the presence and passage of a person from a specific place are usually defined uh, commemorative graffiti. They can be textual or pictorial. Textual commemorative graffiti record the name of the, the writer, in some case, not so frequent in Cyprus, uh, precede by the formula hic fuit, 
meaning I was here to underline the passage and the presence. Sometimes the date can be indicated too as the place of origin. And sometimes also uh, textual graffiti can be combined with the pictorial one, um, mostly uh, heraldry. Pictorial graffiti, on the other hand, uh, show identity elements, uh, mostly code of arms uh, or monogram that can uh, symbolize the, the identity of the author. Commemorative graffiti therefore provide us uh, with a picture, a sort of selfie from the past, uh, telling us who passed by the site uh, and creating a sort of guest book that is preserved on the walls of historical buildings. Um, entering into the main topic, I've chosen two case studies that are representative and able to get an insight into the local and international mobility of the island, thanks to uh, Thanks to the cross reference between the written sources and graffiti. Many other cases are emerging from the analysis of secret graffiti heritage. And actually, what we are seeing is that there's a network that can be traced between places and that can fill the gap present in travel accounts uh, with the material evidence of the passage. So we are actually able by crossing uh, material evidence of graffiti and uh, historical sources to reconstruct uh, a more precise network uh, and the relationship of these travelers uh, with uh, the secret landscape. The first example I will be mentioning today is the so-called uh, Royal Chapel of Pirga near Larnaca on the southeast coast. Pirga is uh, a village at the foot of Stavrovuni, the famous Mount Crucis, the hill on top of which is um, located the uh, well-known homonymous monas monastery of Stavrovuni. Pilgrim's account informs us that to reach the monastery, it was necessary one, one day walk with an early start in the morning. Pirga is possibly the village where pilgrims were staying before the ascent to the hill, but its name is never mentioned in written accounts, so we cannot um, be sure. Pirga. The church generally attributed to the end of the 14th century, beginning of 15th, was founded by King Janus, represented as a donor with his wife, uh, Charlotte Bourbon, under the crucifixion on the east wall. The fresco decoration represent, of the church represents a unicum on the island, characterized by French influences in the choice of the scenes, and uh, it's uh, enriched by French tituli to identify the narration. All over the preserved parts of the fresco, a rich corpus of graffiti is, vi is visible up to a height of uh, 2 meters and 30. I counted around 220 graffiti. The majority are Latin inscriptions. Here you can see uh, some. Uh, we have only one Greek and one Armenian inscription. And there's also a few drawings, uh, a coat of arms, uh, two ships, uh, and some faces and profiles. Some of the graffiti of the chapel have been studied by Professor Schabel and Schreiber, who uh, read some of them. For reason of time, I will focus only on a few examples. First are two of the three graffiti left by the Carmelite monks Aloisio, you see it here, <clears throat> who visited the site in 1518. Probably one of the time he was on his way back um, to Larnaca from the Trodos uh, region. He signs three times on three different walls, 
probably also in three different moments uh, because the handwriting uh, has slightly differences uh, and also the structure of um, the graffiti, as you can see. Uh, and this indicate, of course, uh, that the chapel was familiar to him. We don't have any other information or written records uh, about uh, this specific Carmelite uh, beyond the fact that he was passing by the, the chapel uh, thanks to, to the presence of his graffiti. Um, to other graffiti attract attention of scholars, particularly uh, of you can see them here, particularly of Camille and Lard at the end of the 19th century, and again of Professor Schabel and Schiever. Uh, they are these two long texts of quite difficult reading, scratched on the walls of the church web wall. They show the Western writing uh, uh, and we can see, uh, we can say that uh, the, the author uh, had a, a Western writing education. It's not possible to say more about the provenience of the author. And um, they were initially interpreted uh, by Enlart uh, as text, uh, you can see here, the first reading by Enlart and the second one uh, amended by Professor uh, Schabel and Schriever. Initially, they were interpreted as text against the Orthodox community, following a trend that uh, supported uh, the, um, the exchange, um, the uh, hard exchange, and um, between the, the the Latin during the Latin rule uh, and problems uh, within the two communities. But after uh, the more recent uh, and amended reading, uh, this hypothesis has been dismantled uh, and uh, the tone of the general inscription are more smooth. Uh, it does not seem to be um, connected to the dispute between Latin and Orthodox, but they are generally attributed to um, a more general uh, religious consideration. So what it is uh, sure by considering this case uh, uh, and also is underlined by uh, the, author, the authors of the, the paper, so from, by Professor Schabel and Schiever, um, and for the study we currently, uh, we are currently carried on in the labs, uh, Pirga was a focal point for Latin pilgrims uh, visiting the monastery for um, all the 15th and 16th century, at least. <laughs> that is uh, the period covered by the graffiti presence. And it's also the period when the monastery of Savoruni was not directly under the Latin control. There was a, a break between the 1426 uh, after the Mameluke invasion until the 1481 when the Franciscan took uh, back the control of the, um, of the monastery. Uh, in this case, uh, we see that the graffiti can integrate the, the traveler's account and local geography with relevant information. Graffiti in Pirga, recording the presence and passage of people, offers the possibility uh, to learn more and to increase our knowledge uh, about the presence uh, of um, Western travelers. And uh, we see that graffiti also give the possibility to uh, travelers, uh, but also to any kind uh, of person to leave their marks uh, for their posterity. The story, the story of these people in their work is not explicit and extensively documented. The majority, if not all of them, are not tested in any other historical records. But graffiti gives them the possibility of being visible, offering to us a broader and more picture of people moving along the same routes in the past.
Moreover, uh, a last interesting observation concerning this case study is that going back to the initial map of the area, other churches, the one you see here in, um, in yellow, uh, record graffiti. They are all located on the routes connecting Limassol and Larnaca to Stavrovuni along the coast or inland. There are no many textual graffiti, so actually we, um, we are still starting uh, to understand data about the provenience of, yeah? Your, if, you, if you don't mind, sort of uh, slowly, because you've, you're quite over your time. Ah, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, so yes, as I was saying, there's also other churches that are preserved graffiti. And the interesting thing is that uh, uh, these churches preserve uh, Western detail uh, ship graffiti that within uh, the current project of the University of Cyprus has been detected as uh, a votive offering in a different form made by travelers willing to thank the divinity for reaching safe the island or asking to protect them during the last part of the route. So I'm sorry, I didn't realize it was so late. So quickly, I will go just through. This is the, the second case. It's the catacomb of Hagia Solomoni in, uh, in Paphos, uh, southwestern. It's an underground site where we have uh, other Latin inscription and graffiti. And here we were lucky enough to have uh, uh, within uh, a couple of Armenian and Greek inscription, uh, a lot of Latin inscription that also tells us and testify the provenance uh, of, the, of the authors. So here we see um, someone from uh, La Hague in the Netherlands, while here uh, we see uh, Alvarotto um, de Udine. So Udine is uh, a city in uh, northeast uh, of Italy. And uh, what, and we also have in this site, uh, um, one of the very few uh, um, female names. So attesting also the presence and the passage of, um, of females that of course uh, um, were there. Um, the important thing is that uh, these graffiti are comprised between the 14th and 16th century. We are in Paphos and as I said at the beginning, uh, Paphos in this period was uh, left aside due to uh, geophysical condition of, uh, of the arbor. So actually we see that while there's a gap, so people from the travels account seems not to stop in the island, uh, sorry, um, not stop in Paphos, uh, uh, we have travelers, uh, international travelers that are here. And we know that for sure they were traveling by sea because uh, the coastal and inland route was um, uh, much more difficult to, to be followed. So uh, quickly to conclude, uh, I hope uh, uh, that um, I wanted to show that the study of graffiti in Cyprus is contributing, how it is contributing to shed light on many aspects of local and international mobility uh, and other aspects such as the co coexistence of different communities using and experiencing the same space and the visual graphic language. And uh, I hope that now, um, every time um, after my talk, also during uh, your future trips, you will pay attention to the traces of past travelers and uh, maybe noticing graffiti, uh, have additional uh, information and a different uh, um, perspective, uh, more human focused, uh, human based uh, on the knowledge of past travel and travelers. Thank you and sorry for the delay. Thank you very much. Um, and this concludes um, the papers of our first session today. We have around yeah, almost 20 minutes uh, for discussion. 
So um, may I ask perhaps all the speakers to turn on their cameras so everyone can see us. And if you have questions, if you would raise your digital hand, and then I will um, uh, give the floor to you. We have our first question. Um, uh, Jean-Michel Sour. Yes, uh, actually it's a question for you um, because uh, I was very interested by um, uh, the, the relation about the paintings of a roi mage, of a, a king, because I, I encounter uh, this uh, representation very similar when I make a, a DEA in, in France uh, long ago with uh, Xavier Barral y Altet on the representation of the founders of Mount Athos uh, in the main churches. And when you look at the representation of the frescoes of Nikiforos Phocas, exactly wear the same kind of crown that you see in the Magi. And I think it was influenced by this kind of painting and uh, because it was made in the 16th century, so a century later after you. I mean, so I think these images were circulating later around the Mediterranean and even more and uh, influenced the, the, the school of Crete uh, of, uh, you know, who, who repaint many of the monasteries in the 16th century. And the most famous is uh, um, Stavronikita. But there was also painting uh, who were done again in uh, Lavra of, of, uh, of the founders particularly who are depicted like uh, uh, the... the uh, John Paleologos that you mentioned. So I think it's a, a direct influence. At that time, I didn't know about that. I, I know I noticed that it was similar to that painting, but I didn't know it was John Paleologos behind. So it's a, like a circle uh, about uh, he came to uh, Western country and the Western country come back to Byzantine, I mean, post-Byzantine, I, I, I guess, I mean. So Thank you very much. I, I, I mean, it's it's very possible. I'm not a specialist on that, but I, I can definitely say that the image of of John with his special Schiavion hat became mm -hmm. so fashionable that I think these ideas meant. I mean, this this meant that these images circulated quite a lot. They may not have known after a while who they were representing, but it was an ancient king, something like that, or an ancient ruler. I guess. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, because uh, uh, the, the exact uh, painting is, uh, I think it's a figure. Of, I, I have my work here in Florence, the Palazzo Medici, Benzoli Gozzoli, 1459. Yeah. yeah, that's the one that Which I showed. Yeah. yeah, so he is wearing a crown in there. And, uh, and the uh, the, the, the style actually yeah I have it here like in black and white oh sorry yeah. because uh, <laughs> uh, the style uh, is very similar to the one we see uh, representing focus why focus definitely was certainly not wearing this kind of thing at that time because it's from the 10th century so it's a, a direct influence uh, uh, I, I, I think I think we, we should should maybe continue this research that I started long ago to develop more details. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next question, I'm sorry, I don't see your That's name. Right. It says iPhone. And we can't hear you. You have to unmute. Now, Piotr Wiotowski, Krakow. Yes. 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 Uh, I have actually two questions, one to you and one to Miss Corres. Maybe I will start with with Lady. Uh, if Miss Corres is, I hope she's somewhere. Uh, she's right next to you online at least. Uh, hello. Uh, in uh, description uh, given by Seropoulos, uh, the famous fragment uh, critics uh, of uh, service in Latin church 
by uh, Gregory Melisenos. Then is uh, there is for, for formula the word uh, epigraphetai uh, concerning uh, image image of Christ and it's uh, translated differently by different authors from Mango uh, till uh, and Mary uh, Whale well, uh, Carr in in the volume you uh, you recommended. Uh, sometimes is described as uh, depicted, sometimes as inscribed or characterized. Uh, it can relate to the two different uh, aspects, to image, which is Western, or to lack of letters, Isos Christos. Uh, how you understand this, uh, this passus? Well, do you hear me? Yes. yes. I think that I thank you for the question. Before all, I think that um, matters of transcribing uh, the the original text are um, related to, to um, the number of texts uh, texts about the memories of Syropoulos that we have in hand. That uh, we we know that in the first. Um, edition of the memoirs. Um, the first edition was based in the second um, uh, manuscript that we, ha we have in hand, which is wider uh, from the first one. And uh, this way we can um, consider or we can um, interpret that these lacks of letters or these words that are more in uh, the second uh, manuscript uh, than in the first uh, were put uh, by the copists or uh, there or there was a third um, um, in in the middle uh, manuscript that we have not yet yet found uh, well we can um, interpret uh, the um, this uh, word uh, as being put by the copist uh, in uh, the um, original uh, text of uh, the Syropoulos, if we regard the first text that we have as original. Um, this way we can um, um, interpret it by the, the need to, to put some information about regarding the ecclesiastic uh, th theme um, more uh, by the, um, the specific uh, copist than the, the original writer. And me, myself, I wasn't uh, occupied, and so I wasn't troubled enough with uh, the actual meaning of the word because I'm not so sure about the... Um, the, the um, the original writer of the word. And so I don't um, uh, put it uh, or contribute it to the, the, the writer, the Syropoulos writer. And that um, uh, gave me the, the opportunity not to, to use it in the context of uh, its uh, impressions about uh, the Latin topos. So I don't have an actual opinion about the word. I prefer not to 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 choose between the two original um, aspects of interpretation. Okay, if you don't mind, I will I will contact you uh, separately. Yes, of course, will, of course. Uh, about the, the of problem. Course. We can it's see different. together, I have a personal opinion, but it, it regards the, 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 the origin of uh, the text, not uh, the, actual, the actual meaning of the word. Okay. I can be so, of some help in there. And uh, my question to you, Dionysus, you mentioned uh, hunting and the goat. And the goat is uh, usually associated with uh, diet, with uh, uh, food, with meat. Uh, and uh, it was called uh, royal uh, disease. Uh, did uh, John uh, was aware that it is connected? And uh, do we have uh, evidence that uh, during this uh, hunting period, uh, the goat was uh, more uh, affected uh, his body, his, uh, his health? 
Uh, thank you very much. Well, th there's only indirect evidence in the sense that um, there is a, one of the key Byzantine texts on gout comes from this period, uh, from mm -hmm. uh, a court physician named Dimitrios Peparomenos. And so I assume that if a court physician is producing a work on gout, that must mean that, uh, you know, there's uh, interest and uh, uh, about his sort of uh, clientele um, on that. The, um, the sources that talk about um, John's gout are not the Greek ones. So it's Perotafur and this uh, short memorandum by the, the man in Peretola, which doesn't necessarily mean that um, we distrust them, especially the latter one. This was a man who, you know, just wrote down that out of the blue as a surprise, um, the emperor and Achaioli just showed up at his house and spent the day there. So there was, I, and you know, he wrote this down uh, in, in his kind of house book. There's no reason to assume that he made that up. Um, so it must be, I, I think it, it, it was true. So we don't have any evidence of saying that um, it, it, it got worse or better, but I assume the fact that he liked to be on horseback so much might suggest that it, it was more comforting to not have to walk um, rather than, and, and that I, I think also the fact that he could present himself in a much more imperial regal way on top of his horse than walking, which would have been a bit um, uh, not quite so 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 solemn. Uh, in in um, Ferrara, when the the papal um, servants refused to allow him to to get into the uh, the palace on on horseback, he was carried by his servants, so they didn't. Um, he, they didn't. Uh, he didn't touch the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question uh, via chat, and perhaps we could um, discuss it um, here. Yeah. Um, shall I read it? Um, it's for uh, our first paper um, on uh, Osor. Um, I would like to know if there are ancient remains on also related to the legend of Apsirtos, for example, a heroine or others. May I? Yeah. Just, just, please. Uh, back to Mr. iPhone. It is statistically proved that people eating meat were affected by goats. Okay, so uh, the question you put it, it was if people that were hunting, rich people, uh, king, uh, ambassador, were the person that were most affected of Go Gotha, I believe. This was the question he put it. So poor people didn't have the Gotha because they didn't eat the meat. And the, the, the best uh, way to to find uh, meat easily was to go and hunting. This is, I think, the uh, the question he put it. Okay. Um, the question, the, 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 the thing is that um, the elites hunted, but often did not eat the meat they hunted. It wasn't, they didn't eat. Just the, for, do it for eating. So, mm -hmm. The correlation between hunting and meat eating is not quite as direct as it sounds. Mm. Uh, I definitely would not suggest that. Uh, I, I didn't say it because I don't mean it. Mm. So the fact that they ate a lot of meat, um, that is, we, we know that from other sources. And like I said, um, the evidence that we have is indirect and comes from the fact that a court physician uh, wrote about it. But I would not... Uh, mm. combine it with the hunting because um, they didn't always eat what they hunted. Very often this was given um, and, and that's not just for Byzantium. We have evidence from England where we mm. have exact accounts mm -hmm. and uh, we know how much meat they ate because they, you know, we have all the, <laughs> oh, okay. the accounts and um, 
most of the money did not go to game. So mm -hmm. it's they, 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 it was a sport. I mean, it's it's easier when you see it with the foxes because they're not eaten. But well, they they did they could have eaten, of course, some of the um, uh, hairs and so on. But they didn't always. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me uh, repeat the question um, <laughs> on Osor. <laughs> so, um, are there ancient remains on Osor related to the legend of Apsyrtos, like a heroine or anything like that? And did travelers um, spend the night there uh, or just a few hours or did they just, um, um, you know, cross uh, and, and, and not stay? So uh, this is a question for the uh, Asunja Brotic. Okay. Um, so there are um, archaeological remains from that period, but not quite related to the myth. Even though um, uh, the archaeological excavations um, are not uh, were not conducted in a large scale, uh, so it was in the 90s, um, but um, the excavations were done only partially. At this moment, we are having um, uh, big works because we have the introduction of uh, um, infrastructure. So uh, we are waiting for the archaeologists uh, to uh, finish the works. And hopefully we will have... Uh, more and new founds. So far, um, the myth uh, is mainly based um, uh, on uh, um, uh, written uh, material that always repeats uh, the name uh, uh, of the archipelago and the city. And the other question was about if travelers if they stayed overnight or they just went through or they spent some hours there? I didn't find uh, that data so far, uh, but um, uh, also it was mainly um, important because of the passage. Uh, we also have uh, testimonies of some French pilgrims from the 16th century that were saying that that part of the Adriatic, even though it seems very protected uh, and shallow, uh, has um, such strong winds, uh, so uh, the ships had to um, uh, navigate uh, near the coast and hide somewhere. Um, also, there was in the period uh, of uh, the, the Middle Ages, practically because the canal collapsed, they forgot uh, a little bit about it. Uh, so only afterwards, uh, but, uh, what, uh, for example, Bordone uh, says and the others, um, they describe the way people live, what they do. So uh, at the moment, I suppose uh, they also stay there uh, because there were also two harbors uh, in the city. Uh, natural harbors, but uh, they um, were uh, uh, afterwards they were uh, transformed into salt pans, uh, and uh, they were swamps. They were not uh, maintained that well. So it was a passage. It was um, uh, a station. Um, um, in my opinion, it was a station where they didn't um, spend mo uh, much time there. Okay, thank you very much. I'm asking the organizers, I mean, our time is normally up, but whether we're allowed to um, spend uh, a little more time on questions or whether you need to um, move on to the next uh, part, Paschali or someone from the organizing team can... Well, since if, if nobody's intervening, we'll just ask the question. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you very much from uh, Sunny Venice. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Stavakopoulos. Uh, we're proceeding to our next session in okay. uh, 10 minutes. In 10 minutes? In 10 minutes, yes. Okay.
Yes. Okay, then I would like to um, thank everyone for the first session today. I'm sorry we didn't have uh, so much time for the questions, but um, everyone can send perhaps uh, messages or emails um, to, to ask them. Thank you very much to all the speakers for their perfect timekeeping and um, uh, a nice little break and, and uh, a, a great, uh, a great uh, remaining of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Madame, have a second for a moment.
good morning to everybody. This is uh, the fifth session of our conference and the first one on travelers and merchants in the East. Um, we'd like to, to call our presenters. Mrs. Apostolou. Uh, oui. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Um, uh, Professor Apostolou is our first presenter. Uh, is Professor of French Cultural History in the Department of French Language and Literature of the National and Capodistrian uh, University of Athens. And uh, she's going to uh, speak about um, Jacob Spahn um, and the monumental heritage of the Levant, uh, Jacob Spahn et le patrimoine monumental du Levant. Um, Madame Apostolou, vous avez la parole. On nous écoute pas. On vous écoute pas. Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm very glad to be here with you. I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee for inviting me, Mirka uh, Palura, uh, Pascal Sandroudis, and the other co-organizators. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to speak uh, uh, about uh, my old uh, travelers because uh, I have worked on Jacob Spohn and during my PhD thesis and also uh, for um, an article published in uh, uh, Muslim and Christian Relations in Brill uh, some years before. Um, so today I'm going to speak about Spawn, I'm going to, to speak about heritage. I have chosen to speak in French. I don't know if it was a good idea, Francophony still exists. Um, but I didn't have the time to, 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 to prepare all of the translation in English. Um, so I would like to, to share my screen. Can yes. I share? Yes. Okay. Um, donc, euh, les sujets d'aujourd'hui, um, dans la présente communication, nous attarderons sur la perception du patrimoine architectural du Levant par la tiquière Jacob Spohn. Précisons aussi que le Levant désigne, du point de vue géographique, l'espace qui dépendait de l'Empire ottoman. Spon est surtout connu comme le voyageur qui accomplit, avec les Britanniques George Well, la première périégèse archéologique dans le Levant entre 1675 et 1676. Aujourd'hui, nous ne limiterons pas notre présentation sur ces recherches sur les monuments anciens, mais nous essayerons de présenter une image plus globale de la vision qu'Espon avait du patrimoine monumental qui constitue un trait culturel propre à notre époque, comme l'avait déjà souligné François Choix dans son livre « L'allégorie du patrimoine ». Quelques mots justes pour rappeler certains éléments importants euh, de la bibli biographie de Jacob Spon. Euh, ce sont des choses qu'a priori vous connaissez. Euh, après avoir reçu une éducation humaniste à Strasbourg, il s'était formé en numismatique par le docteur Charles Patin, Spon a continué ses recherches dans l'IKER. Spon, qui a aussi reçu son diplôme de docteur de la faculté de Montpellier en 1667, a fait aussi partie de la communauté des actuels de la République des Lettres. Juste avant son voyage dans le Levant, il avait publié en 1674 la relation de l'état présent de la ville d'Athènes de Jacques-Paul Babin, qui, quoi qu'elle focalise sur le passé antique de la ville, avec des références sur les monuments antiques, elle offre aussi des informations importantes sur son état contemporain. Donc, nous avons aussi dans cet ouvrage une image d'Athènes ottomane. Il y a aussi question de maisons faites des ruines anciennes, ayant pour tout ornement quelques pièces de colonnes de marbre mises dans le mirail sans ordre, et à la façon des autres pierres, ou quelques degrés de marbre marqués de croix qui ont servi autrefois sur le porte ou fenêtre des églises ruinées. Donc ici, nous avons quand même des références à Spolia. De plus, on y trouve des renseignements sur des églises 
hein, que les chrétiens de la religion grecque conservent, après que les Turcs leur ont pris plusieurs de plus belles pour les changer en mosquée. Il est aussi d'ailleurs dans cet ouvrage de la transformation euh, de, des églises chrétiennes, des églises byzantines, en mosquée. C'est la vie de vol d'oiseaux que vous pouvez voir euh, ici. Et on voit l'acropole avec le Parthénon flanqué de son minaret et les principales antiquités de la ville ainsi que de mosquées. Alors, juste avant de son voyage, et on ne sait pas, on imagine que derrière cette publication aurait pu inciter pour entreprendre le voyage dans le Levant, avait une image précise de la situation d'Athènes et de la présence d'un patrimoine monumental commun, composé de monuments antiques, de monuments byzantins et non byzantins, ainsi que des mosquées. Passons maintenant sur son voyage, qui a été financé par le britannique George Well, qu'il avait rencontré à Rome. Comme lui-même mentionne dans le voyage, euh, vous pouvez ici voir... Euh, c'est le premier et le second volume du voyage d'Espagne. Il y en a trois volumes. Le troisième est consacré aux inscriptions. Et vous avez aussi la page de titre euh, du voyage, du récit du voyage de George Well. Et nous remarquons que euh, sur la page de titre, Spon mentionne Well, qui était son groupe voyageur, et que Well, à euh, son page de titre aussi, il mentionne Spon. Euh, donc, euh, comme lui-même a dit dans le voyage d'Italie, de Dalmatie, de Grèce et du Levant, publié en 1678, donc c'est-à-dire deux ans euh, après, après, après son retour, c'est seulement l'amour de l'Antiquité qui m'a fait entreprendre le voyage d'Italie et de Grèce. Alors, l'objectif de l'ère de voyageur était d'avoir une expérience directe de l'Antiquité qu'il connaissait déjà par la lecture. Donc, on parle de la lecture, on parle surtout des auteurs anciens euh, et plus précisément de Rodot de Doposanias. Euh, Spon copie des inscriptions et euh, collections de médailles et de manuscrits. Ses, ses recherches sur l'Antiquité ont été aussi diffusées par les publications de Miscellane Erudit Antiquitatis, euh, publié en 1679, où il définit la notion de l'archéologie ou archéographie qui est un programme de recherche. Parmi euh, les différentes composantes de l'archéographie figure l'architectonographie. C'est l'étude de monuments. Elle est plus précisément la description et connaissance de bâtiments anciens, temples, arcs de triomphe, théâtres, pyramides, obélisques. Donc on voit quand même qu'il y a un intérêt particulier non seulement pour la découverte de vestiges antiques, mais aussi pour euh, l'architecture monumentale. Euh... Spon passe alors euh, des jours et des mois entiers à ne faire presque autre que considérer les statues, les bas-reliefs et les masures et à copier toutes les inscriptions. Il note à propos de Giro que nous lui avons l'obligation des antiquités qu'il nous fait voir à Athènes, que nous n'aurions pas découvertes dans six mois de ce jour sans un secours semblable. Et donc, euh, Spon, avec Well, il parcourt euh, Athènes et puis la Grèce jusqu'à leur arrivée à Constantinople. Et ils vont aussi se servir euh, de gens qui, qui, qui sont là-bas, qui ont une meilleure connaissance. Euh, Giro est un euh, vice-consul, euh, vice un ancien vice-consul euh, de la France. Il était aussi euh, un vice-consul euh, britannique. Euh, il est d'origine française. Et est Is she not louder? Close qui... this thing. You don't want to filter. Est-ce que je continue? Qu'est-ce que je fais? Voilà, donc ils vont se servir de personnes euh, qui vont euh, les aider à euh, mieux connaître le pays. Ils vont aussi, euh, ce n'est pas seulement euh, euh, Giro, c'est aussi Covey, 
euh, ou Rico par la suite euh, à, en Turquie. Donc, ils vont se servir de ces gens pour apprendre mieux et pour avoir aussi une périgèse euh, plus ciblée. Et à Athènes, donc, il copie, il visite le monument et dans son ouvrage, nous trouvons également euh, des euh, gravures euh, qui sont reproduites apparemment d'après des dessins qu'il avait faits, il dessinait aussi euh, Spon. Et à nous, vous pouvez voir euh, le Parthénon et euh, en bas, euh, c'est le temple de Minerve publié dans George Well et à droite, c'est euh, le Parthénon de... Euh, 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 publié dans l'ouvrage de Spon, qui est reproduit euh, dans l'ouvrage de, de Bernard de Montfaucon, l'Antiquité expliquée. Et je n'ai pas aujourd'hui le temps de parler de ça, mais les images euh, euh, rapportées par euh, Spon et publiées dans son ouvrage, malgré le fait que les proportions de, de monuments ne sont pas correctes, elles étaient souvent reproduites et jusqu'au milieu du XVIIIe euh, siècle, c'était quasiment les seules images euh, 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 comment dire, réalisées sur place qu'on connaissait de monuments d'Athènes. Donc, euh, il euh, étudie les monuments et ici, euh, vous pouvez voir euh, les, euh, euh, la tour de vent, hein, les Thésaïons, les temples de Festos et le monument de Lysicrate. Euh, Spon, il voyage, il copie, il essaie d'identifier. Donc, euh, la première chose en ce qui concerne le patrimoine, il faut identifier les monuments et comprendre aussi leurs valeurs architectoniques. Euh, il fait vraiment beaucoup d'efforts et, et euh, il va être le premier à identifier les temples d'Athéna Nike euh, sur l'acropole. Il y a néanmoins dans son ouvrage plusieurs erreurs. Les propriétés d'après Spon, sont en temple parce que euh, il y a une façade et un fronton comme les autres. De, de la même manière, il considère que la porte de l'agora, de l'agora euh, romaine, fait partie aussi d'un temple. Il se trompe aussi sur les identifications de fronton du Parthénon parce que et, et, il avait euh, il avait une confusion concernant l'entrée. Et il, il ne s'aperçoit pas que l'entrée du temple avait été déplacée à l'ouest lors de sa transformation en église puis en mosquée. Ainsi, en s'appuyant sur Posanias, qui situe la naissance d'Athéna sur le fronton du sud, euh, euh, tandis qu'en réalité, ça représentait la dispute entre Athéna et Poseidon sur la possession de la digue. Et, et la même chose se passe aussi en ce qui concerne les rections. Et là-bas, il pense que le cariatide sont les trois grâces que Socrate avait taillées. Donc, on a souvent une tendance de dire que euh, Spon, euh, il était très attentif, etc. Mais il faut savoir qu'il est parmi les premiers qui visitent. Et il, il n'a pas pu euh, faire des fouilles vraiment. Donc, euh, c'était normal euh, d'avoir. Euh, et, euh, certaines euh, interprétations. En tout cas, euh, 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 en ce qui concerne l'Antiquité, parfois euh, il va euh, décrire et il va euh, publier des images euh, de monuments qui par la suite seront euh, disparus. Donc ici, je vous ai mis l'image euh, d'un monument funéraire euh, qu'il qu avait vu à, à Milassa. Et, pardon. Et euh, après euh, le départ d'Espo, on ne sait pas exactement quand, ce monument a été disparu. Maintenant, j'aimerais passer à la perception euh, d'Espo de, de, de Byzance. La connaissance euh, par Spo de la civilisation byzantine et non-byzantine est limitée. Certes, il cite quelques chroniqueurs byzantins et écrit une notice c'est la suite de portraits des différents membres donc, pardon, euh, de la famille de Komnen, que vous pouvez voir ici. Il s'agit d'un manuscrit que George Well avait acheté et qui est actuellement conservé à Oxford. Donc, Spon, il avait copié tout ça. Euh, et euh, il avait aussi copié euh, à Constantinople plusieurs inscriptions byzantines. À Constantinople, euh, il s'intéresse aux monuments. Euh, il, il va dessiner, il va décrire l'obélisque 
Et comme vous pouvez voir <coughs> ici, il va copier aussi euh, le deux de colonne de Pompée et, et, et la colonne martienne. Et néanmoins, euh, si vous voulez, euh, il, il visite Sainte-Sophie, appelée à l'époque la mosquée de Sainte-Sophie, et elle parle euh, de, de cette construction, il dit que c'est un dôme très vaste et très bien éclairé, <coughs> soutenu de belles colonnes de marbre aux côtés, et les miracles en sont aussi tout incrustés. Je ne m'arrêterai pas à vous en donner la description, mais le comparer à Saint-Pierre de Rome, à qui il cède en grandeur et en architecture. Et sa description de Sainte-Sophie est limitée, <coughs> il ne semble pas très impressionné, et euh, il, il, il préfère euh, parler de l'état de conservation, par exemple, des sculptures de la Porte Dorée, exprimant les souhaits que le marquis de Nointel, ambassadeur de France à Constantinople à l'époque, pourra un jour faire dessiner ses reliefs. Et ici, je vous ai mis une, une image que nous avons de fronton du Parthénon, qui était réalisé par l'artiste du marquis de Nointel. Quand euh, Spon euh, était à Constantinople, il était reçu bien sûr par l'ambassadeur, et euh, l'ambassadeur lui avait montré un portfolio, pardon, euh, un portfolio de dessins. Et... <coughs> Prenez votre temps, euh, professeur Apostolo. A brief pause in order to give some time to Professor Apostolo. Pardon, je suis désolée, mais je suis malade. Je suis rentrée de Stockholm où il y avait la semaine dernière, moins 17. Ça travaille mm. encore au rhume. Donc, euh, <coughs> Pardon, je parlais des dessins réalisés par l'artiste du marquis de Nointel, des monuments d'Athènes, qu'Espon avait réussi à voir à Constantinople. On ne sait pas exactement ce qu'il y avait dans ses portfolios, mais pour la conservation de monuments, comme euh, Espon comprenait que les sculptures de la porte dorée serait par la suite détruite et il considérait que ça serait bien et de le faire de le faire copier. Passons maintenant à, à la perception à sa perception des monuments ottomans. Nous avons dit eh, que l'objectif d'Espon était euh, d'étudier euh, l'Antiquité. Il savait néanmoins qu'il allait visiter l'Empire ottoman et que là-bas, il y avait aussi autre chose à voir. Dans son ouvrage, il ne s'attarde pas, moi je ne dirais pas qu'il s'attarde énormément sur euh, euh, l'architecture ottomane. Néanmoins, il y a des références, il y a plusieurs références. Certainement, ces références sont moins nombreuses que les références sur l'Antiquité. Et en ce qui concerne l'iconographie, à part l'image d'un chapiteau que je vais vous montrer par la suite, il n'y a pas grand-chose. Ici, je vous ai mis l'image des Smyrne, mais ça, ça vient de publication hollandaise du voyage de Jacobs Po. Et d'ailleurs, on imagine que c'est vu 
les vies qu'on retrouve dans l'ouvrage sont euh, des, des, des compositions réalisées euh, d'après les descriptions des accorsements. Donc, c est, c est, il ne s'agit pas de croquis qui étaient réalisés sur place. Et, donc, à, à gauche, vous avez euh, un chapiteau à la turque. C'est la seule image qu'il donne. À droite, je vous ai mis la mosquée du sultan Ahmed euh, telle qu'elle a été publiée dans l'ouvrage de George Orwell. Et euh, Spon parle euh, de, euh, de, de mosquées, il parle de la mosquée de, du sultan Ahmed, il me parle de la mosquée euh, de la Valide. Et, par exemple, il dit la mosquée neuve de la sultane mère de Mahomet, à présent régnant, est encore plus superbe. C'est un des plus beaux édifices qui se puisse voir, soit par les dehors, soit par les dedans. L'architecture, bien qu'elle est un peu éloignée de nos règles, ne laisse point à celle de belles églises d'Italie. Après, par, pour montrer les liens, euh, pas les liens, mais pour faire établir une correspondance pour qu'elle soit mieux compréhensible, plus compréhensible, il dit. Le mur et les pilastres des dents sont tout incrustés de terre cuite vernissée, semblable à notre faïence, de même que les trianons de Versailles. C'était toujours un problème avec le voyageur qui parle des choses que les lecteurs ne connaissent pas. Il procède souvent à une correspondance pour qu'il euh, euh, qu donne une meilleure image. Et, il parle aussi du euh, euh, serail. Et notre guide mena un jour voir le serail, nous n'entrons pas que jusqu'au divan, qui n'a rien de superbe. C'est vrai euh, que le divan euh, et le serail en général, comme il n'avait pas une architecture monumentale euh, comme l'architecture classique euh, des de palais euh, français, euh, euh, souvent... Euh, Comment dire Et Les voyageurs n'étaient pas enthousiastes, n'étaient pas impressionnés. Et donc, ils il donnent ici certaines informations et ils rapportent surtout des informations qu'on lui avait apportées par la suite. Et contrairement à Jacob Spon, qui ne va pas nous livrer des images des mosquées constantinopolitaines, il faudra attendre Grello, à Guillaume Grello, qui, quelques années plus tard, en 1680, il va publier la relation nouvelle d'un voyage de Constantinople, où il va donner non seulement de vie perspective, mais il va aussi donner de plans et de mosquées les plus importantes de Constantinople. Donc, avant de terminer, puisque, comme je touche, je ne peux pas euh, trop m'attarder, ce que je vais dire, euh, et ce qui m'avait beaucoup marqué quand je lisais le texte d'Espo, c'est qu'il s'attarde beaucoup sur les remplois de matériaux anciens. Par exemple, il, il constate l'utilisation des spoliers dans les constructions byzantines. Euh, lors de sa visite de l'église de Panaya au Ruepico, il remarque qu'elle est toute remplie de cornices, de frises, de bas-reliefs et d'inscriptions euh, antiques. Euh, il, euh, il parle aussi euh, de euh, ben, l'utilisation euh, également de, euh, euh, par les Turcs, euh, l'utilisation aussi des antiquités dans leurs mosquées. Et il parle de la transformation euh, des églises en mosquées. Et il dit par exemple que euh, euh, les habitants lui ont renseigné que l'église de Saint-Jean à Éphèse a été transformée en mosquée. Et donc, on voit quand même que dans les textes euh, de Spon, il y a beaucoup d'informations qui montrent que euh, les trois civilisations euh, et leur euh, construction, donc euh, euh, l'Antiquité, euh, la période byzantine et la période ottomane, il y a cette réemploi, il y a cette réutilisation qui, euh, quoi que Spon ne réalise pas, une euh, étude approfondie sur ça. Il nous livre partout dans son texte des informations sur ça. Euh, 
merci euh, pour votre attention. Je vais terminer ici. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Apostolou, for this fascinating uh, presentation. And um, I, I would like to say that um, as I was hearing you, as I was watching your presentation, I realized that, that just only 25 years after Stuart and Revit um, spawned um, um, the gaze of Spawn towards the Byzantine uh, heritage, the Byzantine architecture, leads uh, to a different perception of the past at the end of the uh, 17th century. This is very uh, interesting. Um, so thank you very much. And um, uh, our next speaker, um, Mrs. Bourne, uh, will not is not uh, she's not able to join us due to a last minute uh, problem so we proceed to um uh, mr siametis mr siametis hear me yes we can hear you um, Mr. Siametis is a historian and archaeologist, and he is going to uh, present uh, Christian rituals and monuments, as well as folk medicine, superstitions, and magic in the diary of Stefan Gerla, 16th century. You have the floor, Mr. Siametis. Thank you also. Thank you for uh, your invitation. Um, just a moment to open to share my screen. Sorry, I did expect uh, that I'm going to speak earlier. Yes. Was... Give me one second, please. Yes, of course. Please. I hope. You can see now my page. No? Uh, not yet. It? Not yet. Not yet. Oh. I don't know what is. I think now it's. Uh... Maybe now? Yes, yes, we can see it. Yes. Okay. Um, with this paper, I would like to present some Christian rituals and monuments, as well as topics of folk medicine, superstition, and magic, according to the diary of Stefan Gerger. Before I start, I would like to express my thanks to Mizi Olivi Gopoulou, adding me all the notes regarding the diary kept by her husband, Thanasis Papazotos, for his death. Stefan's Gerlach's itinerary, consisting of notes in diary form, is a much more voluminous work than its founded parts. It was prepared for publication by Gerlach's grandson Samuel Gerlach, based on his grandfather's manuscripts, and published and found in 1674. His rare work, which has a limited number of copies, is a very difficult text whose of the layout of the page and the printing style of the letters, as well as because of its language. There is no modern version of the text in German, as in the case with the travel books of that period. Regarding the history of research, it appears, research, it appears that due to the aforementioned difficulties, the diary has not extensively analyzed. We can cite the following papers and books, some of which have also partial translation of the text. An early presentation of the work can be found in a small book written by Mottmann and published in Berlin in 1895 uh, in 50 pages with the two engravings and the title Eine Deutsche Botschaft in Kino. The diary is selectively translated also in Bulgarian and Hungarian, uh, with some only some selection of the text. But very interesting is an article of Kribe. With, uh, with the title Stefan Gerlach, Deutsch Evangelische Botschaft Pediga in Constantinople. Also, the doctoral thesis of George Elias Zachariadis, Tupigen in Constantinople in the 16th 
Uh, I, hear, I hear another voice in the microphone. Hear me. Excuse me, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, it's okay now. You can uh, proceed. For a recent detailed introduction, we can also mention an article of the uh, published in 1989, but the most important work on the subject is a target study with the title Stefan Gerler to Kige Jungliu, uh, published in two volumes in 2006 by Beidili and uh, Noyalu, the translation of almost the entire text. The structure of the book is as follows. Its opening pages contain the diploma that Gerlach received from the University of Tübingen on the occasion of uh, his doctorate in theology, written in Latin, and an analytical preface in the typical form that had the similar German books of the time, both of them around 24 pages. The main book consists of 532 pages, with a height of 32 centimeter and width of 19 centimeter written in two columns. On almost all pages, there are short margin notes clarifying the content of each paragraph, which were added before the book was published. The work also includes official letters in Latin, as the correspondence of the German emperor with the Ottoman Imperial Council and some private letters. At the end, we find an index of terms names and long phrases the page um, yes uh, so this page you can see the structure of one page and uh, a letter in latin um and then we find an index of terms names and long phrases consisting of 36 pages the illustration is limited in few portraits on the first page of the book anti geometric or plant ornaments plain selectively on certain pages. It is the only travel chronicle of the 16th century that was not published by the author himself, thought he did not join the publishing competition of his time by including reviews that reflect the perceptions and intellectual environment. However, it did not remain unpublished until the 19th or 20th century like other similar manuscripts, and therefore it cannot comment by modern scholar, uh, has no comment by modern scholar. This is the only travel chronicle of the 16th century, which is published as it is, just a century after it was written. That means it does not include stereotypes that both publishers and readers demanded. Stefan Gerlach lived between 1546 uh, to 1612. The Protestant preacher, chosen as a number of diplomatic delegation, which accompanied Count and Ambassador David Ignat to Constantinople, where he stayed for more than five years. Important information about the selection of the two protagonists of the diary can be found in the general introduction, the first page of the book. The introduction, the, the general introduction. Stefan Gerlach was teaching theology at the University of Tübingen when he was asked to accompany the new ambassador of Maximilian II. As a student of Martin Crucius or Krauss, an expert on the Greek language award, Gerlach's interest and aim were particularly the union with the Orthodox Church. For this purpose, and as uh, can be seen from, from the extensive entries in the diary, was often meetings and religious conversations with the patriarch and metropolitans on the, of the Orthodox Church, exchange ideas about faith. But he soon understands that the interest of the Orthodox world in the Protestant doctrine is far from the expected and necessary. The Orthodox Church firmly believes that it is on the right path. We note some topics that concern Christianity and are developed in the diary. The topics of this presentation are marked in yellow. Regarding the monuments in Constantinople, and especially the churches and monasteries, Gerlach first adds important information about the architecture, the external or internal decoration, the naming of existing monuments, 
it's today either still used or have been declared museums as a result of which we are able to complete the fragmentary picture provided by their current state. Second, it informs us about the location of monuments whose existence we know from the sources, but we are ignorant of details. And third, refers to monuments which are not only unknown to us from sources, but their traces are no longer found. In order to find information about the church buildings, one can use the index compiled by Samuel Geria. Unfortunately, too much of them are scattered throughout the text. The utility of the information provided by Geller's diary becomes clear if we read a study published as an e-book under the title at the title Byzantine Churches in Constantinople, the History and Architecture. In this book, we find, for example, that in the cases of the following four monuments, the views and descriptions of the German uh, theologian are of particular, import, particular importance. I quote the extensive Gellert's description about the charts of IEU. On the upper part, you can see the uh, original text and down a translation in it. We will now speak of four of the for the of the sacrament of uh, baptism, which is a representative of Christian rites. We found that one has to search carefully throughout the whole diary in order to perceive the relevant information. Gellert does not break down its topic in a paragraph or two, but gives in different points of the text various information about it. On page. Uh, it reads, during the ceremony, they say the following words. His child, servant of God, is baptized in the name of the Holy Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The reason they did it was a religious dispute that broke out in Corinth. One of the priests there wanted to perform the ceremony according to the method of his teacher who baptized him. That is, according to the method of Paul, another according to the method of Apollo, Cephas, or Peter. Or prevent such passions from arising today during the baptism, one should not say the words, I baptize you. The baptism takes place when children are two or three years old and can carry their own candles. It is held either in a house or in charge and consecrated oil is poured over their entire body from head to toe. Mm -hmm. That is on the next passage. Uh, on page 160, when their children reach the age of three mm -hmm. or four, the Greeks give them wine and bread after the baptizing ceremony according to the history of their supper. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, you can proceed. Yes. Uh, children often split it out immediately. The priest then takes them inside the altar and hits them. But on the next, it doesn't go on. Oh, what's happening? Okay. On pages uh, 405 to 407, uh, we see that on uh, 10th November uh, 1577, Gerlach attended the uh, baptism of a boy in the presence of his grandfather, but not his parent. Description is extensive and detailed. It gives evidence with the words spoken and the symbolic gestures made by the priest. It describes the place, the costumes, and the events of the participants, but also a celebration that took place immediately after the ceremony. Reading the text, we can clearly understand is performed today in exactly the same way but the Greek Orthodox Church. Living religion, we now turn to people's daily lives and select some topics such as superstition, tradition, traditional or official medicine, magic, divination, and astrology. The information we were able to glean from Gallup's extensive diary is as follows. Cool. On page 403, it reads, according to the belief of many Turkish women, if a Muslim by accident faces a Christian, that brings him good luck. On page 309, uh, 
1893, the scene of a crowded square is very vividly described. Various entertainments were organized in the square in front of the Bayazid Mosque. Some played with monkeys, others with dogs, others played the lutes, and others sang along with the music. Some presented various silly shows to the public, and each of them had a few hundred viewers. Such demonstrations take place in this square every day during the afternoon, or Kidi, that means between 3 and 4 o'clock. There also sit the sorcerers and the soulsayers, women and men. Some of them use stones and beans, other six or eight dice, dice which they throw in there when someone asks something. There are also those who have a small book by their side, from which they get information about someone's good or bad faith. Of course, this soul has come. The Yanitsaren and the Tsaus of our lots often ask uh, these uh, soul sayers when the present or the correspondence would arrive. They sometimes answer, since you came to me, have came to me, you want to know about some treasure, but they did not know when these presents would come. Instead, they always answered incorrectly. Perhaps the book referred to is one of the Solomon's magical books. According to Gerlach's statement, an Arab astrologer predicted the comet that appeared in 11th November uh, 1577 and informed the Sultan. The astrologer mentioned by Gerlach is Takiyuddin Effendi, the founder of the first observatory, which the Gerlach also mentioned. Says, Sultan Murat wrote an astrologer from Cairo. His man was to build a tower on a hill outside Dalata, where the house of the Venetian Andrea Greek is, and the foundation of this tower would go very deep into the ground, and the underground part would have many and white clusters, so that to be able to see the stars in the sky during the day. He had built a measuring room, and thanks to his work, which would be completed in seven years, he would be able to determine the Sultan's future, his fate, fortune and misfortune, friend and his enemy, depending on their arrangement of the stars in the sky. His man is paid 3,000 dokats a year, and all his expenses are covered. If his work was finished, he would be paid 6,000 dokats. The Sultan brought a Jew from Thessalonica who could read the stars. Man had once been an assistant to the Shah of Iran, and was now teaching the son of the Sultan's teacher the art of the reading the stars. Then the comet would bring destruction to Berberi. On the same pages, it reads that the comet appeared with a tail, was seen very clear and brightly in the sky for many nights. According to the rumors carried by Kerla, the star appeared for the third time since the creation of the world. In the third appears, Sodom and Gomorrah were submerged and in the second pharaoh drowned in the Red Sea. What will happen in this third time is probably left or to the public sphere and imagination. Generally, comments were considered a sign of bad luck. This time, it was not seen as a sign of bad luck, but probably as a sign of the Persian sars doom. It also mentioned, while the king of Spain was in the queen's room, a lightning struck the room. A black uh, dog howled under his window and an astrologer predicted that the king would soon die. Then the king became very worried and prepared his will. Although this particular passage presents the howling of a dog as a bad omen, Constantinople at that time was inhabited by people who released birds, fed cats and dogs in the streets, and threw fish they caught into the sea, either as a sign of respect for the Sultan, either to be rewarded for their good needs. The author refers also to materials that were used at that time as medicinal, but also magical means. Bezoar. The word Bezoar is derived from the Persian Bazaar, literally antidote. The myth of Bezoar as an antidote reached Europe from the Middle East in the 11th century. People believe that the Bezoar had the power of a universal antidote that would work against the pain poison. A drinking glass which contained the Bezoar 
und neutralizer in poison pool and into it. The most common desert stone is a kind of greenish brown stone in the stomach of some wild goats, formed by the hardening of the fibers and feathers which they swallow. On page 100, uh, yes, on page 156, Gerlach states the Iranian ambassador was invited to the presence of the Sultan among the gifts he brought. There were 46 carpets, six boxes adorned with emeralds, rubes, uh, pearls, and a kind of, of black diamond and the sword stone. On page 200, 29 reads, if the bezoar stone sweats under the sun, several membranes form on top of its other, and if it shows a little eye on its surface, this proves that it is pure. On other page, we found detail about the size, price, and value of the stone, which was transferred as a present from Turkey to Austria. Balsam, our last topic is the balsam, the resinous exudate or sap which forms certain kinds of trees and shrubs. Uh, shrub, excuse me. Balsam, from Latin balsamum, gum of the balsam tree, owns its name to the, uh, to the, uh, to the bulb of Gilead. We know that Gerlach at first gives again scattered information on the subject, but uh, at the end provides a detailed account based on information given by an uh, Arab merchant about the balsam. In Constantinople, there is no balsam except in the palace of the ruler and the mansions of the pa Passads. On January 6th, Ahmed Pasha brought the balsam for the bishops of Salzburg. The bal balsam was thick and of white in color. Pasha said that his mother-in-law, who belongs to the court, gave it to him. On page 159, he saw the experiment by which the purity of the product, the product is tasted. The balsam is very thick in consistency and yellowish in color, and when added to the water, it disperses and became, becomes invisible in water. After a while, when viewed from a distance, it is observed that a dull layer, layer, like ice, was formed on the water, and this layer separates from the surface of the water and flows without dissolving. It can be removed as a part of its sinks bottom. Presently, the balsam can no longer be found in Cairo. It can only be brought from Mecca. Page 223 gives information about sapphires, appearance, price, and use. They used it against all kinds of diseases, applied it to goods and source spots, and mixed it with food. The Arab who came from Mecca brought with him an aloe tree with a very beautiful and strong aroma. Taking a few drops of the balsam before leaving his house in the morning, protected him from all kinds of poisons. He also burned aloe and smoked his clothes. On the same page with the title, information given, given by the Arab about the balsam at the request of the Honorable Master, of my Honorable Master, on July 25th. I mention here some of the most remarkable information on this long passage. This plant goes in Arabia in a very large village called Badr Hunim, which is near, nearly halfway between Mecca, where Muhammad was born, and Medina, where his top is. Ortelius calls this settlement Madel Henen. Strabon writes that this balsam was discovered by the Sibir who lived in the area mentioned. This tree grows in the valleys and hills of the region, in the countryside and without any care. The surrounding area is almost entirely sandy and stony. The trees look like beautiful peach trees with thick trunks. Because they were branched, they occupied a large area. The pieces of the tree also had a strong smell like balsam and spread far and wide. In the spring, around April in our country, the balsam begins to flow on the tree. Then they would, they would scrape the branches of the tree with a sharp tool and tie body underneath to collect it. 
Not more than three or four drops of balsam are said to run from a branch a day. That is why even the most productive tree could produce only 10 to 13 grams balsam. A drum is three or four drops at most. Or soon, when the heat set in, no more liquid would flow from the tree. In fact, the balsam flows from the tree only at, the at this time of the year. According to Dioscuridis, it flows in the hottest season, but it is necessary to consider whether the spring season in Arabia is as hot as the summer season in India. Both Dioscuridis knew that balsam only came from trees that grew, that grew in the royal gardens of India and Egypt. Some people knew well which branches of these trees would produce the most balsam. After it follows the balsam test, and it reads, the balsam was used in Arabia when the weather was bad against epidemics and poisoning because it neutralized the poison. Beside this, when one falls, has a sore spot or is cold, becomes weak and feeble, or loses control of his arm and legs, if he swallows a dirham or ball, ball wraps himself in a blood and the sweets, even the most intensive pains will disappear and will immediately recover his health. Moreover, according to what the Arabs said, a year ago about 200 of these plants, together with the soil in which they grow, were uprooted and brought into to Cairo to be planted because the region of Arabia was under the rule of governor of Cairo. The balsam collection was a free for all. Anyone who was there, when it was flowing, could collect and sell it. Another passage informs us that a quantity of balsam was sent from Constantinople to Vienna to end up in the hands of a high official. Thus concludes my attempt to present the value of the information contained in Stefanos Gerl's Tagebuch. In a few months, I will have completed the translation of the text into Greek. We see that only, not only the researchers, but also the general public can become fellow travelers on the journey that took place in Constantinople 450 years ago. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schiametis, for this so interesting presentation. Uh, Gerlach is indeed a very unique case of a uh, traveler. And we hope that one day uh, his entire diary will be published. And we're looking forward to your uh, publication in Greek. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, and now we can proceed to our next presenter, Maria Xenariou. Mrs. Xenariou. Hello. Is uh, Mrs. Xenario connected? Well, um, I don't see the name in our list here. So um, we may proceed to Professor Tunda. Yes, good morning to everyone. Uh, with pleasure, but I, I see that the uh, Miss Xenario is connected. I mean, at least I, I, I saw, I uh, see her connection. Well, uh, we can uh, wait for a moment. Maybe she has uh, trouble. Yes, and if... Yes, yes, okay. okay. If not, I'm ready to, to present my paper. Um, Mrs. Xenario, can you hear us? Um, just a moment to, to send a message. You can see here, here in the list. Ah, oh, I, I can hear something. Is it scenario? Hello? 
slow. Well, I think she... Buongiorno, I'm here. Uh, buongiorno. <laughs> buongiorno. Buongiorno. At class. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Ms. Snariu is a researcher in the Phenopolis Collection Benaki Museum. And she's going to speak about the depiction of the urban landscape in the Cunabula of the Phenopolis collection. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I would like to thank the organizing committee for the honoring um, invitation to be part in this conference. And now we'll present my paper sharing the screen. It's clear, it's full screen or not yet? Uh, yes, it's okay. It's a full screen? Yes, it's a full screen. Okay, no, no, it's not, just a moment, it's not a full screen. You must uh, push the bottom for full screen presentation. A moment. Yes, this one. All right. Not yet. Not yet? No, it's not. Uh, in my screen, I see full screen uh, video. We, we it's not full screen in your screen? Not yet. Maybe uh, okay. a little delay. I don't um, know. I'll try again. Just another time. Well, you can try again. Yes, I'm trying. No? No. No. Mm. What a pity. Okay. Anyway, you can proceed. Um, it's a pity because I see the full screen and uh, you see the PowerPoint, I suppose. Maybe in a little while it will be full screen, uh, but now. Uh, I'll try again now. No, it's not full screen. Not. Mm, we'll share. Then. Okay, you can proceed. Anyway, we can see something. <laughs> okay. Now? Yes. Ah. Uh, yes. Better. It That's is full screen now. Yes, it's full screen. Thank you. Thank you. So. Travel literature in the 15th century is mainly associated with the journey to the Holy Land, the attraction to the ancient world, and with the commercial and religious activities. The Phenopoulos collection of the Binaki Museum includes important documents from the first period of the printing activity. Two copies. Oh. <laughs> what a pity. It's not... Uh... All right. Two copies of Bernard von Breidenbach's editions, Peregrinatio in Terram Sanctam, published in 1486 in Latin and German, 
together with two loose engravings taken from the edition of 1486 and 1502. From Hartmann Schedel's edition, the Nuremberg Chronique are kept 15 loose detached leaves from two different editions, the Latin Liber Chronicarum and the German Die Schedelsche Weltchronik in 1493. Finally, from Guillaume Caursen's rare edition, Obsidionis Rodie Urbis Descriptio of 1496, two rare woodcuts are saved. Bernard von Breidenbach's work, Peregrinatio in Teram Sanctum, describes the pilgrimage to the Holy Land in the years 1483 to 1484. The first two editions of the work in 1486 in Latin and German are available in the Phenopolis collection. The journey took 10 months and most of it was by sea. From Venice to Jerusalem, the Dalmatian, the Dalmatian coast, Corfu, Methoni, Crete, Rhodes, Cyprus, were the stops until the pilgrims landed in Jaffa. They visited the holy places and then followed the land route to the Sinai Peninsula and the monastery of St. Catherine. Then from Egypt, they returned to Venice. The publishing venture of Bernard von Breidenbach testifies to the accomplishments of the typography of the time, as well as the refreshing and exploratory spirit of the Renaissance. The publication is a, a milestone in the itinerant literature during the early steps of the printing activity. This is the first illustrated travel testimony resulting from an witnessing and personal experience. Bernard von Breidenbach conceived and carried out the, com the complex project of the publication thanks to his erudition, his expanded perception of the technical and scientific achievements of his time and his entrepreneurial spirit. The great success of Bernard von, uh, von Breidenbach's book is partly due to the fact that it provides a lot of useful informative texts for would-be travelers. For this reason, it is considered that the book was the better guide of its time. The success of the edition, however, is due to the very interesting and uh, exact, faithful illustration. This consists of woodcuts depicting views of cities, human figures, alphabets, and animals. Bernard von Breidenbach recognized the importance of illustration as a means of rendering the objective truth and authenticity of the world in uncloses, as he quotes. For this purpose, Roivich, the painter, designed the very interesting views of the cities, capturing information about the place and the people with the eye of the artist traveler. The full credit of Roivich's name as illustrator is the first such practice in the history of publishing. In this case, the early association of European artist pictographers with the itinerant literature can be detected. Roivich is described by Brandenbach as an experienced, charismatic, perspective, perceptive, multi-talented, and erudite artist. Characterization highly 
commendable and unusual at the time. The Phinopoulos collection has a complete copy of the original Latin edition of 1486 and a copy of the German editions of the same year, preserved and restored. The illustration of the publication was pre-planned from the beginning. We know that Roivich incorporated earlier pictorial compositions along with the images as a self-witness during the voyage. The large size of the images resulted in them being folded, being folded into the book, which is considered an innovative solution. Water, water colors were added on the images of the German edition. The pre-planned pre imprinting of the images is stated in the introduction as being done with artistic criteria and fidelity. The illustration of the book consists of an impressive frontispiece and images of human types, their alphabets, fantastic and unusual animals, and mainly views of cities as well as the first illustration of the Holy Sepulchre. Impressive, impressive are the seven depictions of cities. Venice, Porridge in today's Croatia, Corfu, Methoni, Kandaka, Raos and Jerusalem, which also include a map of the Holy Land. The 118 degree panoramic view of Venice, measuring 30 by 160 centimeters, is the largest falling, folding image in the book. In this multi page view of Venice, the monuments, the natural na landscape, the activities unfolding in front of the Grand Canal are captured with realism in a gentle scale, describing, portraying the aesthetics of a culturally powerful city. The four views of the Greek cities have various dimensions. Now we'll see this um, very large image uh, on a short video of Venice the folding uh, this uh, uh, the, the panoramic landscape of Venice. Can you see it? The image of Corfu occupies two pages and presents the urban fabric of the city in a coherent way. In Methoni's view, the natural, uh, together with the built landscape, are depicted in a scale of equal perspective. All the elements, like the strip that unfolds between the clouds, are adapted to a single perspective aimed at the immediate pleasure of the eye of the viewer. Scenes of daily movement, battles, customs, constructions tell the truth of the moment. Scenes of the Roma population can be, see, can be seen on the outskirts of the city which Brandenbach describes. The view of the Candia occupies four pages depicting the fabric of the city and the wider geomorphology of the landscape. Residence occupations are 
in a, a schematic form illustrated. The paradox in the depiction of the city is that it is surrounded by sea, giving the impression that it is as an island. The view of roads shows the two ports of the island, where in the left bay, we can see the galleon that transported the pilgrims to the Holy Land, while on the right, a ship being repaired in the port. The main monuments of the roads, of roads, the mills in the ports, the Venetian wall that surrounds the city with its bastions and internal towers are castles and castles are recognized. The following peculiarity can be found in the large image of Palestine. Jerusalem is depicted in the center, while on the right and left are medieval maps of the wider area. Damascus, Tripoli, Jaffa, Sinai, Alexandria, the pyramids of Egypt and finally Mecca can be distinguished. In his view, of Jerusalem, Rovich gives names to buildings and holy monuments with the intention of reinforcing their Christian identity in the area. In summary, because of the detailed and faithful rendering, the images in Brandenburg's work became pictorial standards for later publications, such as for Schedel's Liber Chronicarum 1493. The Finopoulos collection includes 15 loose leaves from the Nuremberg Chronicle in Latin and German in 1493. These 15 sheets contain four pictures of Athens from two different editions, the German and the Latin, both from 1493. The two colored pictures of Athens, Athene Oder Minevra, come from the German edition, the Schedelsche Weltchronik and the Latin Liber Chronicarum, respectively. In all four depictions, Athens is presented with characteristics of a northern, northern German city with Gothic architecture surrounded by medieval walls and the sea. On the hill to the right is the entrance to a castle that seems to refer to the Acropolis. The painted image of Achaia depicts the city built theatrically with its buildings bearing Gothic features. The it is run by a river with a typical composition between the build and natural landscape. The two depictions of Corinth come from the Latin version and reproduce models of a medieval city with walls and rabbards built amphitheatrically. The two depictions of roads are both modeled on the image in Breidenbach's version, which comes from an one on site viewing. In both images, roads is cut off on its right side, while real buildings and monuments of the Venetian rule on the island are recognized. All three images of Constantinople, Istanbul, are from the Latin edition Liber Chronicarum. One occupies two pages, and the second one page is in a smaller size. Here, too, the city is surrounded by medieval walls and bastions, bearing the symbols of the knights, while within the walls, a few temples and monuments can be seen that differ from the usual Gothic architecture. 
Finally, the two images for Thrace and one for Macedonia all come from the Latin version and have identical characteristics to those of the rest. In conclusion, we note that not all the images from the two editions of the Liber Chronicarum German and Latin are the result of an in-person viewing, including several images taken from Breidenbach's book as a model. Finally, in the Finopoulos collection are two rare woodcuts from Guillaume Caussan's work, Psidionis Rodie Urbis Descriptio, published in Ulm in Germany in 1496. The first depicts the claimant to the throne of the Ottoman Empire Prince Jem, or Zizim in French, son of Sultan Mohammed II, the conqueror, seeking refuge from the Mamluk sultans of Cairo. The scene takes place in a reception hall, which is designed by partially applying the standards of perspective, giving a clear composition of the two human groups, emphasizing their origin and the position they hold at the given moment. The second very rare woodcut from Guillaume Caussin's Rodiorum Historia, Ulm 1496, depicts their earthquake that struck the city of Rhodes in 1481, only a few months after the failed siege of the city by Messih Pasha. The earthquake an estimated 7.2 degrees on the Richter scale, was the largest of a series of earthquakes that began in March 1481 and continued until January 1482. It occurred in the early hours of May 3rd, 1481, followed by a tsunami and causing tremendous devastation. Many buildings that had already been damaged by the months long siege collapsed. The woodcut comes from the second chapter entitled the De Terra Motus Labe, Qua Rodi Affecti Sunt. Guillaume Caussin, Vice Chancellor of the Order of the Knights of the Rhodes, recorded as an eyewitness the events of the siege of the city in 1480 and what followed. The description of the siege was only published in the same year in Latin by Ernst Radolt under the title Descriptio Obsidione Rodie with the support of the order and was a great success with multiply reprints in Latin, becoming a European bestseller. On October 24, 1496, the illustrated edition, edition with uh, 36 woodcuts of Carl Sands' work with the general title Rodiorum Historia was published by Johann Reger in Ulm, Germany. It includes a total of 10 chapters with the first Obsidionis Rodie Urbis description. The remaining chapters are historical texts by Caussin, who wrote in the period 1480-1489 and referred to what followed after the siege. In the woodcut, we recognize the realistic depiction of some monuments of roads, which are sketched briefly, with the intention of a descriptive con condensation of the earthquake 
as the primary event. In conclusion, in the particular evidence we have examined, the early depictions of places in Brindenburg's edition are rea realistically captured. Additionally, in Kausen's editions, the, vertic the veridical record serves to revive important historical events. In contrast, in Schedel's editions, both existing built and natural landscapes are rendered in a Gothic architectural style with identical repetitions for different locations. As a conclusion, specimens of early typographical art enrich the composition of itinerant writing. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Xenario, for this uh, captivating presentation that sheds light uh, to uh, urban space uh, of the medieval world. Uh, in the Mediterranean, although sometimes uh, the depiction is not accurate. Um, and we can proceed to Professor Eleni Tunda, uh, professor in Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. Um, uh, yes, but uh, excuse me, first, uh, Ms. Xenario has to stop sharing. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, professor Tunda, um, uh, is a professor of Western medieval history um, of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. And she's going to speak about the, the images of the East in uh, Bertradon de la Broquer's travel narrative. Thank we you have... very much for the introduction and would like also to thank the organizing committee for the invitation to participate in this interesting uh, conference. I have also a PowerPoint uh, to uh, share. Okay. Uh, do you see the full screen presentation? Uh, not yet. I can see it. No, now? Uh, no. Give some time to yes. maybe you must select again the the button button. Okay, I'll do it once more. Now no. No. Okay, once more and maybe if you not I'll Re Maybe you must re-enter, close it, and then uh, start again. Close uh, the PowerPoint. Yes, and then start again. Now? No. But you, should, you can see the PowerPoint presentation. Yes, thank you. Okay, I think I can proceed. And uh, I mean, if you see the presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, in 1432, the French diplomat Bertrandon de la Croquerre undertook a journey to the Middle East and Asia Minor in the service of Duke of Burgundy, Philip III the Good. His mission was to gather intelligence on the political landscape in Muslim territories to aid in the organization of a potential crusade. Throughout his travels, Bertrandon engaged with Muslims, sharing food and shelter, and even adopting a disguise appearing as a Saracen. This paper examines the presentations of the East within Bertrandon's travel narrative, aiming to comprehend how the author constructed the space of the East and knowledge about various ethnocultural communities in the region. 
The objective is to identify shifts in the perception of the Eastern lands and the construction of Muslim otherness during a transitional era marked by Ottoman advances, heightened Western-Eastern political and economic interactions, and the rise of humanism. This period drew on ancient geographic and ethnographic models, fostering new understandings of the known world and conceptualizations of the self and the other. Despite the Ottoman threat to European political entities, particularly following the disastrous defeat of the Franco-Burgundian Knights and the Hungarian army in the Crusade of Nicopolis in 1396, that Hador's journey was framed within a traditional crusade context. This framework, at least implicitly, maintained its objective of liberating Jerusalem, which had been advertised as a pilgrimage since the 12th century with the emergence of the crusading movement. Duke Philip the Good established his duchy as a prominent crusading center, not only advocating crusading politics, but also funding pilgrimages to the Holy Land to, show, hey, to showcase his commitment to the cause and enhance his political standing. Consequently, Bertrandon's travel encompassed a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, a dominant theme in his narrative. His text navigates between a traditional pilgrimage account and a modern travelogue, detailing a journey between cities and producing the space and knowledge of the foreign people encountered during his travels. Berthadon, in his own words, tailored his narrative for noblemen with a desire to explore the world, individuals aspiring to venture to the East and return, as well as for kings and princes contemplating taking the cross. This oscillation equally pertained to representations of space and people. Spatial discourses are rooted in traditional medieval geographical perceptions, particularly in the conceptualization of the known world as a Christian ecumenic. Here, Christianity served as the predominant cultural force transcending geographical boundaries. Within Bertrandon's narrative, terms such as West and East do not appear as mere geographical entities or cardinal points. Instead, the Mediterranean Sea becomes the meaningful reference for geographic orientation. Phrases like on this side of the sea or on the other side of the sea are employed by our traveler to distinguish between his homeland and the eastern regions, underscoring the Mediterranean as a point of contact and conflict between Western and Eastern cultures. Bertrandon's mental framework significantly influences his depiction of the East, presented through the lens of Christian topography. Religious sites and secular structures of the Crusaders, observed by the author, portray the Middle East and Asia Minor as Christian territories conquered by Muslims, reinforcing traditional geographic perspectives. However, a notable shift in this traditional spatial discourse emerges in the perception of Jerusalem. The city ceases to be viewed as the center of the earth or the focal point of Bertrandon's journey. This shift allows for the recognition of multiple political centers and peripheries, familiarizing Westerners with the rise of new political powers in the East and fostering political and trade relations. This special discourse is complemented by the experiences of the people encountered during his travels. Bertrandon interacts with Muslims who have visited Paris, Westerners converted to Islam, Western merchants navigating between the West and the East, Muslims travers traversing the Eastern regions to reach the Balkans and beyond, Muslims fostering amicable relations with Westerners, and Muslims engaged in conflicts within each other. In contrast, the representations of Eastern people, primarily Muslims, align with evolving perceptions of the other, where religious biases give way to ethnographic approaches. 
Descriptions of daily life, attire, food and dwellings are devoid of religious connotations. Although Bertrandon adheres to the traditional medieval view of the Muslim religion as a sect organized by Muhammad, lacking spirituality and characterized by vices like carnality and polygamy, his direct encounter with the Muslim religion is mediated by Venetian priest and the Christian slave converted to Islam. His own criticism surfaces, as we will see later, explicitly within the context of the crusade. However, Bertrandon's ethnographic descriptions are not immune to cultural hierarchies. They contribute to the construction of the Eastern people's otherness through secular material. For instance, Bertrandon emphasizes Muslims' consumption of raw and unrefined food instead of cooked one, which is which is a metonymy of higher culture. The same hierarchy is evident in the descriptions of the feasts held in the Sultan's palace and at the court of the Duke of Austria, both of which Bertrandon attended. According to his descriptions, the feast in the Sultan's palace was characterized by male presence, dining on the floor, sharing common dishware, partaking in simple foods and the singing of Chanson de Zest accompanied by cries reminiscent of horses, as he said. In contrast, the feast at the Austrian court was marked by dining at tables, a variety of spiced dishes, the presence of women and post-dinner dances. This ambiguous image of the Muslim other aligns with Western policies of the era. Muslims were not solely viewed as enemies who had seized Christian lands. They were also seen as indispensable trade partners. The Western perspective acknowledged their dominance over trade routes and markets, making them a significant presence that could not be easily ignored. This ambiguity impacted the traditional crusading idea. While traversing Asia Minor, Bertrandon approached Muslims with sympathy and refrained from articulating any explicit crusading discourse. However, his stance underwent a radical transformation upon reaching the Balkan Peninsula, particularly in Sofia, where he witnessed Ottoman soldiers returning from raid expeditions in the Kingdom of Hungary. It was only at this point that Bertrandon juxtaposed Christianitas with the Muslim gangs, expressing lament over the perceived subordination of the superior Christians to what he considered an inferior tribe. This shift underscores the transformation of the traditional crusading idea, redirecting its focus from Jerusalem to the defense of European political entities. Despite Duke Philip the Good's continued rhetoric about Jerusalem, Bertrandon's Carib peak after his return um, in the Duchy suggests that even the Duke embraced this new perspective. The reconceptualization of Western Ottoman relations also influences Western perceptions of the Byzantines portrayed overtly hostile in the narrative. From the mid 14th century onward, Excuse me, Professor Tunda, um, we cannot see um, uh, the next um, uh, slide. We're stuck in the first one. Uh, it's a pity. Well, maybe I have to, to stop there and then try again. I will open. Excuse me. Excuse mm -hmm. me. Excuse me. I don't know what happened. It's the first time that something like that happens to me. Okay, now you can see the PowerPoint. Can yeah. you see the full screen? No. But now? No, no, no. But 
Can you see the next uh, slide? No, you must choose it from the... I, I, I have already chosen it. No. 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 I, I cannot understand what uh, what happens. And for, uh, I'm sorry, I'm really very sorry. Um, you must open it. Um, I have a message from uh, uh, Mrs. Corre. Uh, you must open it before you present it. Maybe that's the solution. I open uh, the PowerPoint. You must open the PowerPoint on your screen and then uh, share the screen. Yes, this is what I I, I did twice. Um, in presentation form. Maybe. Uh, okay, let's try in presentation. I cannot uh, uh, open it in presentation form because I then I I I do not I don't see the Zoom uh, button. I have to escape. Uh, you can uh, reduce the size, maybe a little bit, in order to see the the button for for the zoom. First, open it and then reduce the size manually. Yes, minimize it first. Open the minimize how? I mean, I. I... And then I, now I have the full. I, I I see the full screen presentation. I have to escape. Okay. Uh, in order to see the the button, you can minimize it from the top. You have three options on the top: minimize it, maximize it, and close it. On the top of your screen of the of the archive, this this of of the PowerPoint. There is um. Yes, there is a button uh, with um, with a sign. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, but when no, it uh, um no, when I have the full screen, I cannot see any. When I have full screen, I have full screen. I mean, I just see my PowerPoint in my screen, and nothing else. So uh, then you can open it in uh, PowerPoint in presentation form. Yes, but you cannot see uh, the slides. Okay, I'll try once more. Oh, yes. Okay, now you can see the presentation. Yes. But not the full screen. Okay, let's see the second one. Can you see the full screen now? No. No, okay. We can see. Uh, you can see. You can see the full screen. Not the full screen, but we okay, can. But you can see the uh, the presentation. Okay. Can you see now uh, uh, the the next slide? Yes. 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 Okay. This was the second uh, slide when I was uh, um, when I, uh, I referred to uh, to Bertrand's travel uh, narrative, which oscillates between a traditional pilgrimage account and a detailed uh, travel log, and you can see in the map his itinerary. Uh, the next uh, slide, con uh, slide concerned what I said about his special discourses, uh, which um, are uh, uh, rooted in traditional geographic descriptions. And the only um, difference was uh, the shift, uh, the change in the, his um, reimagination of uh, Jerusalem, who, which is no more the center of the earth or the focus of his travel. And uh, this is a slide concerning the image of the Muslims and um, the transformation of the crusade uh, idea. And now I will return to the negative image of the Byzantines. You can see this, the slide. Yes, yes. Okay. So the reconceptualization of Western Ottoman relations also influences Western perceptions of the Byzantines portrayed overtly hostile in the narrative. From the mid 14th century onward, the Byzantine Empire had heightened its interactions with Western powers, 
actively seeking crusade assistance to safeguard its territories from the looming threat of the Ottoman invasions. This diplomatic outreach aimed to garner support for the defense of Byzantine lands against the encroaching Ottoman forces, a move that, if successful, could have introduced complexities into the Eastern policies of Western political states. It is not worthy that Bertrandon maintained his perspective on the Byzantines even when he consolidated his notes into a cohesive narrative in 1439. Contrary to a change of opinion, he referenced the Council of Ferrara, Florence, held in 1438, asserting that the Byzantines had consented to the Church Union, not out of genuine allegiance to the Roman Church, but due to their economic hardship. Before concluding, I would like to briefly examine a crucial aspect of Bertrandon's journey, his disguise as a Muslim, as a Saracen, as he said. This decision raises questions about its functionality. With the assistance of Western merchants, Bertrandon successfully integrated into a caravan returning from Mecca to Bursa. This strategic move allowed him to traverse Asia Minor safely. Notably, it was the leader of the caravan who insisted that Bertrandon adopt a disguise and present himself as a Muslim. However, Bertrandon's real identity was known to his Muslim co-travelers who maintained friendly relations with him. They not only taught him the basic vocabulary of the Turkish language, but also requested him to provide them with wine. Furthermore, they played a crucial role in shielding him from Muslims who quickly discerned his true identity, posing a threat to his life and belongings. In separate encounters on the road, other Muslims who recognized him invited him to a public bathhouse where they listened as he recited the Pater Noster. A lingering question pertains to Bertrandon's decision to persist in his disguised identity after departing from the caravan and reaching Constantinople, extending his pretense at least, at least up to Vienna. Additionally, his choice to present himself dressed as a Saracen at the Burgundian court before the Duke as you can see in this illumination, raises further inquiries into the motivations and functionality of his continued masquerade. In my view, Bertrandon's disguise while traveling in the East serves as a portrayal of his status as a foreigner in, a form, in former Christian lands. This emphasizes the perceived loss of these territories, marking a decline in Christian culture and Western political influence. Additionally, it underscores that the terrain he traversed was not only hazardous, but also largely unexplored, as Christians typically avoided such journeys through the mainland, opting for safer sea routes. Moreover, numerous passages in the text suggest that the disguise provided Bertrandon with access to both public and private spaces that would have otherwise been inaccessible. This granted his narrative a sense of authority. His intention to invest his discourses on the East and Muslims with credibility becomes evident through his deliberate choice to present himself before the Duke in the guise of a Muslim. This guise also plays a crucial role in shaping identities and otherness, offering an interpretation of international political relations that significantly influences the formulation of crusade policies. An Armenian recognizing Bertrandon's disguised identity provided assistance and information, thus portraying the Armenian people as allies to Western forces. Conversely, Bertrandon's use of disguise revealed the unreliability, particularly of the Byzantines, but also of other Balkan people. At a border checkpoint in the Taurus Mountains, a Greek-speaking tax collector detected Bertrandon's true identity and attempted to prevent his passage to the other side. Near the city of Bursa, a Bulgarian convert to Islam recognized Bertrandon 
and accused the caravan leader of providing him protection. When Bertradon was on the verge of crossing the Golden Horn to reach Constantinople, Byzantines initially mistook him for an Ottoman and treated him respectfully. However, upon realizing his true identity, they demanded more money and threatened physical harm, revealing, as Bertradon says, their disdain for Latin Christians. In Buddha, the Count of Hungary warmly welcomed him, assuming he was an Ottoman, but became unfriendly once Bertradon revealed the truth. In Vienna, the first real Christian space visited by Bertradon, he struggled to find lodging as everyone believed he was an Ottoman. To conclude, Bertradon's worldview was significantly shaped by traditional medieval geographical perceptions. Throughout his travels, he crafts an image of a Christian East that has irreversibly succumbed to Muslim forces. While the ethnographic descriptions and positive images of the latter do not erase cultural differences or undermine the sense of Western superiority, they reveal a concerted effort by Westerners to engage in negotiation with the new conquerors of the East rather than opting for outright warfare. This shift in perspective is particularly evident in the reimagining of Jerusalem. Bertradon stands towards the Ottomans and the Mamluks, influences his understanding of the Crusade idea. It appears to be more concerned with the defense of European territories than the traditional goal of conquering the Holy Lands. His use of disguise, convincing readers of the fortness of the former Christian lands, imparts authority to his narrative, contributing to the construction of space and knowledge about the Eastern people. Furthermore, this disguise becomes a significant tool for interpreting and consequently shaping political relations and alliances. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh... Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tunda, uh, for this enchanting uh, presentation. And uh, the issue of perception of the other, uh, which is a main structural uh, element in travel narratives, was presented in a very accurate way. Um, and now I think we can proceed uh, in questions. Uh, is there any question for um, Professor Apostolou, the first presentation of this session? Any speaker or any participant? No. Um, so, um, any question for um, Mr. Siametis? Um, okay, there is uh, one question from here from uh, um, Mr. Papas, a bursier of the Instituto Helenico. And he's going to ask his question to Mr. Siametis. Please, Mr. Papas. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Mr. Siametis, for your presentation. It was very interesting. And I have uh, one question. Uh, my question is... Very clear. I don't know why. Can you repeat, please? Yes, uh, my question is... Uh, had this uh, explorer uh, depict these uh, uh, events uh, or superstitions uh, in drawing form, except uh, from uh, written? We have only these portraits, uh, portraits of the figures that I showed you at the beginning, nothing else. So we don't have it, uh, uh, no, so nothing else. Okay, okay, that was my question. Thank you very much. But uh, in so many pages, you can find more information. I gave only some examples. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so there is no any apotropic symbol? No, we don't have. Oh, we don't have. Okay. Thank you very much. Someone else, maybe? Yes. Uh, someone raised the hand. Um, yes, Mr. Kanvula. Yes. 
regarding to the uh, cities, uh, especially Tonta, Mrs. Tonta, and uh, if, sorry for my pronunciation, but Zenario, uh, we always mention that uh, it is Gothic city, but uh, extra moral, there is always a timber structure in front of the, say, castle. Uh, I recognize it is like, like a pattern since those period was Ottoman period, maybe not intramural, but extramural, there were be some uh, earliest or pioneers of typical Ottoman houses. Please examine that. I'm not expecting an answer right now, but uh, there is another tendency in this say uh, uh, housing. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your um uh, for this uh, of uh, that this new uh, information that you that you offer, um, someone else for Mr. Siametti's presentation. So we proceed to our next present presenter, uh, Mrs. Xenariu. Any question? Or for Professor Tunda. Well, no questions. So um, I would like to thank you all uh, for your participation. And um, our next session will be held at uh, um, five o'clock in the afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Go, man.
this woman is supposed to be speaking.
Maybe we have to close YouTube. It's live on YouTube. Can yep. you hear it on YouTube? I have no idea. I mean, how can you have Zoom and, and YouTube at the same time? Yeah, no, the microphone is working. See, it's on. What are these things? Wait a minute, go down, allow desktop. Yeah, what's on? I said something about allow desktop. Nora, if it was currently in use. Okay, if it, if it can't be this, I just checked.
c'est quelque chose de... Quelle vidéo Quelle vidéo Qu'est-ce que tu me Στην γλωσσό τη Κρήτη, όπω μα λέει το κοντιμογραφικό σημείο, Southern Italy and the whole Egyptian and Syro Palestinian Arab. Thank you very much. Good evening. Hello, dear participants of this session. This is the fifth, I think, where it is this, the sixth session. So travelers in their narratives on build the space. So we'll start uh, for, with uh, Nathalie Boulou, which is a um, maîtresse de conférence à l'Université de Tours. And she will present uh, la description de l'espace grec dans la géographie de Sebastiano Company. Then the questions will be at the end of the session, please. So check out your uh, microphones so we can uh, uh, not disturb the uh, person who will speak. So, uh, Madame Nathalie Boulou, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Thank uh, you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Alors, je remercie d'abord les organisateurs de m'avoir euh, invité, d'avoir accepté une intervention en français, dont le cœur n'est pas tout à fait le voyage de l'Orient, dans l'Orient byzantin et ottoman, mais ce que l'on peut euh, tirer de la description de l'espace grec, de la géographie de Sebastiano Compagnie. Donc, comment euh, penser l'espace Alors, je vais essayer de partager mon écran. Euh... Oui, s'il vous plaît, c'est possible de vous voir sur l'écran. Voilà, voit... alors, hein? parfait. Okay. Normalement, vous, vous le voyez. Pour l'instant, oui, ça va très bien. Et je vais... Ah, une... Voilà, est-ce que vous avez le... Ah, moi, oui, parfaitement. J'espère oh. que les participants, eux aussi, peuvent vous suivre. Bon, je suppose. Alors... Euh... Sebastiano Compagnie. Alors, donc, mon titre, pardon, c'est la description de l'espace grec dans la géographie de euh, Sebastiano euh, Compagnie. Alors, Sebastiano Compagnie est l'auteur d'une vaste description du monde, la géographie, actuellement conservée dans trois manuscrits et dont un seul est complet, et qui est le Vaticanus Latinus 3844 que vous avez sous les yeux. Et la copie en a été achevée le 13 juin 1509. Cette géographie n'a guère retenu l'attention des chercheurs alors qu'elle est importante. Son auteur, Je, euh, Sebastiano euh, Campani, est d'origine ferraraise et il est le neveu du cartographe vénitien Antonio Leonardi, mort après 1490, actif à Venise et à Rome entre 1461 et 1483, célébré par ses contemporains mais dont aucune carte n'est parvenue jusqu'à nous. Sebastiano Compagni a collaboré avec son oncle à la carte de l'Italie qui, qui ornait le palais public de Venise. Il dit également être l'auteur d'une map monde commandée par le cardinal Marco Barbo pour le Palazzo di Venezia à Rome avant 1490. Il est également mentionné comme Sebastianus Leonardus Cosmographus, dans l'auditoire réuni en 1508 pour écouter le commentaire sur le livre 5 des éléments d'Euclide, prononcé par Luca Pacioli dans l'église San Bortolomio. Il est cité en première place après les ecclésiastiques, ce qui suggère qu'il avait acquis la considération de ses pères pour ses talents de cosmographe. L'activité de Sebastiano Compagni prend place dans le milieu culturel des humanistes vénitiens à la charnière du XVe et du XVIe siècle. En outre, ses travaux se situent dans la continuité de ceux des humanistes du XVe siècle. 
la connaissance de l'espace antique, indispensable à l'intelligence de la culture des anciens, constitue l'assise épistémologique qui permet de penser l'espace moderne. Et cette géographie se caractérise par un va-et-vient constant entre espace antique et espace moderne. L'intérêt passionné des humanistes italiens du XVe siècle pour l'espace a donné naissance à de nombreux travaux originaux, selon deux axes essentiels, une géographie des lieux ou histoire des lieux, souvent désignée par les spécialistes comme antiquaires, à la suite de l'Italia Illustrata de Biondo Flavio, des descriptions appliquées à de plus vastes espaces, conçues comme la matrice de l'histoire, dont le modèle est constitué par le D Europa et le D Asia du pape Pi II. La géographie de Sebastiano Compagni s'inscrit dans cet héritage, tout en se singularisant par le projet de décrire l'ensemble du monde connu sous la forme d'un traité autonome, autrement dit, de faire véritablement œuvre de géographe, à l'égal des anciens. Ces deux traits en font un observatoire particulièrement adapté à l'étude de la représentation de la Grèce dans la géographie humaniste. Sa description du monde est une vaste synthèse réalisée sur le modèle de la géographie de Ptolémée. Il n'y a là rien d'original, Ptolémée étant le euh, géographe majeur de cette fin du XVe siècle. Il importe cependant de noter que Sebastiano Compagni ne s'intéresse pas du tout à la représentation de l'espace par des coordonnées géographiques. Il fait une sorte de Ptolémée strabonisé et représente en fait le triomphe de la géographie descriptive. Pour cela, il reprend le découpage en province de Ptolémée et une part non négligeable de ses toponymes. Il complète cette trame par des données qui sont fournies par les auteurs antiques, Pline, Pomponius, Mela, Solin, Strabon, enrichis des connaissances accumulées tout au long du Moyen-Âge. Il a aussi régulièrement recours à des cartes marines. Son caractère antique et fortement humaniste explique que sa géographie soit orientée essentiellement vers la description de l'Europe, qui fait partie des trois parties en fait, de l'Ecumène, l'Europe, Afrique, Asie. Et l'Europe, notamment l'Italie et la Grèce, représentent les deux tiers de l'ouvrage. Ce qui permet donc d'analyser la conception de la Grèce d'un géographe humaniste qui compose une description du monde essentiellement à partir de ce qui lit chez les, géogra les géographes et les historiens antiques en l'adaptant aux interrogations de son temps. Je vais donc euh, suivre le plan, enfin traiter cette question autour de trois aspects. Comment définir la Grèce Comment décrire la Grèce Existe-t-il une idée de l'espace grec Alors, pour commencer, donc, définir la Grèce. D'un point de vue de géographie descriptive, qu'est-ce que la Grèce pour Sebastiano Compagni La question est loin d'être évidente, car il y a en quelque sorte plusieurs Grèces qui se juxtaposent dans la succession des temps. La Grèce antique, d'une part, la Grèce des derniers siècles du Moyen-Âge, c'est-à-dire l'Empire byzantin, qui, à part, qui au XVe siècle s'est restreint euh, progressivement et disparaît en 1453 et puis n'existe plus du tout au moment où écrit Sebastiano Compagni. À son époque, donc, le monde grec a disparu, remplacé par l'Empire ottoman. Oui. Alors, en tant que, euh, alors, il n'affronte pas ces difficultés euh, parce qu'il va suivre en fait le découpage euh, de l'espace euh, tel qu'il est défini par Ptolémée. Et ce que vous voyez sur euh, l'écran, c'est euh, l'ordre des provinces qui est suivi par la géographie de Ptolémée, qui se trouve euh, ici. Là, voilà, hein, donc la, la neuvième table de l'Europe, la dixième table de l'Europe et les régions qui constituent, ce qui, ce qui représente en fait l'essentiel de la Grèce. Et on voit que euh, Compagnie suit exactement l'ordre 
de Ptolémée. Ce qui donne aussi euh, cette, euh, ces trois cartes, hein, il va se servir de ces trois tables de Ptolémée où on voit que, où se trouve en fait l'espace grec, c'est-à-dire que essentiellement ici, la trace et la chersonèse avec con, euh, Constantinople, donc là c'est la table 9, sur ici c'est la péninsule euh, grecque avec la Crète et les îles de la mer Égée, et puis là, c'est euh, la représentation de l'Asie mineure, dont on va voir qu'elle tient une place un peu euh, particulière. Et on voit donc en fait que euh, cet euh, espace grec est dans la géographie, celle de Ptolémée, mais aussi celle de Sepastiano euh, complé euh, Compagnie, complètement éclatée entre l'Europe qui euh, est l'Asie, avec au milieu de la description de l'Europe et de l'Asie, eh bien euh, l'Afrique. Cette organisation du monde ne, correspondait, ne correspond pas aux réalités contemporaines et ne permet pas de définir clairement ce que pourrait être un espace grec, qui n'a d'ailleurs pas d'existence politique ni de, ni de réalité. En, euh, et et, et l'espace grec antique n'a pas plus de réalité. On pourrait dire, en forçant le trait, que la Grèce n'existe pas, notamment parce que le terme n'apparaît à aucun, à aucun moment dans le titre des provinces. Et pourtant, évidemment, la Grèce est partout dans la description de ces régions. Dans la trace, pour la trace, pardon, il note que cette région a été appelée Grèce par les, appelée Grèce, pardon, par les modernes et est aujourd'hui désignée comme la Turquie. Évidemment, le terme Grèce ici, ce sont les Byzantins. Et d'ailleurs, Constantinople est logiquement dé décrite en trace. La trace et la Macédoine sont-elles habitées par des Grecs, hein, des Graecis Gentibus La Thessalie était régie autrefois par un roi Graecus qui donna son nom à la Grèce. Ça, c'est un extrait de Pline. Et dans le, dans le Péloponnèse, il emploie l'expression de Graeca nation. Donc, le terme de Grèce et celui des Grecs est clairement associé à ces régions. À ces régions. Deuxième point important, dans l'économie générale des œuvres, la part dédiée à l'Italie et à la Grèce est massive. C'est que le monde méditerranéen est conçu comme le cœur de la civilisation. Le monde méditerranéen européen, je précise, est conçu comme le cœur de la civilisation qui, pour les humanistes, est obligatoirement le monde antique, qui a fourni les textes, les arts, un modèle à suivre. Et dans le monde décrit par Sebastiano Compagni, il existe en fait deux types d'espaces qui s'opposent. Ceux qui sont bien connus par les textes géographiques antiques et qui, de ce fait, sont illustres et chargés de la gloire des anciens, et ceux qui sont extérieurs, périphériques au monde de la civilisation gréco-latine, et plus on s'éloigne du cœur, plus les toponymes qui y sont rattachés sont qualifiés de barbares. Et entre les deux, il existe évidemment une variété dans la gradation de la barbarie. Quoi qu'il en soit, les régions qui nous occupent ici sont sans aucun doute sont dans le cœur du monde antique. Celui donc qui a vu se développer la civilisation antique qui fascine les humanistes. Et cela se traduit par l'éloge appuyé qui est fait de certaines de ces régions. En particulier l'Achaïe, qui est véritablement le cœur de la Grèce pour Sebastiano Compagni. Elle a été la plus célèbre des régions, elle a été renommée par sa gloire, ses savoirs, ses arts, son art de faire la guerre. Et même si elle n'est qu'un petit espace de l'Europe, elle a, à un moment de son histoire, étendu son, sa domination sur le Péloponnèse, la Macédoine et sur les îles de la mer Égée. C'est le cœur de la Grèce, évidemment, parce que c'est le cœur de la Grèce ancienne. La Macédoine, voilà comment il l'introduit, cette partie de la terre se signale par des lieux au nom illustre et ne compte presque rien qui ne soit célèbre. Certaines villes aussi peuvent être illustres, par exemple Argos dans le Péloponnèse, qui est Siliané, dans l'une des villes les plus anciennes de la Grèce. Deuxième point donc, décrire la Grèce. 
Le principe de la description est le même que dans le reste de l'œuvre. À ceci près qu'il a véritablement rassemblé une masse de données et, et que son travail est assez impressionnant. Du point de vue de la composition stylistique, c'est une sorte de marqueterie très urédite où se mêlent espace ancien et espace moderne. Et sa description est en fait élaborée à partir de l'association de sources écrites et de sources cartographiques, selon un ordre descriptif systématique. Il commence par délimiter la région par ses confronts, c'est-à-dire la région ptoléméenne et puis les sous-régions à l'intérieur de, de la table 9, de la table 10. Chaque région commence par une étude de l'étymologie et des divers noms par lesquels elle est désignée, parce que les noms varient entre les différents temps que recouvre sa géographie. Puis, la description géographique commence, qui adopte un ordre systématique, d'abord le littoral, puis l'intérieur des terres. Et là, il se fonde sur les, les cartes. La structure de la, dé, de la description est donnée par la lecture de la carte ptoloméenne de chaque région, qui reprend l'ordre spatial, il reprend l'ordre spatial des toponymes, et à certains de ces noms, parce qu'ils sont illustres, il va ajouter un certain nombre de données, et c'est en cela que l'on peut dire qu'il fait une histoire des lieux. Et cette histoire des lieux euh, rattache donc à un lieu des faits historiques qui peuvent être d'histoire antique ou d'histoire moderne, des, de la fable, des éléments de, donc fabuleux, la mythologie, l'histoire naturelle et puis la culture et parfois les mentions d'inscription. Il fait donc une sorte de géographie culturelle, le lieu étant ce qui fait le lien entre le passé et le moderne. Et puis, bien sûr, il faut signaler, pour l'espace qui nous intéresse, des sources modernes, notamment pour les îles Cristoforo Buondelmonti et euh, Pi 2, bien sûr, aussi, hein, qu'il le cite euh, aussi souvent qu'il le peut. Il, il conduit donc une description très précise, très dense, très longue, et il faut bien le reconnaître, assez euh, fastidieuse. Est-ce que de cette description se dégage une certaines idées de la Grèce, une identité grecque, un ensemble de données ou de procédés qui illustreraient une idée culturelle de la Grèce et qui ferait de cet espace un espace particulier. Si je pose cette question, c'est en raison du modèle que constitue pour les géographes humanistes l'Italia Illustrata de Biondo. L'Italia Illustrata n'a d'autre but que d'illustrer la gloire passée et moderne de la péninsule en construisant une histoire des lieux illustre et en montrant que l'Italie moderne est la légitime héritière et légale de l'Italie antique. On sait par ailleurs qu'un humaniste comme Conrad Celtis avait pour projet de donner une Germania Illustrata. Qu'en est-il de la Grèce la première réponse est que pour l'Italie, la densité des références antiques est remarquable, notamment les faits historiques rattachés au monde grec, qui sont tous d'ailleurs déjà connus à travers les auteurs latins. Se détache ainsi la figure d'Alexandre et de la Macédoine, d'où est partie la domination des autres mondes jusqu'en Inde, les luttes aussi entre les Grecs et les Perses. Et à cet égard, il faut signaler l'Asie mineure, qui se trouve donc rejetée dans la partie de l'Asie, qui est décrite exactement sur le même procédé que je viens de, de, de décrire et qui se signale aussi par la masse des souvenirs de l'histoire grecque antique. La victoire d'Alexandre, le lieu où il, se bat, où il bat Darius, le pont construit par Xerxès pour envahir la Grèce, les Pergame dont il signale qu'il existe encore des ruines, et puis quelques éléments liés à l'histoire de Troie, mais relativement rares. Mais surtout, ce qui se détache, c'est que cet euh, espace illustre est le lieu de la confronta confrontation entre les Ottomans, qui, euh, euh, pardon, de la confrontation avec les Ottomans qui l'ont ravagé. Et la mention de la présence turque est fréquente. Il est toujours sur le ton d'une la, lamentation constante, car les Turcs ont véritablement ruiné ces régions. 
et c'est un trait caractéristique que l'on trouve déjà dans l'insulaire de Bandemanti et qui remonte même au traité, au traité de l'état de la Terre Sainte et au pèlerinage en Terre Sainte. Et Sebastiano euh, euh, Company fait exactement euh, la même chose. Et par exemple, euh, à, à propos de Calchis, donc euh, la capitale de l'île de Bé, Négrépon, hein, sous la domination vénitienne, mais il lui donne le nom antique, euh, elle a été prise par les Turcs en 1470, lors d'une guerre contre Venise, et elle a été le lieu d'un massacre terrible qui a marqué les esprits. Et Sebastiano rappelle l'épisode, toujours sur le ton de la lamentation. Et on pourrait multiplier les exemples. De là découle l'idée que la Grèce moderne n'est pas, en tous les cas, n'est plus, en raison de l'action des Turcs, une terre prospère, une terre d'art et de culture. Si on reprend l'exemple de Calchis, il est immédiatement suivi par un autre exemple, qui est cette fois euh, pris dans les histoires euh, antiques. Il s'agit de la ville d'Érétrie, autre ville importante de l'Obé, grecque, protégée par une enceinte construite par les Athéniens et détruite par les Perses. Et la comparaison est évidemment significative. Elle file le parallèle entre la situation moderne et la situation dans l'Antiquité. L'origine de cette identification, qui a évidemment une charge symbolique importante, vient d'une célèbre chanson de Pétrarque dans le chansonnier, la, le, la 128, dans laquelle il exalte la croisade décidée en 1336 par Philippe VI de Valois et jamais accomplie. Pétrarque oppose dans ce poème l'espace de euh, l'Europe tout entière, là pas seulement la Grèce évidemment, à celui de l'Asie et de la menace turque. Et il met en scène pour la première fois une version moderne de l'ancien conflit entre l'Europe et l'Asie, entre les Grecs et la Perse entre la civilisation et la barbarie. Et ce thème est évidemment repris dans un ouvrage bien plus proche de Sebastiano Compagni, le De Europa de Pi II, et les régions de la Grèce qu'il décrit, d'ailleurs assez rapidement, sont comme l'Europe centrale, essentiellement le lieu de l'affrontement entre les Latins et l'Europe, autrement dit pour lui, puisque l'Europe est identifiée comme modèle culturel et caractérisé par le christianisme, entre l'Europe, l'Asie, le christianisme et euh, les musulmans. Cependant, chez Sebastiano Compagni, qui défend, euh, ce, la visite, pardon, qui défend l'Europe et la civilisation, c'est Venise, dans laquelle il travaille, Venise, qu'il sait. Et lorsqu'il signale la présence des Turcs, c'est toujours en relation avec Venise. Pour conclure, la euh, géographie de Sebastiano Compagni est donc un mélange d'antique et de moderne, de noms de lieux antiques et de noms de lieux modernes, d'histoire ancienne et d'histoire moderne. Et dans cette partie du monde, nous sommes bien dans le cœur de la culture méditerranéenne, où les noms sont illustres. Alors qu'ailleurs, plus on s'éloigne du cœur de la Méditerranée, plus ils sont barbares. La Grèce ancienne fait donc incontestablement partie d'une culture antique vivante, mais encore essentiellement connue par le biais des auteurs latins. Et évidemment, cet espace est un, le lieu de conflit où se rejoue l'antique opposition entre Grèce et Perse, qui est maintenant celle de Venise contre les Ottomans. Et ce qui se dégage, c'est la, la conscience de l'importance de cet espace grec autrefois, mais d'une manière extrêmement différente que pour l'Italie. Ainsi, depuis Buondo, l'idée d'Italie reflète, enfin, dans l'idée de l'Italie, c'est que l'idée de l'Italie moderne vaut bien l'Italie antique. La Grèce moderne, sous la coupe de la Turquie autonome, détruite et dévastée, n'a pas grand-chose à, à offrir de ce point de vue, et il n'y a donc pas de Graecia illustrata possible. Merci. Bon, ben, merci beaucoup pour cette, ce voyage encore une fois à travers les cartes de la, avec la géographie plutôt de la compagnie Sébastien plongée n'est-ce pas dans ce milieu qui est la suite des de Ptolémées des idées 
d'une Grèce qui n'est plus la Grèce et que c'est surtout des Grecs et bah, définir ou décrire cet espace et ce monde qui est, qui est rien d'autre entre le, la suite, n'est-ce pas, de ce monde des Grecs d'autrefois, dans le monde chrétien d'Occident, surtout en Vénice ou en Italie, contre bien sûr le monde des barbares ou le monde musulman euh, en Asie. Merci beaucoup pour cette euh, présentation et je crois qu'on doit passer à la deuxième. Merci beaucoup aussi à respecter le temps de votre, à votre présentation. So now we pass on uh, Mr. Ibrahim Kanbulat, he who is an independent researcher and he will speak about the conceptual setup of Byzantine house from travelogues and its adoption by Ottomans. So Mr. Ibrahim Can Bulat, San Bulat, Can Bulat, eh? Jan, Jan Bulat. Eh? Yes, are you here? So we'll the speak. microphone is closed. So, oh. will excuse us for a moment, please, so we can reach. Can you open your microphone, please, Mr. Chambulat Ibrahim, so we can hear you? Okay. I think that uh, I, we... I, I can see my screen. I mean, share screen. Yeah. No, for the moment, no. The moment, yes. I'm. Right now, you can't see. No, for the moment. Unfortunately, I'm not. Neither your screen, neither your share screen, neither neither you. And hear me right now. I understand. I say to share my screen, but share my screen. Right now. Excellent. I get right now. Thank you very much. We are here. Huh? Okay. So we see your. Uh, Presentation, yes, yeah. the PDF probably, or your uh, slides. Yes, first slide. But I would like to say that uh, the name title has been changed a little bit. Afterwards, I'd like to discuss with my editor, maybe turning to the original. Uh, after listening to me, you will understand that I'm not basing on one a traveler or a group of travelers, but the main line, I mean, structure is the house especially the timber house. Now I'll start, emerging of Chardak house, I will come to that matter, but it will be the same, I, I, I mean, uh, important point of my presentation is Chardak house. I will explain what it is. Uh, originally, wood and earth uh, as partners came to the humans, say a habitation uh, about 2000 years BC. And then uh, they start using bushes and put some plaster, clay plasters. Uh, on the left uh, bottom uh, corner, you will see that some ceramics, after a fire, uh, they turn to a ceramic and then can, we can see the uh, traces of branches on, say, a ceramized, a ceramized uh, mud. And uh, it was the earliest finding for me, maybe in uh, my, uh, say, if listeners, the other say uh, professionalists or academicians uh, may know earlier uh, example, but Lipnar Neolithic settlement excavation was very much important. Mr. Rothenberg of Leiden University discovered, uh, uh, say, uh, the earliest Neolithic settlement in, in Lipnar. Lipnar is between uh, Iznik Lake and Gemnik uh, Bay. 
uh, and I personally visited, but it was finished and then afterwards it was earthed. But uh, Mr. Rotenberg uh, was kind to share the drawings with me. This is the earliest known set Neolithic settlement using a timber frame. Uh, on left side, you will see that say piles uh, dug into say mud, and then uh, you will see you can understand that you will see that it's a, a type of uh, say frame uh, on a, a piles. There is say a roof beams. As well as I would like to show you that uh, on the left side, you will see the say uh, 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 woven uh, say branches. It will uh, anyhow the original, the, the earliest sample of a uh, say again another uh, uh, branch and plaster uh, say uh, using. It is about six thousand to five hundred. 5,400 BC, and a very similar settlement is discovered recently. A, maybe you know that a, in Istanbul there was a say under a, a Bosporus a tunnel, and then there was a say a excavation, but afterwards they discovered Theodosius port. A, a close to the other support in the surrounding, they discovered another a Neolithic settlement, almost similar. A, on a, the bottom, you will see my sources, but I can provide you with say. Can you hear me? Sorry. I think. Can that... I go? Yes, of course. You can continue. Thank oh, you. Okay. And then, a, 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 it is I mean, archaeologists start discovering. Uh, this is Nauman's book from Nauman's book. Uh, how the uh, wooden or timber elements were used in in, in stone masonry or clay masonry, but mainly these drawings are uh, stone masonry. Normally, archaeologists uh, uh, try to find out what is missing. Uh, you will see the traces of a uh, tie beams. Uh, very elementary, uh, you know, from where those drawings are made, uh, it is 6,000 uh, BC to uh, 1,800 BC from various places. But uh, in, in, in the continuation on a right bottom, you will see a typical uh, half number structure. Uh, at say horizontal beam and some uh, upright or pillars filled with a uh, stone masonry rubble. But this was a uh, known one of the earliest frame uh, infilled with uh, masonry. Now uh, coming back to a uh, Grosso's palace uh, about uh, about uh, 1800, 1100, uh, it, 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 it was uh, it, 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 that some usage of wooden frame, are discovered, but these are very simple, very primitive, uh, say, uh, frames. Uh, this can be seen. For example, I will come back, uh, come to uh, diagonal elements. Uh, don't be confused with the say uh, stairs. It is actually not a structural di diagonal element, uh, but uh, this is very, a very well known uh, sample. It is a say just a say, a, a, say a mock up or uh, uh, just say a uh, uh, restitution, uh, it was uh, very much discussed that Herculanum uh, from the first century, opus craticum structure, but uh, the, the diagonals were missing. And uh, this uh, conference, but especially for Ottoman house, uh, were presented by me at uh, Shatis. Shatis is a say, group of uh, professionals and academicians. Every after two years, we came uh, to, uh, come together. And uh, I asked, uh, at the same time, I was listening to uh, Mrs. Salachi. Uh, she was uh, explaining, explaining especially Herculanum, uh, say, area, I asked her whether they discovered some diagonals or not, and she were very kind to share a photo with me. On left bottom corner, uh, uh, you will see that diagonals uh, after the excavation in uh, Herculanum. Therefore, we know that maybe this might be the 
real beginning or say earliest example of typical wooden frame, but don't be, don't be confused with this say restitution mock-up. And uh, wooden structures are also seen various places. For example, the Trian uh, Trian column in Rome, and then uh, in uh, one hundred thirteen. Uh, this is this a uh, wooden structure. Uh, are it say it presented it after after the it say operation in in Edacia. and we know that also this is also used diagonal elements wooden structure as well in uh, say uh, Romania or that, that the Edacia area, and then this is from a uh, Cartagena. Uh, Actually, it is known that uh, known that uh, surrounding of Mediterranean Sea, uh, there are uh, in many places wooden, uh, say, frames or wooden structural systems, uh, and then this is another example. Right. Also, I, I could find okay. that in an example uh, from sixth century, another example in Butrint in uh, Albania, and then. Uh, 12th century a farmhouse <clears throat> in Armatova, <clears throat> Holopinis, and then a, a med medieval a settlement in Serbia, Bronicheva. Uh, there is also from 11th to 12th century. Therefore, everywhere, especially in Anatolia and Balkan, a little bit in, say, uh, of course, Mediterranean, Northern Africa, we can see wooden structures. Uh, would, uh, I will come to, I mean, a uh, main, uh, say, a uh, point that I will say, uh, say that I, I'm using the uh, reports of archaeological ex uh, excavations, of course, history, but uh, especially tra uh, tra travel writing is very much Im important to uh, uh, complete the missing links. In Fort Crusaders, you, you, you know that Istanbul had, a, or Constantinopolis had a very terrible, uh, say, uh, attack. Uh, and then uh, they put fire. And then it, 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 they happened uh, three times. Big fire destroyed a big part of the city. And then uh, Billy Hardon uh, explains this. Uh, I'm sure that you know this. I will not write long, say, uh, text. Uh, and afterwards, Clary, the Clary also say that uh, there were the wooden material of the houses are uh, also, uh, uh, say, collected by the, uh, by the crusaders to, uh, say, uh, create special shields for their ships against the Byzantine. Byzantines. And then uh, uh, recent I uh, discovered that actually it was published in uh, 2016. Madan had a very good say summary about those fires. Maybe you know that. First is, it, I mean, it, in the north part, and second in the southern part, and third is in between. But here uh, you see that how uh, the, the it was scattered around and uh, destroyed a major part of Istanbul. But for me, most important thing was that uh, during that period, uh, monasteries were not affected. Consciously or by chance, monasteries didn't have too much uh, effect of the fire. Uh, I will, uh, you will see why I'm, uh, I mean, uh, highlighting this detail. In the 14th-15th century uh, travel writings in Constantinopolis, I will uh, very fastly broke out to say that houses, with the exception of few uh, palaces, are wooden and very simple separate, makeshift enough to disappear in fire on first food, a, a flute. Uh, this is 14th century. Therefore, we know that in Byzantine, there, there were a uh, wooden structures, simple structures. I was looking to try to find out. Therefore, but, but for me, this is the most important missing link, since everybody thinks that, or say, suggests that 
Byzantine houses were all stone masonry or something like that. But now you will see that, in especially in Constantinople, it was an important position. There were many, many wooden houses. Ebu Fidal, uh, very shortly, I will, a uh, lot of, say, ruin in the city. Uh, Constantinople is in real decline uh, from 14th century. Can, uh, in Batuta, uh, visited. Uh, yesterday, I guess, Mr. Lap uh, also uh, made a presentation. But I will touch here, not a house, but very, very important wooden structure. Uh, in, in close to San Sofia, there was a wooden structure, very active, and then it, there was a say wooden uh, dome. I, I I couldn't believe that wooden dome. It's actually it's it, it, almost impossible. And then afterwards, I found out that the Arabic version of Ibn Battuta and could read and and the word used in the text was a uh, kuppe. In Turkish, we also say kuppe. And uh, this is not my say uh, aim to uh, make a, a research or survey on this uh, subject, but I do recommend you, if you are interested in, try to understand actually what was the usage of this say very complicated pavilion type structure. Uh, Clavicio, uh, enormous palaces, churches, and monasteries all over the city. Uh, just to say, give you an say, idea about Istanbul, uh, Constantinopolis. Bondel uh, Monti had a, say, a painting or map, but it was very much surprising that I couldn't find any wooden structure here. Therefore, I'm still speculating. Maybe masonry structures were more exaggerated or uh, preferred to be presented. A bit by uh, violence, I almost uh, uh, say uh, inspected all of the houses. But what I can say that from this map, we know that Istanbul was not high rise. Sorry for Istanbul, uh, I always correct by Constantinople, except my mistake. And then uh, another, another uh, broker say that it turned to a village. A uh, real decline for Constantinopolis. Tafur also passed. The city is crowded, dividing the district, and the population is mostly sheltered to the, 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 the southern coast, the close, the, sorry, sorry, northern coast. N Nestor Iskander but is a, a, another one. Uh, this is important for me. This is after the uh, conquest. Uh, and then uh, he says that. Ceramic and adobe, adobe tiles, roof tiles were thrown uh, to the, say, uh, to the Ottoman soldiers to defend. Uh, therefore, we understand that uh, the, the, the houses, either wooden or, uh, say, uh, stone masonry, had ceramic roof tiles. This is important for the, uh, say, uh, scattering of the, say, fire. Therefore, they, they were somehow, uh, say, secure for fire. And at that moment, I uh, decided to make a deep survey, and I found, uh, a, 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 say, a survey uh, just after the conquest in, in 1455, but uh, by uh, Tursun Bay, and then uh, he made a very, very tedious job. Uh, he visited uh, 1,250 houses of, in Ottoman, belonged to uh, Fatih Sultan Mehmet, Mehmet II's uh, foundations. And then very uh, detailed uh, report by me, I'm turned to a, say, Excel, uh, say, table, and then uh, I, I shared this in Academy Edo and ResearchGate. And uh, at the end, uh, from this survey, uh, sorry, 1,120 Byzantine houses. But uh, this uh, all very detailed, uh, say, analysis or say, sorry, registry, also touching the, the name of the owner. Uh, the uh, how many stores or say uh, how many rooms are uh, existing, but uh, not for all. Only uh, 
397, this makes 74 percent, were uh, say uh, single story, and 138, it is 24 percent of all 535 houses. It, the, the, the number of floors and number of uh, rooms were given. But anyhow, this is a very, very, say, a helpful or a meaningful sample size for all these sample houses. I don't want to get, uh, go too deep into the details, but this makes about 6% sample size of all Istanbul houses. If you are interested in this survey, you can refer, but unfortunately that paper is in a, a Turkish. You can find this, a, you can find this in a Academy Advanced Research, Research Grade. And I made that regression analysis and it showed that a, this typical a log normal distribution on right a, bottom, you'll see that a SPSS result of the survey uh, and how many uh, rooms can be found and does Byzantine house. And here in this survey, uh, the, the, the actually this was uh, published by uh, Inalgic, uh, ex examined the data and with his notes published in uh, 2012, rather recently and in English. And then uh, there are very few is a research on this, maybe I can count not, not more than three. And he discovered that there are drop, drop houses. I'm asking also, especially for to say uh, my Greek friends listening to me, drop is not very much meaningful. And we don't know that there were a uh, 29 incidents for drop houses. And I give the list of them. And, and then uh, this maybe these are a uh, very special houses used to belong to elites or say some government offices. I don't know, but these are this is one of the uh, say uh, house types in Constantinopolis. Also, uh, now uh, uh, as I explained, we see that uh, Constantinopolis was about, about two, two, four, uh, sorry, three, four. It's a single story and a one fourth a double story is in, seen in the Juan del Monte's map. But Tursun Bey also wrote in history and say that Evani Kevana ve Katları Göğe Yaklaşmış olan her bir evden. I like to say translation, but it, it, it something like this: the houses, floors from A1 to Saturn is approaching to the sky. And then this is contradiction, since that we are, we are discussing that uh, Constantinopolis was low rise uh, settlement, but here he's mentioning about high rise uh, Byzantine houses. This also should be uh, checked. And then uh, maybe this is an a, say indication regarding insulae in Istanbul, uh, Constantinopolis, uh, or ziggurat type house. Uh, we don't know. I don't have any clue. Just I am speculating. And uh, coming back to the say monasteries, I said that monasteries were not affected. I discovered that there are thirty chardaks. The first time chardak name appears in five monasteries among 30 monasteries registered it can, can be seen in the Tahrir or the registry of Tursun Bey. And then uh, there are uh, 30 chardaks. And it was very say, uh, confusing. Chardak in Turkish is very simple and then not, uh, can be, cannot be used as say house, but it uh, sounds like it is a wooden structure. Uh, mentioning about number of floors, number of is uh, uh, rooms, and rather big ones. And then after examining, I said I put forward at my hypothesis that chardaks should be a uh, wood made out of wood. And it, Uh, before I, I mention about this, but uh, Madan very often say that uh, in Fourth Crusaders monasteries are not affected. Now, 
we, I have to discuss. Uh, also, I need your as, as, uh, help. Uh, whether these chardaks are pre Latin, uh, say, uh, conquest or attacked, or after the Latin attack, uh, there were urgent need for the uh, monasteries and uh, timber structures are used, still a question for me. But anyhow, these are typical Byzantine wooden structure. We don't have any plan. Just we, we have a, how many a, a floors or a, and how many rooms, not more than that. But a, afterwards, I made another survey about Chardak in Turkey. Chardak is used, as I mentioned, very simple, but in Balkans, it is a, a, another house type. And a, I will tell you that the origin of Chardak was a a, a, a Farsi word it means four arches or four walls on four uh, columns or four uh, uh, wood, wood, wooden wooden uprights. And then uh, in Anatolia, the oldest known chardak can be seen in 14th century. And uh, we, we understood in, in Turkish we have a word it, it is actually Arabic, uh, Galat. Galat means known or commonly accepted wrong. Therefore, at a sudden, a stone masonry structure of Persian uh, say architecture turned in Anatolia to wooden structure. Turks start, or Ottomans, uh, and then pre-Ottomans uh, start holding wooden structures on four columns as chardak. And this cannot be seen in Anatolia, but these are, these are seen everywhere in Balkan, except Greece. It's an, another question mark for me. Uh, for, uh, and, uh, for example, the most important say, uh, sample uh, for me is really surprising. Uh, when Murat the, uh, the second passed to uh, Trace, he built a chardak. Uh, on, say, uh, Anatolian coast of Dardanel. And uh, most probably it was on uh, four columns. And then even today, the uh, the palace or the kiosk is not uh, it, it, no, known or the seen, but the name name of the position is still called Charda. <laughs> And this was this, but recently I will cut very short. Recently, uh, I we discovered this book uh, by B B Mrs. Bing. Uh, one by one, all the chartaks in Balkans these are exhibited, and the photos, and then we see that these were typical Ottoman uh, structures, but uh, we call them, it's a house or mansion. But in the a, a, a Balkan, they are called as Chardak. Therefore, the, a, another line was uh, connected. Uh, what we say Chardak in Anatolia has different meaning, but uh, we see that in Balkan, most probably uh, when uh, Ottomans, early Ottomans passed to uh, Dardanelle and reached the Balkan, this word was also uh, transferred to the Balkans. Now, very very shortly, this is another. This was printed uh, as their meeting in in two thousand twenty two in Sarajevo. I made another presentation similar like this, similar uh, of this. I uh, explained Ottoman house uh, evolution. These are the earliest Ottoman house. But I I, I would I... like to show you. Uh, I, I I touched it uh, on the right side. Uh, right side, you will see a typical Ottoman uh, house or maybe annex Ottoman house in, in uh, Athens. And a uh, Ottoman house uh, changed from masonry to wooden structure in the 15th century, beginning of this century, because of terrible earthquake. This is another say, reason using uh, timber structures in auto by Ottomans. And then this uh, was given, as I mentioned, in uh, 2022 in Sarajevo. Uh, wooden skeleton systems advantages and uh, say uh, disadvantages are listed. 
And now, uh, at least by this survey, I discovered that uh, Byzantine had a reasonable amount of wooden structure, used to be called, I don't know. Also, this should be discussed by, by my, say, uh, Greek colleagues. Instead of chardak, I checked the translation of chardak in Greek. It turns, uh, uh, come back with a uh, kala or kale in Turkish, but it is not, say, so much uh, covering what chardak actually is. This should be also discussed. Anyhow, thank you. I will wait for your questions. Of course, thank you very much for this long uh, trip uh, from the Neolithic period uh, uh, through uh, the early Bronze Ages in, uh, in Greece area, in Greek area, or to in, uh, Italy. All this wooden system and the wooden structures and the houses, especially in Byzantine period, and this invisible hero, which is the wood and uh, posed all these questions. Uh, I'm really in very interesting on all these you presented to us. And uh, I would like to uh, tell you maybe your interest in a uh, traveler during the 16th century, uh, Hans Dershwan, which is the, the period of the Soliman, the Magnifique, the Soliman. And uh, he has the, the manuscript, which is, was published in the early of the 20th century, and has a lot of details about the um, uh, the tools, uh, tools, and whatever was uh, constructed by the by populations and the inhabitants in Anatolia and Asia Minor and in Thrace. So this was what I remember from the my readings of the travelers of the 16th century. So we'll expect the questions to. Uh, just, just very short. These are these are also discussed in Ottoman House section in Sarajevo. I don't want to. I didn't want to go too deep and repeat the same information. But thank you for uh, informing that uh, it was discussed and uh, supporting my say view. Thank you. Thank you very much for all these uh, details and especially your research. And now we'll pass and we ask to Mr. Mustafa Chagan Keskin, which is Associate Professor in Istanbul University. And I think he will present us uh, George Wheeler and Jacob Spohn in Levant, Narratives in on Ottoman Architecture. Please, Mr. Keskin, can you be on the floor? Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much to be with us this afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank dear uh, Pasalis and the organization committee who invited me to this uh, symposium uh, for the honor of dearest Professor Stefano Serasmo. I'm very, very proud to be a part of this uh, symposium. Uh, today, uh, I will uh, uh, talk about uh, two travelogues of George Weller and Jakob Spohn. Ja Jakob Spohn. <clears throat> Jakob Spohn is a, a French physician and archaeologist and traveler. Uh, and uh, his partner, George Weller, is an English travel writer and antiquarian. Uh, they came uh, to Greece, Dalmatia, and Turkey. Uh, in the second half, the half of the 16th century. Uh, the, their travelogues are not very popular in Turkey because uh, there is no Turkish translation of these uh, travelogues. Uh, when I read them, uh, I realized very important uh, passage, passage from uh, their narratives. Uh, one is about the open tombs. Uh, actually, we all know uh, that there was a fashion, uh, fashion in uh, in the 16th century uh, and the 17th century, uh, the open tomb uh, fashion and cage tomb fashion. But uh, the Ottoman researchers uh, explained this fashion uh, with economic economic circumstances. But uh, in their travelogues, there is a very important passage uh, which shows that uh, the, this is not a fashion, uh, but the reason of the open tombs is religious. 
Uh, in this passage, uh, George Weller said, we observed one with the cupola covered only with a grate of wire of which we had account that it was of Mohammed Köprülü. Uh, he is talking about uh, Vezir Muhammed, uh, Mehmet Köprülü, Köprülü Mehmet Pasha, uh, father of the present Vezir uh, Fazl Ahmet Pasha, who settled the government during the discontents and uh, factions of pr principal hands. <clears throat> According to uh, this passage, uh, Köprülü Mehmet Pasha, who died uh, 10 years ago, uh, one night uh, came to dream uh, to his son Fazıl Ahmet Pasha uh, and uh, the Sultan Mehmet the Fourth, and said that uh, I am uh, very, very bad position in my grave. And please save me. And uh, in the morning, uh, Sultan and the Wazir uh, told each other about the dream, uh, and uh, they uh, told it uh, to a Mufti. And the Mufti said uh, that uh, they should have the roof of uh, his tomb uncovered, and that uh, the rain might. Uh, wash his body and his body, body uh, will be fresh. After reading this, I would like to check if the tomb uh, was covered before. And I uh, found this map. This map is uh, from uh, Köprülü Water Bay uh, and uh, drawn in uh, 1672, uh, three years before uh, Weller and Safon uh, saw the tomb. Uh, in this map, uh, we see that uh, the tomb is covered with a uh, dome. Also, uh, the French, uh, Antonio Gallant, who saw the tomb uh, in the same year, uh, said that the tomb is covered with a dome. Uh, then we, uh, then I realized that uh, the dome really demolished uh, during uh, 1673 and uh, 1675. But uh, I thought that uh, the dream, uh, the story of the dream, uh, should be a, a legalization metaphor uh, of demolition of the uh, dome of the tomb. So I asked uh, who can who could uh, be the man uh, that Sultan and the Wazir asked uh, to demolish uh, the dome, and uh, I reached Wani Mehmed Efendi. Wani Mehmed Efendi uh, is a very strict uh, religious man uh, who, uh, following the uh, ideas of Ibn Taymiyyah and uh, Imam Dirgiri, uh, who were the uh, Salafi uh, movements uh, philosophers. Uh, he is very. He was very active uh, during the period of uh, Mah um, Sultan Mehmed IV uh, until the uh, siege of uh, Vienna, uh, and then uh, he went to Bursa. Uh, but his uh, father, uh, son-in-law uh, and his student, uh, Feyzullah Efendi, uh, became Sheikhul Islam uh, in uh, 1688. And then uh, his grandsons, uh, Mustafa Efendi and Mustaza Efendi, become uh, Sheikhul Islam. So, uh, around uh, 100 years, uh, this family uh, was very e effective in uh, Ottoman politics and religion. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, Wani Mehmed Efendi said uh, the rainwater can uh, fresh the body of uh, Vezir uh, Mehmed Pasha. Uh, it is almost the same uh, with the uh, will of uh, Imam Birgavi, who uh, Mehmed Wani Efendi uh, 
accepted his, his ideas. Uh, according to William to uh, Imam Birgivi, uh, he said that uh, when the burial is complete, uh, let them pour a basin of water over me. The pouring water of uh, water should start from the head and continue down to feet. They should not boil a dome over me, uh, set up a tent or light candles as it exquisitely uh, states in reputable books to be dis disapproved of religiously. It is forbidden by hadiths, rain falling on the grave, the wind blowing, and some animals grazing are considered atonement uh, for the sins of the deceased. The growth of plants on the grave is also considered an act of atonement, they say. Uh, actually, uh, in Turkey, uh, people are still uh, pour water uh, over the graves. And some wheels, uh, some sultans uh, also wanted to uh, open tombs. For example, uh, Murat II, uh, according to his will, uh, he wanted to uh, fresh his body uh, with rainwater and uh, in his will uh, he explained how uh, they built the tomb. And uh, in the tomb uh, there, there is an oculus uh, in the tomb uh, on the grave of uh, Sultan Murat II. The Salafi ideas uh, Salafi Islamic ideas uh, is uh, really aggressive uh, about the tombs. Uh, this is this from uh, this photo is from Mecca. Uh, the grave is Jannet and Muayla graveyard. Uh, there were uh, many tombs, as you see, and these tombs uh, were uh, the tombs of uh, relatives of uh, Prophet Muhammad, uh, but the so Saudi kings, uh, whose relig religious ideas uh, close to uh, Salafi ideas, demolished all all of the tombs. Also, these tombs, uh, the most popular one of these open tombs is the tomb of uh, Gümüş Emetullah Valide Sultan, who is the wife of uh, Mehmet IV, uh, and the uh, mother of uh, Sultan uh, Mustafa II and uh, Ahmed III. Uh, he is very close with uh, Sheikh Huizan Feizullah Efendi, uh, who, is, who was the uh, son-in-law of uh, Wani Mehmed Efendi. And uh, in her will, uh, she said, uh, my tomb uh, should be open uh, and should be in Üsküdar. And this tomb uh, created uh, with the will of uh, Sultan. Uh, the very popular, uh, very popular and famous Turkish writer uh, Ahmet Hamdi Tampınar, uh, in his romantic book Beş Şehir, uh, defined this tomb uh, as a birdcage. Actually, these uh, tombs uh, is a product of a religious will. Uh, but uh, the design idea is uh, a really birdcage because uh, in Islamic view, uh, the body is a cage and the soul uh, is a bird. So uh, this tomb uh, explains this uh, metaphor of that. Actually, in this uh, tomb, uh, it's made by uh, iron. Uh, in it is <clears throat> in its in inscription uh, it explained that uh, it is a cage of the uh, pigeons of uh, the heaven these are uh, several examples from Balkans these are from Istanbul and one of the uh, examples from uh, Yanya, Greece. And the second very important passage uh, in their uh, travelogues uh, is about the uh, palace of Mehmet the Fort in Bursa. 
Uh, we all know that uh, Bursa was the first capital uh, of Ottoman Empire. Uh, when they conquered the city, uh, they used the stock of buildings uh, of Byzantine monuments. Uh, the church uh, converted to Medjus and Mosque. Uh, the Baptistery converted to the swamp of uh, Osman Bey. Uh, and the palace of the Byzantine governor converted to uh, Ottoman palace. Uh, actually, uh, it was a citadel uh, surrounded by walls. Uh, but uh, we don't know the uh, building inside it uh, because uh, all the buildings uh, were demolished uh, in the earthquake which happened uh, in 1855. This uh, palace uh, was uh, very popular and the house of the Ottoman family uh, until the Ankara battle. Uh, one week uh, from the Ankara battle, the Timurids army uh, came to Bursa uh, and plundered the Ottoman palace and uh, took their treasure and also the wife of uh, Sultan Bayezid I, uh, Oliver Lazarevich, uh, to Samarkand. And then Ottoman family uh, leave this palace uh, and moved to Edirne. The palace uh, went to ru ruin uh, over the years and uh, used as a depot. Uh, this is the uh, actual photo of the uh, ruins of the palace. Uh, now uh, there is a, a military gar garrison uh, on it. Uh, in their travelogues, uh, they say uh, there was a where there was two palaces in Bursa. Uh, well, I said, uh, one is uh, the old one, it is almost demolished, and the second one uh, is built uh, about 17 years ago, into my two months' time, uh, for the visiting of uh, Sultan. And they described uh, the uh, palace because they, they could enter the palace. They bribe uh, three coins uh, to the Yenisari who, who was the guard of the palace and uh, entered the building uh, and uh, they saw all of the rooms and the beds of the building and they say it's a, a very cool palace uh, for the Korean, uh, Christian uh, princess, what, uh, uh, but it is also a traditional Turkish house uh, without any mobile uh, furniture. Uh, when I uh, read uh, this text, uh, I started to research uh, if there is a, another another palace, a new palace in Bursa or not, and then I, I found uh, a re register of the court, uh, it is about uh, the payments of the buildings uh, which demolished uh, for a building and new palace. Uh, and we understood that uh, during the visit of uh, Mehmet the Fourth, the Mehmet the Fourth in uh, sixteen fifty nine. Uh, they demolished some uh, houses and built a new palace. Uh, new palace is a little bit far away from the old palace. Uh, in this map, uh, you can see uh, with the pink uh, area. Uh, it is in the uh, northwestern side of the uh, Bursa uh, hill. Uh, <coughs> In 1718, uh, uh, Joseph de Tornefort uh, also came to Bursa and uh, he confirmed the uh, registers of uh, Jacob Spohn and George Weller and he said uh, the old palace, uh, there, is, there is two palaces uh, in Bursa, the old one uh, built by uh, Murat I and the second one 
built by Mehmet the Fourth. Uh, <clears throat> and then Napolitan uh, came to Bursa. Uh, Giovanni Francesco uh, Carreri uh, in 1699. Uh, he he also uh, saw the new palace, but uh, he said that uh, there are two palaces. Uh, one is uh, built uh, about 35 years ago for the visit of. Uh, Sultan Mohammed IV, uh, but uh, it's now uh, like a win. And uh, Richard Pocock uh, visited Bursa in uh, 1745. Uh, he described, uh, he said that uh, over the north brow of the hill are ruins of the Grand Senor Seraglio, uh, which was burned down uh, some years ago. Uh, then we realized that. Uh, the new palace of uh, Mehmet IV uh, was bur burnt down uh, during uh, 1700 and uh, 1745. And uh, uh, Ignaz von Brenner, uh, a Dutch traveler, uh, came to Bursa and he also uh, said that uh, there was two palaces. Uh, one is from uh, the era of Murat I, and the second uh, is from the uh, era of uh, Mehmet IV, but uh, two of them uh, were ruins. Uh, now, the area of the uh, new palace uh, is a park, uh, but Ottomans uh, made a hospital uh, in this area in 19th century. It is also demolished, uh, but now uh, some archaeological uh, researches are still going on. Uh, and here you can see uh, there are some uh, rooms and passages uh, under the park, uh, and uh, it is now uh, open to visit. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry for my bad English. No, no. We thank you very much because Spawn and Wheeler was an occasion for you to make your researches on uh, Ottoman architecture, on open tombs, and also in the palaces at uh, Bursa. And uh, now I have, uh, I hope that there will be um, the discussion, will, there were questions on it, about it, uh, either on travelers, either on the uh, Ottoman architecture. So now I have to call Eleftheria Constantinidou. And uh, for the which is uh, a PhD candidate in National Technical University of Athens, and she will present us the special analysis of cans and caravans rice mm -hmm. characteristics according to the 16th and 17th century travelers in northern uh, Greece. Uh, no. Okay, so I have to call uh, 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 I'm Nice to meet you. Hello. Hello. Again. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, of Is course. Is that right? Not too yeah. um, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, the introduction and uh, congratulations uh, on organizing such an engaging uh, conference. Um, I would like to thank you also for the opportunity to present part of my ongoing PhD research, uh, which is funded by the Research Committee uh, of National Technical University of Athens and is dealing with the Kants and Caravans Rais uh, in the northern part of Greece. Now, for today's announcement, we will narrow down the um, uh, chronological period and we will focus on the 16th and 17th centuries according to the travelers. Now, the Kansan caravans rice, uh, as most of you might know, they served as spaces of accommodation and uh, they were shelters for travelers serving their needs and also contributing to their safety during the travel. Uh, they were available to uh, every traveler who wished to stay there and usually they were free of charge uh, for a limited uh, number of nights. Uh, these establishments, they were uh, found either inside the cities and the settlements or outside of them alongside the roads and especially where the distances between two settlements were longer and the travelers were required to spend the night uh, in between. 
uh, throughout the years, their function altered and uh, more and more commercial activities started to take place inside the premises. Uh, you know, uh, the scans and caravanserais, they played an important role in the establishment of uh, supra-local terrestrial commerce and transport uh, in the Ottoman Empire. And uh, several researchers have emphasized that uh, uh, the number of cans and caravanserais on a road, meaning the density of cans on the road net network, it was related with the attraction of traffic, the significance of the route, uh, the condition of the road, or all of this is vice versa. Uh, today, uh, the available sources we have on uh, researching the Kansas and Vassarites characteristics, they are mostly archaeological or architectural remnants. They are the descriptions from uh, the travelers' accounts and, and uh, of course, the de depictions uh, engravings uh, for, that uh, they complemented the textual um, publications. Now, in northern Greece, uh, the remnants of Kansas and Vassarites, they are scarce. They are mostly preserved inside the cities. Uh, uh, and uh, many of these buildings, um, both inside the building, inside the cities, and on the roadside, they were abandoned, or they were transformed into private residences, or they were even demolished. So, consequently, the limited uh, architectural evidence underscores the invaluable uh, role of the travelogues as principal source of information regarding these infrastructures. Uh, now, for uh, this uh, presentation. Um, we will focus on the accounts of travelers of the 16th and 17th centuries, but as they have been recorded and catalogued in recent studies, uh, we will present two. Uh, we will take data from two uh, uh, publications. Uh, the first one is that of uh, Stefanos Gerasimus, who is honored today at this conference uh, for the monograph uh, he published uh, on the travelers of the Ottoman uh, at the Ottoman Empire uh, from the 14th to 16th centuries. And the second one is the publication of uh, Professor Pascal Sandrudis in his work, uh, Cans and Caravanserais in Greece and the Balkans. Uh, which does not have this uh, um, chronological limit. Uh, thus, uh, it uh, helps uh, by complementing um, chronologically the work of uh, uh, Gerasimus. Now, through the examination of these works and focusing specifically on Kants and Karabasserais, uh, with this presentation, uh, we aim to reconstruct uh, a network uh, of uh, these establishments by utilizing the tools of digital humanities and of uh, historical uh, GIS which is the Geographical Information uh, Systems. Now, the first source uh, is a comprehensive uh, study uh, of uh, Gerasimus uh, that has uh, more uh, than 450 uh, itineraries from travel accounts. Uh, these uh, are mostly from European travelers. Uh, and uh, as it has uh, already been said in this conference, uh, there are uh, other uh, travelers from the East that are missing or even private correspondence uh, that is absent of, uh, between mer merchants. However, it is uh, thoroughly researched and the material uh, presents today one uh, of the most remarkable collections about these sources. And it is an excellent tool uh, for the digitization uh, process. Uh, the way that uh, it is structured, uh, that it's shown here, this is an example of a page, uh, it has, um, uh, it includes the names uh, of the locations, uh, but uh, along amongst them, they are, there are uh, monuments, infrastructure, and of course, there are the caravanserais that we are interested in. They are noted uh, after uh, the location name. Uh, this is uh, very, this in information is very important because it makes the digitization pro process quick and straightforward. We don't need to go through all these uh, travel uh, accounts uh, in order to extract this data. Uh, moreover, what is uh, uh, also helping. Uh, and makes uh, the progress uh, uh, faster is that we uh, see here as DS, DI, and DD, uh, where Gerasimus mentions this if there is uh, more uh, detailed or uh, a sort of description uh, in the text. Uh, so we can go and uh, review and see if there are more information about caravanserais immediately without spending more time on this. Uh, finally, uh, in the parentheses, we can see the recent names of the 
uh, of the topon toponyms, which is also very important because of the name change that uh, happened that occurred from the 14th century onwards to today. And also because there are sometimes uh, different spelling of those names, so it makes the digitization and the mapping process easier. Uh, the first uh, step of the um, uh, of uh, this process of digitization and the construction of this network of CANs uh, involved the extraction of data from these itineraries in uh, uh, the area of Thrace and uh, Central Macedonia and Greece. Uh, it uh, involved the registration and the digital mapping on uh, QGIS software, which is an open source uh, uh, GIS software. And uh, as you can see, this is an example sample of the database and includes the name of the location, the name of the traveler, uh, the chronology, the type of uh, um, accommodation, uh, the number of uh, uh, the council of caravans arise, uh, and the, this data was uh, visualized as we can see in this map. Uh, now we can see that this is only a small proportion of uh, um, uh, of uh, data entries, uh, especially if you compare it to the 450 almost uh, travelers that uh, he cataloged, uh, and that they, they passed only this specific period of time and a specific um, area uh, that we investigate. Uh, most of those um, data, they come from uh, uh, Lorenzo Bernardo uh, travel account that uh, he uh, traveled uh, through Via Ignatia. Um, Another uh, another mention is on the caravanserai of Cavalla from Pierre Bellon, uh, who also gave um, an extended um, description on the institution of uh, accommodation uh, on caravanserais. And the third one is from Livio Cellini, uh, who mentioned one uh, caravanserai in, in Ferres and uh, another one in Kitsuk uh, So. Uh, uh, in the other map, uh, we can see the number of the caravanserais here. Uh, we see only El Basan, Orfanion, Gimulcine uh, Komotini, and uh, Rodosto having uh, more than one caravanserai. Uh, this um, data set, as we can see here, is not exhaustive, and uh, we can see that significant centers uh, such as Thessaloniki uh, they miss from this uh, uh, database. We know that in Thessaloniki in 1546, there were at least two caravanserais uh, that they were mentioned at the registry of the Bakuf uh, Maktul Mustafa Pasha. So a more thorough data gathering was required for a more comprehensive um, data set construction. Uh, so another problem that was um, uh, that emerged from this is that uh, the term caravanserai is only used, and it's not uh, it's not uh, used the term of uh, cans. So there is not a differentiation or a distinction between the two terms. Um, uh, so uh, we come to the second um, research that is available today. Uh, this is of uh, the professor uh, Pascal Sandrudis, which was published in 2004. It is, uh, up to our knowledge, the only consolidated research on the specific buildings in the wider area of Greece and Balkans. Um, it is uh, a comprehensive catalog of the places of accommodation, but this time they are referred in geographical order, in contrast of, with the work of uh, uh, Gerasimus. Uh, as I mentioned before, it does not have also the strict chronological limitation, so we have more data to uh, to complete uh, uh, the data set. Um, now, uh, apart from the literary data, uh, this uh, research is also supported by description, also photographs and drawings when available, uh, and it makes it an in its source for the Kansan Karabanserai's characteristics uh, to this day. That uh, was constructed can be seen here that uh, uh, apart from the previous um, columns, we have more uh, data on the characteristics and also if there is an image or if there are um, if there is a number on uh, men or horses that uh, could be accommodated. So as we can see at this map, uh, the database uh, started to become um, more um, uh, 
uh, coherent and substantial. And there is also the differentiation between Kant's and Caravanserais that we can see with the square uh, and the uh, round um, symbols. Um, in order to further uh, gather details from the Kant's and Caravanserais, uh, we, all, we started with a case study, this of the well-known uh, Seyahatname of Evelyan Celebi. Uh, Greece is uh, described uh, mostly the eighth volume of uh, the publication. Um, of course, in order to uh, further examine and analyze the data sets and the visualized uh, uh, maps, uh, a critical analysis of the travelers and their works reliability must be uh, preceded. Uh, however, we will uh, now show the digitized data here. Um, we don't have time to uh, get into more details on that. Uh, in order to verify and double check uh, the geolocating of the places, we used another uh, project of uh, digital humanities, uh, which is uh, the digitalization of every location that uh, Vliyat Salabi visited uh, by Mustafa Basharan. Uh, this uh, map is on Google Maps, it's uh, publicly available, and people uh, that do not have uh, knowledge on how to use GIS systems, they can easily have access to this. Uh, for the distinction of the terminology, we also used uh, the, the Turkish translation instead of the Greek ones, because the Greek ones were also, um, I'm not sure that they are all uh, published uh, up to this day. So uh, Evliya mentions both Kant and Caravanserais, and um, uh, more uh, columns uh, were added to this um, um, to this uh, database here that involves characteristics as well. Uh, we can see here the differentiation of the uh, number uh, per location uh, that was uh, uh, that was visualized through this data, but we have also more uh, characteristics. They are um, just a few pro proportion of the total more than a hundred uh, database entries that we mentioned, but uh, uh, it, this is a work in progress and uh, this database is dynamic and uh, will continue to add uh, data. So we can see here the differentiation between uh, uh, Buyuk and Kyuchuk Hanlari, the, the, according to the size, large and small. Uh, there are uh, also uh, some of them referred us to Jar. Moreover, some other characteristics on the uh, were referred also a small proportion of them. We can see here Kalegi, this is uh, castle like, or um, Karir Yapi that we had uh, in Orfanio, which was mentioned uh, that it is uh, uh, built with masonry. Um, but uh, as I mentioned before, this is uh, a work in progress and that uh, is a dy dynamic database. Uh, now, this is um, uh, not uh, the first time uh, that uh, a digital information bank um, uh, project is being attempted on travelers. Uh, one um, uh, was published in uh, the results of one project were published in 1993. Uh, this was a project run uh, at the Institute of Neo-Hellenic Research and included a catalogue of place, names and lodging for travellers' accounts of the 16th and 17th centuries uh, by the researchers Azelis and uh, Hadzir Panayoti. Uh, this um, uh, digital information bank uh, was uh, published uh, in hard copies. Uh, and it, uh, the structure of it was uh, kind of like uh, the one we saw in Gerasimus' uh, work. Now another research project, bro, uh, bro, project uh, sorry, uh, it was uh, conducted again at the same uh, institute. It was called Kir to Plegmata, and uh, some results uh, were published in 2015 and 2016. Uh, this also included the work uh, from uh, Dr. Vingopoulou uh, on the topic of itinerary stations and people in the travel networks uh, from 15th to 19th centuries. Uh, now, uh, this was a larger project that uh, documented the function of the various networks that developed in a Greek area from prehistory to the present day. So, um, as, um, as far as it concerned our uh, area of research and the dates, uh, it only mentions two travelers uh, that they, 
they are documented in this uh, um, uh, in this pro uh, in this uh, program, um, and um, no more details on cans and caravanserais as a whole were uh, mentioned. Um, moreover, the technology changed from the 1993 and even from 2015, and today we have access to several advanced uh, software that allows us to um, work more on these digital databases. Now, in the fields of digital humanities and Ottoman studies, uh, researchers have highlighted two uh, problems. The first one is the issue of uh, the renewal, the management, even the maintenance of uh, such online databases uh, that sometimes are stopping after the funding uh, has finished. Uh, and the second, the second uh, large issue in the field of Ottoman uh, digital studies is the lack of a large-scale gazetteer uh, on a spatial uh, background that could assist uh, the research of Ottoman history and especially uh, the research on the means of transport and travel uh, during the Ottoman period. Uh, some projects have already shown results on this, uh, on an attempt to build such a, a part of a gazetteer. These involve, um, for example, uh, the analysis and uh, data mining with AI technologies from maps. Uh, they digitize, for example, road networks or the railway and telegraph networks. Uh, another one uh, tries to uh, uh, figure the time uh, that was required for uh, traveling. Other uh, projects digitize data from registers and they give them geospatial uh, um, um, information as well, so they are presented in maps. Uh, however, all of these, they do not include specific data sets on cans and can caravanserais that actually facilitated uh, travel and commerce, um, terrestrial commerce. Uh, the databases, the, the data sets that we presented today are certainly not exhaustive and yet despite being relatively small in number of uh, entries, when they are combined with other data sets from other periods of times, like uh, from maps and travelings from 19th and 20th centuries, uh, like the one we presented at the conference, uh, the Ottoman Monuments in Greece Revisited, uh, which was a tribute to Michael Kiel uh, that happened last year, um, they offer all combined the opportunity for drawing conclusions that can Im cannot emerge otherwise except from uh, data aggregation, processing and visualization. And of course, after that, uh, their uh, data spatial analysis. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I welcome questions and uh, remarks uh, at the end of the session. Thank you very much. Really, I'm very glad that uh, you know that uh, Hans and Garvan Sarans are my favorites since my first article to the last one about uh, roots and housing in trays. So now I'm happy that the new technologies uh, will cover all this area, especially uh, through, of course, the travelers' writing. Thank you very much, and I hope we will continue this discussion, Not maybe not today, but uh, even in the future. Thank you very much. But and thank you for respecting the time also. And now I have to ask uh, Luca Orlandi, please, uh, to come on the floor, assistant professor for Ozzig University in Turkey, that uh, he will present uh, as the Ottoman Balkans, its architectural and urban environment in the perception of the Western travelers. So yes, I, thank you very much for the presentation. Okay. And thank you all to be here today. And it's really important, and I think, to be part of this network and part of this amazing, uh, let's say, network dealing with the travelers and uh, recount and, and the travel logs and memoirs and so on. So actually, uh, I will narrow down to uh, the case study of a Trace, basically, actually, the what is called a Trakia today, so within the border of uh, Turkey. And the main point is to sort of analyzing and uh, make some consideration about the Ottoman built environment left uh, visible still today or um, possible to be found only in the travelogues or in the accounts that the travelers left in the past. I consider a period of uh, 14th to 19th century, but of course this can be um, 
can be changed, of course, according to, to the need, this date, this periodization. And I'm very glad that Eleftheria present before me uh, such very interesting studies, also via Ignazia, because somehow my topic is also overlapping her studies in, in a way. So um, what I basically uh, did was trying to mapping uh, through the traveler description and also through uh, uh, site uh, visits in, in the area, uh, trying to mapping how it was arranged uh, Trachea, especially in the Ottoman times, since it was the part of the Balkans in the uh, European side uh, of the Ottoman Empire. I mean, of course, Rumeli by extension, but Trachea was the really the um, more closest part of this uh, region uh, close to the core of the of the Ottoman Empire of course represented by the capital uh, Constantinople Istanbul so therefore here you can see a map with in the borders uh, I choose a map from 1916 but more or less uh, those um, borders divide is actually uh, Turkey from Greece and uh, Bulgaria are still um, uh, valid today. And what I try to do is exactly to work on um, uh, travelogues and especially, but uh, my colleague, I mean, uh, Elefteri explained very well before, since today is everything uh, done to celebrate in a way and commemorate the Erasmus. Of course, also my studies started from that book about the travelers and uh, then i evolved changing into more try what i used to define as the ottoman sort of ottoman landscape or the way in which the ottoman uh, the ottomanization let's say of the territories the way in which the ottomans were transforming the territories um, throughout their uh, uh, period of their conquest and uh, after on from the uh, 15 up to the 19, in my case, up to the 19th century. Uh, of course, I made a selection uh, of authors and travelers. So we cannot, we see many different today. And also this is very important for me that we can always learn from each other about the new travelers and about new uh, uh, discovering in a way also of places and so on. So here I just want to point out the main um, cities of uh, main towns or in city of um, trace so you can see here of course by in order of importance istanbul constantinople of course then edirne tekirda and uh, kirkelaveli which are today um, also the main city the central city for the division of the sub region in uh, in trace trachia so i use this just as a reference but uh, my main point was also to uh, identify, of course, the main routes that were, of course, obviously were described in uh, Erasmus books. So here I'm overlapping with Eleftheria um, speech done before. So the Via Gnazia or Via Gnazia uh, just towards Greece, Albania and Italy. And you can see here the main points uh, considering, I mean, the, the main uh, places actually. Uh, we have to think that on the caravan routes, usually there is a distance more or less of uh, generally 30 kilometers between one uh, stop and, uh, and the next one. Uh, so there are also other minors, but here I want just to underline, of course, some of the most important stops, and we will see why. And so the left roads towards uh, Albania, Italy and Greece, so the imperial or in Ottoman time called uh, Sultan roads, connecting in this case the what it was before the former capital of the Ottoman Empire in the 15th century, Edirne, and then after the second half of the 15th century, Constantinople, Istanbul, Constantinia, or whatever. And here you can see so more dense, more uh, stops, let's say, which will be uh, later see how rich is especially on this uh, as the we can call it um, the spine bone of the ottoman empire of course uh, travelers you have to think going moving from west towards the capital of the ottomans but on the other way also 
moving from the capital towards uh, Europe and the Western powers, especially those routes were used by military uh, for, uh, of course, um, military purposes, but also for embassy or um, we will see many, many different where the travelers passing all those tracks during the past. And uh, the, the other uh, is the connections towards North, Romania, Crimea, and Russia, which was, you know, basically uh, moving parallel to the to the Black Sea and reaching uh, these other uh, regions. Uh, you can see now from the following maps how I try to uh, put all together important landmarks in terms of Ottoman architecture and places. For instance, uh, here are the most relevant uh, centers in Trakia. You can see all the name, the actual name. Also, this is very important, as also Elefteria mentioned before, because these are are recorded today in uh, Turkish, but of course, not always in the um, accounts of the travelers, we found the same uh, uh, toponyms. Uh, therefore, I try just here to make a synthesis of the most frequent place names used uh, in the travelogue. So you can see, uh, just for instance, let's say the um, Edirne, for instance, called as uh, Adrianople, of course, in German, or Adrenopoli, or Adrinopoli, or Endrene, or even Edrene. So there are different, of course, according to the account. But I think it's quite clear also here and can be mapping map even more. As I said, I did the selection and I choose just a limited portion, of course, of the Balkans, and I zoom into uh, not all the old trace, but just what is trace uh, Trakia today, so within the Turkish border. And here you can see among the main complexes, for instance, uh, the one of Suleiman uh, in uh, Büyük Çekmece, so-called Mehmet Pasha in Lüleburgaz, or others like uh, in Abza, again, Edirne, Beyazit, or Celid al Pasha in Ipsala, or Rustem Pasha in Tekirda. And those also were called uh, road stations or menzil culie and play a very important role in the definition of the Ottomanization of the territory because those complexes were not just a religious complex, but they were like a multifunctional and, uh, places in which usually there were different activities surrounding the mosque, uh, as it can be, for instance, the case of some caravanserais, or a bath, a Turkish bath, or um, markets, I mean, cover street, uh, cover, covered bazaar or street market, or infrastructure, important infrastructures, especially uh, in Trakia, we will see bridges play an important role, of course, in the communication, since there are several rivers cutting the trace region. So here, just to point out some of the most important mosques built in a let's say, classical Ottoman time. I mean, it goes from the 15th century, like uh, Muradie in uh, Uzunkopru, till uh, the second half of the 16th century, for instance, with Selimie in Edirne. But as you can see, a variety, always with this very characteristic signature, let's say, real landmark in the territory. I mean, passing from one town to another, from a city to another, seeing those buildings, uh, it means a lot for the travelers because they also understood by their density how they were approaching the core of the uh, Ottoman Empire. And it's not by chance that even though uh, Edirne is a bit far, 250 kilometers from Istanbul, nevertheless, um, the building of Selimie represents a very important landmark, very visible, we will see in the description later by some uh, travelers, because uh, underline the fact that we were really approaching the core of the Ottoman state. Uh, here, for instance, I point out the caravanserais. Uh, some are still preserved today, while others, you can see the red dots on my map, are completely uh, destroyed or um, never left no traces at all or like the ones in Lüleburgaz, in which that was one of the biggest actually, and uh, described by several travelers, and uh, which only some parts of external walls are left uh, today. While, while others, for instance, the Rustem Pasha in uh, Edirne is very well preserved, or the ones in Büyük Çekmece by Sultan Suleiman in Sokolum Ahmed Pasha. 
Uh, here I want to point out, for instance, markets, street markets and covered bazaar. And as you can see, some of them are still existing and functioning, especially in the city of Edirne. And uh, here also some uh, Turkish baths, and those are the original ones still surviving. And quite interesting, all of them, uh, as well as many other buildings, especially in this part of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire, uh, done in the 16th century by the hands, by the will, of course, of the sultans or viziers or prince and princess, whatever. But mostly of them uh, built, not only the baths, but I'm talking about mosque, Ravansarai, and so on, by the hand of the architect Sinan, which was actually uh, part of my previous studies in, because I analyzed all the Sinan's works in uh, this uh, geography. And here we can see, as I mentioned before about infrastructure, the importance, for instance, of uh, bridges. So to cross the rivers or uh, flooded areas or, or kind of swamp areas, uh, there is an incredible number of bridges which still are existing today, although not always under the best uh, preservation. And here talking about the travelers, I just point out some of them. And uh, also in the previous um, speeches today, uh, there are more detailed description about some of those travelers. So I will just want to show some of them re in related with the, with the um, let's say, the Ottoman Ottomanization or what I used to call, what I like to call as the Ottoman landscape approaching the, um, the capital for coming from West. And um, the, first of all, I would like to talk a little about uh, this uh, anonymous sketchbook, the so-called Leiden sketchbook, approximately done between 1577 and 1585. And we don't know anything uh, since actually there are just sketches and not um, any account. So also author is anonymous, but as you can see, sketches are beautiful. I include uh, Svilengrad to this presentation because it's so close to just 20 kilometers from Edirne that became actually part of Bulgaria very late, but for many, many centuries was known as uh, Mustafa, uh, Mustafa Pasha or Mustafa uh, Köprüsü. So it was part connected of the network very close to Edirne, even though today it belongs to uh, uh, Bulgaria and not anymore to to Turkey, let's say. And here you can see beautiful the those uh, uh, sketches because they show very clearly also some important uh, landmarks, architectural landmarks in the territory. So what I show you, for instance, before in um, sorry in um, some other pictures, you can easily see here exactly depicted. And we know that this was done more or less around the 1580s because, uh, for instance, in Edirne, we can see still under construction the mosque, uh, Selimie, which is dominated like the crowning, the, the city itself of Edirne. And you can see that the fourth minaret is under construction. That's why it can be dated between 1577 and 15. 85, this uh, amazing manuscript preserved in Leiden, uh, Netherlands. So here you can see some other images. And actually also the manuscript ended before entering uh, Istanbul. So we just get in the outskirt of um, uh, Istanbul, even though today both Büyük uh, Çekmece and Küçük Çekmece are inside the border of the uh, great uh, municipality of Istanbul. And here you can see very well depicted, for instance, bridges. So it tells a lot how the author wants to mention exactly the characteristic signs of the uh, Ottoman cities and Ottoman settlements in those areas. Uh, here are some descriptions, like uh, about, for instance, the area of Buyuk um, Çekmece, uh, in which you can see, uh, I pick up a description by uh, Nicolas de Nicolai, in which he described also with the ancient name and, uh, sorry, Kuchuk Chekmeje, uh, also indicated sometimes, as you can see here in Italian, Ponte Picciolo, actually should be Piccolo, but 
nevertheless, I mean, there are these kind of orthographic mistakes in these uh, accounts very often, but it shows very clearly, and I just point out through some images, visual description made by other uh, travelers, in this case by Luigi uh, Mayer in the in a representation at the beginning of the 19th century. And uh, here we can move to others. I want to point out the Buchek Meje here because it was so important, the infrastructure of the bridge done by Sinan around 1560s, uh, 1565 actually. In this case is a Seyed Lokman in the Shainame is Selim Han. So a book to celebrate Selim the first uh, preserving top cap and dated probably 1571-1581, you can see very well depicted the bridge with the four hand, hand back, um, donkey handbag uh, edges of the of the bridge, which is a characteristic that we will see in a while in other representation, like in this why in this one, and you can see also some description, for instance, in this case by the the Busbeck. In the middle of the 16th century, in which he described uh, crossing those bridges in those two lovely arms of the sea, or Peter Mundi, one century later, describing the Ponte Piccolo and Ponto Grande and explaining how they said they camped there uh, with tents in those areas uh, nearby and describing the stone bridge as well. Or here, the city of uh, Silibri the ancient Celebria or Celimbria, and uh, described by Robert Belgrave in the middle of the 17th century, and uh, giving also the distance from uh, Ponte Grande, from Bujecnage, and presenting something about what's still visible back then in terms of even Christian buildings and so on. And uh, Lule Burgas, we are in the core of the Trachia, and here are very important caravanserai and street markets. And uh, unfortunately, the caravanserai is the one I show in the picture before has got completely lost, as well as the one nearby that was of Bukharishteran, a few kilometers uh, south of Lüleburgas, that there are no traces at all of that building. And here I just point out two description of this area, one by De La Broquière, as we saw before, in which it means it mm, used the toponym of uh, Pirgazi, uh, and it describes how it was completely destroyed back then. We are in the year of the conquer uh, made by the Ottoman uh, Turks. So uh, those settlements were uh, actually in very bad condition, not as it was uh, centuries later. So for instance, as we can see from Giovanni Battista del Burgo, um, also, this is a very uh, important traveler that we know very little about him, but this book was written in Italian and he described the two caravanseragli and a beautiful mosque, uh, both of them done uh, by Sinan uh, in uh, Lüleburgas, and he described uh, also how they spent time in this caravanserai during their stay on the way to uh, Constantinople. And here we reach Edirne, so I want to point out uh, the view of the city from distance from one of the bridge, uh, Megidia Bridge, actually, and uh, the crown and Selimie in the middle, and some description like uh, Louis Desar uh, and uh, Lady Montagu, in which they describe, for instance, the Bedesten or some important and specific part of the city, and uh, as well as the one of the last, of course, Helmut von Molkt. Uh, in which it's very interesting how we compare in that always the cities seen from far, uh, they look Ottoman cities very beautiful, and this is contradicting while entering uh, inside, where instead um, misery or um, dirt streets or other things uh, are not reflecting the beauty of those cities seen from distance. And also he highlight the, the fact that the mosque, of course, of Sultan Selim, it's like um, an important landmark coming through the through the through the meadows and approaching the city to this uh, um, caravan route. And to conclude, I'd like to just read this part in which the travels narrative reflect the perception of some explored territories, and their perception is always a, 
reflection in a bad or a good manner to the cultural stereotype of the traveler themselves. And it can be also referred to the historical period in which the traveler visit those lands. Therefore, we can find several levels of perception expressed by the travelers. At a regional scale, a town generating element scale, represented very well by urban structures like the Menzil Couliers and by infrastructures like bridges, and at urban space scale, and then related to some specific buildings, like in the case of baths, markets, or kebansarai. Uh, moreover, connected since the ancient past by the presence of strong multi ethnic and multi-confessional components, the traces and influences left by the Muslim Turks in the Ottomans uh, through almost 600 years of domination and sovereignty are spread all everywhere in trace. Within the purpose, all these transformations occur in the minor centers and along the main roads, axes, were often recorded through the centers by the travelers. And today, their accounts can be used as important historic sources to better understand the cultural milieu, milieu produced and improved by the Ottomans in those lands, and can be helpful also in the perspective to spread more knowledge about their civilization and achievements, especially in this region. In this perspective, trace can be seen as unique cultural heritage shared both by Turkey and its neighbor in the southern west eastern Europe that still needs to be accurately explored protect and preserve. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you very much for all this uh, uh, trip around the Trachea. And uh, we really, like travelers, we stop also in all these mosques, caravansarites. And thank you very much for this new document about the, the manuscript uh, uh, with the bridges of this manuscript in Leiden, published in uh, 2002. And uh, we need uh, new uh, new sources and uh, new occasions to discuss around. This was uh, really an um, occasion for us to travel from uh, Sofiano's map up to the last uh, engravings you show us. So uh, thank you very much also for respecting the time of your presentation. And I have uh, to uh, return and ask uh, to everybody, all the participants and uh, the Others, uh, if you have questions uh, on the presentation of uh, Madame Nathalie Boulou, please, uh, we start again from the first uh, presentation of this afternoon. If someone has uh, a question or want to discuss about... Yes. Where is it to you, Mr. Sword? Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to ask a question to uh, uh, Constantine Udu, uh, if I remember, to to know about the caravan Serai, if there was any uh, connection. Well, because I saw more or less in Lagada, uh, there was a, a caravan serai, which is uh, not far from Thessaloniki. So is there any connection with Yerisos on, on that way to, to go to Athos? Is, is there any land, land way to go? Or it was only by boat like it is now? That's an interesting point to know if, if there was a point of entry of... Uh, uh, to Mount Athos by caravan Serai and not only by boat. Uh, Sorry, yes, uh, my, thank my... you. I... Thank you very much for the question. Um, you, you hear my question? Yeah. Yes, okay. yes, thank you very much for it. Uh, yes, I, I don't know exactly if there was at that time, I know it was uh, later during the time, uh, but uh, we don't have a lot of uh, Khans and Caravanserais in uh, Halkidiki in general because the travelers uh, could stay at uh, the monasteries or the religion uh, oh. foundations there. So in terms of uh, constructing this database and to extract more um, uh, conclusions on the networks of road there, uh, we should add all this... Um, uh, all, uh, all the data from the uh, travelers that say where they stayed, um, in which one, so that uh, we need another um, uh, view. 
and uh, search through these uh, texts. Uh, however, there are some um, maps uh, that show their old network in uh, that, but they are later on, they are from the 19th century onwards, that they show the actual uh, road network uh, in Halkidiki and to Mount Athos. Uh, and there is uh, a manuscript with uh, you. There was pictures a Han or... in Yarigovi Arnea, the only one Han that existed in Halkidiki, in Yarigovi Arnea. Arnea. Oh, it was in Arnea, oh, yeah, but, which is still a, a stop for the bus who go to yes, uh, Mount Arthur. Of course, of course. You know better, you know better. <laughs> Thank you, Pascalis. Uh, so I think there is uh, two hands. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and I have a question to every of, of, of the speakers. Uh, if go on, go on, there is any, uh, uh, I mean, pictures uh, or um, illustrations like you sh show uh, related to Mount Athos by all these travelers. I I'm really interested because I'm working on a research about the representation uh, between text and image to the travelers on Mount Athos, who goes to Mount Athos. So if any uh, things related to this, uh, I'm really interested. <laughs> or maybe you can contact me. Uh, I can give you my, my email. And Yes, you can send me a yes, message. Of course, we have, of course, we have uh, Pierre Bellon representation that is the very naive uh, map uh, on his edition of the 16th century. And later we have uh, 19th century. I think that there are others more specialists uh, about Mount Anthos and the representations, isn't Pascalis? Okay, so we'll continue between. Uh, Madame uh, first ask if there are any questions for the yes, panelists. yes, thank you. Thank you for reminding me this. If you have questions about the presentations of Madame Nathalie Boulou, please, first. So and then we pass on the second uh, uh, speaker today, of uh, Chan Bulat uh, Ibrahim and his uh, presentation. If we have some uh, questions. No. No, and we have some hands that there. Yes, can you hear me? This is yes. your message. Yes, welcome again. Uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Bulat, uh, about the term that you have for the word Tsardak in Greek. You mentioned a term. I don't hear you. The microphone is closed. You have to open your microphone, Mr. Z. Could no? you please speak louder a little bit? I, I couldn't understand your question right now. You mentioned a term for the word Tsardak in Greek. I didn't hear good the term that you mentioned. Re and regarding the term terminology difference between the other Balkan countries and Greece, you mean? No, no. I, uh, you mentioned a term, a word, uh, which is similar to the word, the Turkish word Tsarda, and it is Greek, a Greek one. I think you you said something about Kala, something like that. Kala, yeah, okay. This is just a, a internet a translation pro programs. I uh, entered Chardak, uh, but there are various uh, spelling, but uh, always got Kala. In uh, Greek letters, I, I but but it's something like that. I found something about the term uh, as I coming from an area from Epirus, uh, an area close to the city of Ioannina. We use the this word till today, and mm -hmm. uh, we have um, uh, we we use all over Greece the words tsardi, tsardaki, tsardaka, tsardaki, tsardak. Tsardaki or Tsardak, and uh, all these words are similar with the same meaning uh, with the word Greki coming from a Slavian, Slavian area. Thank and uh, if we try to give the meaning, we can say that it is something like a hut or shed covered with branches, straw or reeds. And we can say this is um, like makes house. Yeah. Only in West Macedonia of Greece, they use this term with another uh, in another way, 
I found it that it is um, for it to is the uh, uh, a very wide corridor which is separating the rooms of a small house, but a very wide corridor, not a civil corridor, only in West Macedonia. Yeah. So it, this it, is the it, way. Uh, uh, if you want to find the Greek word, you can use the word Kaliva or Kalivi. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Siametis, I'd like to uh, keep contact to you since uh, especially I was in a class last week and before going to Greece, I checked the, the, the publication regarding to the Ottoman or say a Greek houses analysis. I couldn't find any other. But uh, as you say that Macedonia or other places, uh, is, is my connection good? I will change to say uh, just a second. I use another another uh, connection. One second. Now it's better, I think. Uh, Vasily, we can. Vasily, your... yeah, I'd like to keep contact to you, but I, I, I am consultant and uh, one of the last Ottoman mansions uh, in, in Ohrid uh, on plants uh, in, from uh, 1960s, 70s, most probably. That was that exact day. I found Chardak, but for my understanding, in the beginning, four piles or four columns and one, say, a roof with four angles is called Chardak, of course. This is the beginning of the... But afterwards, it turned to the, the, the name as Chardak House. I didn't mention, I, otherwise there are too much material. It is right now, it is 400 pages book. And then in Ottoman period, missing links in Ottoman period, I discussed that. And then afterwards, my proposal or my hypothesis said that in the beginning, all house used to be used to be called as Shardak. For example, in, in 17th century, Kadir registries are collected and they create a database. You can, maybe you already did it. If you write down Chardak, you find many Chardak houses, but afterwards it disappeared in Ottoman uh, or in Istanbul. Uh, right now, there is no Chardak. Uh, and uh, afterwards, I speculated and said that maybe other Balkan countries were socialist countries and behind the say that uh, Iron Curtain. We didn't have, had, uh, we didn't have too much uh, cultural exchange between other Balkan countries, but maybe Greece affected by Duan Kuban's Hayat House. This was my uh, suggestion. But uh, coming back to the others, uh, say uh, Balkan countries, uh, in the beginning, uh, maybe all uh, house is used to be called a uh, Chardak, but afterwards Chardak became the name of Avlu or Sofa, or as you say that Bar Verenda. Varenda. Uh, then uh, in, in, in my, for example, uh, plans from uh, Ohrid House from 70s or 80s, I see that inner Chardak and outer Chardak. Right now in Turkey, we call them not Chardak, but Sofa. It's mm -hmm. Sofa the plan because, because of Doğan Kuban. Therefore, that was a confusion. Uh, uh, most probably from late uh, 20th century, uh, for example, you can find that terminology, Hayat House, in Sedat Hakkas uh, books. Uh, that was a, confu a confusion. It, it will be uh, too, too long. Sorry for that. But uh, Duan Kuban discussed that, uh, almost complained that, that uh, I used to call these Hayat House, but in, in Balkan, somewhere, uh, they, they call it Chardak, but this is, maybe he's not saying that it's nonsense, but he said that this is not re realistic. Therefore, there are many things to be discussed, but in my book, I discussed those, but still uh, I'm asking you whether the terminology problem appeared recently. But thank you for saying that in Greece, there are many Chardaks. I can give you more information what is happening here in Greece about Sardi and Sardak and Kaliva. 
because I have also the experience of, my, of, of the life in my village and I can understand the difference between the use of a word. Yeah. And now I have another question for Ms. Constantinidou. No, we're still, uh, first we have to ask if someone has questions about uh, the presentation of Mr. Mustafa Keskin, please. And then Vasilis will continue to Eleftheria Constantinidou. But I think to conclude uh, what you discuss uh, with um, uh, about Chardak, you have to ask all people in different areas, even in all the Balkan areas and countries, so that uh, maybe they are the only source where we can find the beginning or the use of each uh, uh, names about Chardak, Kalivi, etc. Old people only, they preserve this, uh, maybe the use or the difference on this. Please, uh, I will have to continue if uh, someone has uh, or uh, questions on uh, the presentation of Mr. Mustafa Keskin, please. A hand, no, not a hand. Uh, yes, for Mr. Uh, Keskin, I want to ask again about this uh, construction uh, in the city of Ioannina. You saw something like... The open tomb. The open tomb. Can you repeat your read? Yes, about in Ioannina. Like he showed the open uh, tomb, a tomb of uh, Ali Pasha there near the mosque. Is that yes. you ask about... Maybe I didn't uh, uh, see very I thought it's something like with silver, we like uh, a cave. A cave, yes, a cave. In front cave. Of the what is was that Ali? exactly? Can you repeat the cave. The, cave. the cave? the cave of uh, Ali Pasha. Of Ali Pasha, in front of the mosque. Yes, in front yes. of the mosque. In front of the mosque of uh, Ali Pasha. Uh, it's the tomb. So each kale, in each kale. Each kale. In each kale. Yes. What is the sense of this uh, fracture? I don't understand. Uh, okay, uh, I can answer this question. Uh, in Turkish and Islamic mythology, uh, it's believed that uh, the body is a cage and the soul uh, is a bird. Uh, the death uh, is uh, the bird leave the cage. And then uh, that's why uh, they put this kind of... Uh, uh, and uh, also, uh, I can tell you about something about chardaks. Uh, in Turkey, uh, we use chardak too, but it's uh, uh, chardak is a Persian word. Uh, it is chehar means four, uh, and tak uh, means uh, arc. It means four arcs. Uh, and uh, now I have a thing uh, in my. Uh, from right now, uh, in 13 to uh, 30, Aşık Paşa Skarip Name, uh, he said that uh, Kiler means depot, uh, Uçartak and Çardak and Ambars. Uh, and uh, he used this word uh, as a depot or something uh, in 1330. Uh, and uh, in Risale Mimariye, uh, in treasure of on uh, say, uh, little booklet on architecture, uh, which uh, Jafar Efendi written, uh, he said that uh, it's a Persian word, Chartak, uh, in Turkish. Uh, we took this word and uh, said Chardak, uh, and now it means uh, a room made from stone. Hmm. Okay. Another meaning here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is a uh, uh, this book is from uh, sixteen fourteen. Okay. So if uh, let's go on, go on, Pascal. Uh, Mustafa, thank you very much for your paper and for reminding us uh, Bursa and the palaces of Bursa. I remember, um, I think it's in the world of Heath Lowry, uh, Bursa and uh, travel accounts, and Suna Atsa made a considerable work on uh, the palace. I think there is a reference on the old uh, palace of Bursa and uh, of a Sadirvan with uh, Western elements. Um, uh, I think this account was published in Heath Lowry's book. Uh, do yeah. you remember this one? Yeah, yeah. Yes. 
Um, I don't remember the name of uh, the traveler or the, the account, but I, oh, I remember this detail on the Sadir. You did, did and, the same and, one. And same uh, one. it was in ruins uh, that time, the palace. Uh, then, uh, actually, I think that uh, between the old and new palace, there was a, a huge pool. Uh, and uh, in the middle of the pool, uh, which uh, Lubenau and uh, Dele Buracchiere, uh, and also uh, the Ottoman account uh, La Michelebi, uh, talk about this Kursk. Kursk uh, it's a little eye on a little island, the pool. And the connection is uh, between the two palaces is there, uh, that pool. Uh, I saw that account in the uh, it Lowry's Traveler's book. Uh, and then that's why uh, I started to read uh, the uh, travelogues of Beller and Sipon. Uh, when I uh, saw uh, this passage, uh, not all of the passage, but uh, he said that he, Lowry, uh, they talked about a new palace. And then uh, I reached the book and uh, uh, I read it. And then uh, I see the uh, passage on the uh, uh, open tombs. Yes. Uh, do you know if at the time of Mehmet Chalebi, that means at the beginning of 15th century, that uh, palace was uh, still in use or abandoned? Uh, I'm asking this because tomorrow I'm going to present the fresco <laughs> that I suspect that is uh, it's a reference to this palace. Mm. Um, possibly, I don't know, but it's just a hypothesis with not a solid foundation, but uh, that's why I'm asking you. Uh, actually, after the uh, Battle of Ankara, uh, Mehmet Çelebi uh, moved to Amasya uh, until 1413. Uh, then he defeated uh, his brothers and uh, moved to Bursa, uh, but Bursa Palace is almost uh, abandoned. Uh, then uh, I thought that, I think that uh, some renovations uh, made in Bursa because sometimes uh, they used this palace, but uh, mostly they lived in Edirne because yeah. uh, they uh, they moved to Edirne because uh, not only uh, from the uh, demolition of uh, Bursa Palace, uh, but also they afraid of uh, a new danger from the east uh, from because the uh, Timur's uh, son uh, Shahru uh, wrote some. Uh, letters to uh, Mehmet Çelebi and Murat II too. Uh, he wanted to, uh, to uh, coins with his name. And uh, Çelebi Mehmet and Murat II uh, made coins with the name of Şahrur and Timur. So uh, they became a vassals of Timurids. Uh, and they really afraid from uh, the uh, Eastern uh, Turks. Yes. So they moved uh, to Edirne. Thank you. So. Thank you. I think that we have two hands rising there. Uh, Vasily, Siametis, you yes. want to ask something? Okay. Yes, you can go on. If my question, not question, but I would like to uh, explain that almost same uh, type of structure are studied by late uh, Professor Dr. Yildirim Yavuz in 1970s with your uh, a very similar hypothesis and uh, uh, with some paper was published in uh, Middle East Technical University Faculty of Architecture Journal in 70s. Uh, but the name of the article or paper was uh, Metal uh, Domes. Uh, and uh, same hypothesis, as far as I remember, if you could not find that in my say library, I have uh, I can send you a PDF copy. Uh, my uh, question uh, or say uh, uh, explanation uh, regarding to the Chardaks, uh, I would like to uh, tell to Mr. Siamitis that uh, my aim was not discussing Chardak generally, but uh, in Alcek's books published in 2012, uh, for the same drapes house, for example, I would like to ask you in Greece, what does it mean? Dr drape is a textile uh, ter terminology, but he used drapes, white, and sumptuous. Therefore, there is a confusion. I try to find out uh, those, say, uh, wooden structures in Greece. 
uh, which word was used to be used? Since it, it, Tursun Bey doesn't have any knowledge, therefore he, put, he learns that Drapes wrote, but it's not a Greek word as far as I remember, at least that it may be a Greek word, but for building, I don't have any say information. Uh, maybe you can also uh, help me in that respect. Of those uh, wooden houses found in monasteries, how should they be called in Greek? So I think I that know. we continue your discussion through mails or in another uh, session or another occasion. But now I have two, I have two hands here. Uh, so first, uh, Vasily Siametis, you want to ask something uh, to the presentation of uh, Mr. Eleftheria Kostadinidou? Uh, did you mention that the Hans and the Caravanserais, they don't have any difference or like that? Uh, no, uh, actually, there is a, also another question. Thank you for this. There is also another question in the chat for this. So um, we'll combine the um, replies to this. No, actually, the um, the distinction between the two terms, it's a very controversial topic because it changes uh, both in time and uh, in uh, location, geographical. I mean, the caravanserai found uh, uh, in eastern um, uh, locations uh, is a little bit different than the Balkan one, um, except from the large ones that were, they were found in Thessaloniki or other uh, larger cities. So uh, what changes... Um, between them is uh, sometimes the quality of uh, the services uh, uh, they offer. Uh, sometimes it's the construction of those. We have cities in uh, Greece that they have wooden uh, cans um, that they have in their um, ground floor. They have stores, uh, but the caravans, right? They were bigger buildings, uh, were mostly built with uh, stone. Um, Sometimes uh, they are confused with uh, um, uh, which uh, meant with, um, that they were uh, covered with lead. Um, so the actual answer is not uh, very distinct between them. Uh, there's not a distinction clear between them. Also, it changes during the time. Uh, later in the 19th century, for example, there are mentioned that some of the uh, different uh, snaps, they have um, uh, their own um, stores and above them there is a, a, a can. Uh, so I'm afraid I don't have a conclusive uh, answer to this. Uh, it's very controversial. You can see different answers in the scholarship. I would like to mention Stefan Gerlach in uh, Tagebuch uh, is very clear about Caravanserai. He says that always is bigger, of course bigger, and have always to do with charities because it belongs to a Pasha or to the Sultan. So uh, has not to do with uh, uh, with money in this case, Caravanserai. Uh, that means all people can live there, also the poor, uh, poor people, uh, people. But uh, with Hans, as I understood, he should pay, pay over the night. So, and uh, the situation in Hans is very bad sometimes, services policy. So please, if you cannot wait for the Greek pronunciation, use the Turkish one. You are going to find 48 times the word caravanserai with many descriptions. Uh, for example, I found a caravanserai, Mr. Tsambulat, uh, uh, and he says that the, this one does have wood on the walls, uh, and it's clear that uh, they have problem with the fire. If they get the fire, what is going to happen? But <clears throat> the scorpions and the mice in this uh, uh, room it is in the uh, in the main square of Constantinople in Constantine Square or in market as mentioned it many many times you are going to find the the term caravanserai and huge descriptions if I may add something uh, maybe to complete uh... Uh, by the way, there is an important book about the uh, Caravanserali Turki by Gabriel uh, Mendel, uh, died many years ago. And one, just one little distinction. It's true what uh, both of you were saying. I mean, they are not contradicting at all. 
But what I found, uh, I remember that there is a distinction only between the ones located in, in, inside the cities, which usually refer as a Han, and sometimes you have to pay to stay there. They were not for free, um, especially the one around the Grand Bazaar of Istanbul. The area of the Grand Bazaar, those hands you have to they were in actually, you have to pay to stare there. And different were instead the caravans right along the caravan routes, because already they in the Seljuk uh, time there were, but actually, even before, because actually the origin is the uh, Roman Emporia. Actually, the Emporia it's the starting point of this kind of construction for let's say hosting, guesting. Um, hosting uh, people on the caravan uh, roads. So sometimes there is just this slight distinction. But for instance, in Italian literature, they use the word cane, which it means dog, but doesn't mean anything. It's just the pronunciation of han translated into cane. And many Italian travelers, they were using indistinctly for along the uh, caravan roads or inside the city, they were using the same word cane. Ah, this is the Il Cane di Rustem Pasha, Il Cane di something else, without making a clear distinction. So it's a bit uh, tricky. But the main distinction about the caravan routes, so caravanserai, and um, uh, Han as in for urban uh, environment, it many times it works better. So you, you can check yes. from there, maybe. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, yes, uh, there is Mrs. Fariba Zarin the Buffer wants to talk or to ask, please. I don't know if it's about uh, the presentation of Kostandinid or Mr. Kerkinov, Mr. Orlandi. Please, uh, the floor for, for you. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much. I just wanted to respond to Mr. Orlando about the origins of caravansarai. Actually, it's Persian. And, you know, you really have to, we have to stretch a bit our geography to Iran because a lot of institutions, the bazaar, you know, the, the um, you know, the covered part market, because I'm an urban historian and I work both on Iran and the Ottoman Empire and Istanbul, I don't work on the Balkans, but but I think the Eastern origins, whether it's Chardak, you know, Bazaar, Caravan Sarai, we need to really stretch our geography further uh, East as urban historians. And I think, you know, the European travelogues uh, who, who travel to these areas, they also travel to Persia. You know, and, and so, you know, their descriptions, of course, you know, they, they were very well aware of these connections. Um, and I think, you know, again, back to Natalie's presentation, you know, it's really fascinating how, you know, they, your traveler, your Venetian traveler is describing, you know, uh, the term Greece and barbarian civilization. But some of these Italian travelers, Venetians who are going to Persia, they're saying the same thing about the Persians and the Arabs, you know, so they have the same kind of divides between you know, Persia being, you know, the land of civilization and, you know, the Arabs, sort of the tri you know, tribal nomadic people. Um, so it's really fascinating how that divide also works in terms of the Persians versus the Arabs or, you know, uh, the Greeks versus the Turks. Uh, so kind of enlarging our own horizons to the horizons of these travelers that, you know, who traveled in every direction as tomorrow I will talk about, you know, Antoine Galan, you know, they're traveling everywhere. So, um, so I think their horizons are much bigger than you're, you're, you know, willing to to grant to them, and they are very much aware of, you know, these continuities and connections between the East and the West. They're becoming very curious. You know, they're global trackers. Actually, you know, they're not just going to one site, but they're traveling all over the place. So, in terms of, you know, uh, periodization, it's really fascinating. I wanted to kind of direct this question to Mr. Olandi about, you know, these towns and you know, the urban built environment. Um, have you tried to also, you know, track it or compare it to the ebb and flow of trade? So as I noted, you know, you're focusing on the 16th century, these, you know, monuments that are, are being built by grand viziers as part of WAF complexes, whether they're bazaars, or, you know, or bridges or, you know, bathhouses. Um, can, you, can you periodize whether that also reflects, you know, the expansion of trade? right, with, you know, with Venice, through the Balkans, you know, what's going on about actual trade? What is passing with the caravans through these towns, you know, and caravans uh, around the towns? Actually, um, thank you, thank you for this uh, uh, 
good good point of view. Actually, what I found interesting, I I wrote uh, an article about because I, as I mentioned before, I focus mostly then on Sinan's period because I think it was the period in which uh, they built incredibly, especially towards West both for trades, wars, and so on. But uh, what I found interesting, I wrote an article that title was exactly Lost Highways, uh, because I think that unfortunately, the um, uh, contemporary world, and especially after the, uh, let's say, the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, uh, and, and is the reason why also I'm insisting on preservation of this sort of... Uh, Ottoman landscape, because unfortunately the new uh, track, the new roads, uh, whatever, they are not taken into consideration. Uh, I, I work specifically, for instance, in, in Trakia, but I travel all around, around the Balkans. And many times I can see that also, you know, for instance, nationalism many times appropriates even the names and the construction as well of some... Uh, uh, some of what to me consider as a, is considered as a part of the uh, Ottoman heritage that, as I said, should go behind the border, no, and uh, behind the border of contemporary Turkey, of course. And uh, I found interesting that mostly of those um, are completely lost. I mean, we don't have traces anymore. I mean, Bukharisteran was one of the most important Kervanserai and is mentioned in many, many travelogues. We don't have nothing, zero. And it was like five kilometers, 10 kilometers far from uh, Lulleburgaz. And Lulleburgaz itself, I mean, one of the double caravanserai that was one of the biggest in uh, in all the, let's say, Western provinces of Rumelia, there is just one single wall left uh, across, the, across the, the mosque. So unfortunately, uh, there is, uh, in my opinion, also a lack of awareness that we need to uh, develop through those uh, studies uh, so that we can map. That's why the work of uh, Elefteria is very important. I was in contact, I was uh, last year in, uh, in a conference in, uh, in Zagreb, and some scholars were doing the same work, for instance, for Bosnia, trying to track and map all the Bosnian Han for instance. Uh, so these are very important to put together all the information and recreate a sort of map of this uh, world. For me, it's more, I mean, I'm more concentrating on the Balkans, but as uh, Fariba was, in, uh, was pointing out, of course, uh, there should be other parallel works that goes in the other direction towards east to reconnect those routes uh, from uh, uh, crossing Iran, uh, I mean, Persia or whatever, I mean. Uh, I think it's very important, but just because it's limited and we have an incredible richness in terms of uh, heritage, uh, Balkans are really a perfect, uh, let's say, case study in that sense. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. So, yes, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, one more question, please. Uh, we have to finish uh, the, our session tonight. So I think that... Who? Excuse me. Mrs. Zernibaf. Zernibaf. Uh, yes, I think she, she, she asks, she, she repeats. You want to ask something more? No, quite... no, I just made a comment to, I, I really enjoyed Natalie's paper as well. You know, it's very inspiring. I'm actually, you know, teaching a course, a graduate seminar in, in the spring on, you know, Mediterranean encounters. So this is really, the work of travelers are really important and, and their geographical works, you know, and, and the way, you know, they envision the world during this, this period is fascinating and catching a great deal of attention, you know, from, from our students. So, so thank you for that, for that exposition. Yeah. Thank you very much for your uh, intermediation. Uh, so the last uh, speech will be the hand is from Mr. Ibrahim Chambulat, please. Uh, want... Yeah, okay. I, I, I thought that you uh, finished finished the uh, say discussion, but uh, I'd like to make some uh, say uh, uh, very uh, brief information regarding to Han. In Turkish, we call mostly Yolcu Hanı. 
passenger hunt. Uh, but caravan sarai are also logistic centers. Uh, for example, on I, I'm living on a caravan road, Roman road actually, and then every 30, 40 kilometers there is a hunt, but every 90, 100 kilometers there is a caravan sarai. Uh, caravan sarais are also bulk break point for the cargo. And then uh, they have special arrangement for those. For example, uh, camel caravans uh, stay there. And then uh, it is very much uh, dependent to the uh, hinterland. Therefore, uh, I, uh, Eleftheria, say Eleftheria is easier for me. Therefore, Eleftheria should examine about those type of black, uh, bulk break points. They are actual caravanserais. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I think that we have to close. Thank you very much for everybody to be together with us this afternoon evening. And I hope to see you tomorrow morning for the next session. Uh, tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Thank you very much for this night. Thank so, you. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.